Section 29 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. Section 29. Selected Excerpts by William Beckford. William Beckford, 1759-1844 The translation from a defective Arabic manuscript of the Book of the Thousand Nights and a Night, first into the French by Galland about 1705, and presently into various English versions, exerted an immediate influence on French, German, and English romance. The pseudo-oriental or semi-oriental tale of home manufacture, sprang into existence right and left with the publishers of london and paris and in german centres of letters hopes anastasius or memoirs of a modern greek lewis's the monk the german hauf's admirable stories of the caravan the inn and the palace rickert's tales of the genii and william beckford's history of the caliph vartek are among the finest performances of the sort productions more or less eastern in sentiment and in their details of local colour but independent of direct originals in the persian or arabic so far as is conclusively known william beckford born at london in seventeen fifty nine of a strong line which included a governor of jamaica dying in eighteen forty four is a figure of distinction merely as an englishman of his time aside from his one claim to literary remembrance his father's death left him the richest untitled citizen of england he was not sent to a university but immense care was given to his education in which lord chatham personally interested himself and he travelled widely the result of this on a very receptive mind with varied natural gifts was to make beckford an ideal dilettante his tastes in literature painting music in which mozart was his tutor sculpture architecture and what not were refined to the highest nicety he was able to gratify each of them as such a man can rarely have the means to do he built palaces and towers of splendour instead of merely a beautiful country seat he tried to reproduce vartex halls in stone and stucco employing relays of workmen by day and night on two several occasions and estates for many months where other men got together moderate collections of bibelots beckford amassed whole museums if a builder's neglect or a fire destroyed his rarities and damaged his estates to the extent of forty or fifty thousand pounds beckford merely rebuilt and recollected these tastes and lavish expenditures gradually set themselves in a current towards things eastern his magnificent retreat at sintra in portugal his vast fonthill abbey and lansdowne hill estates in england were only appanages of his sumptuous state england and europe talked of him and of his properties he was a typical egotist but an agreeable and gracious man esteemed by a circle of friends not called upon to be his sycophants and he kept in close touch with the intellectual life of all europe he wrote much for an amateur and in view of the tale which does him most honour he wrote with success at twenty he invited publicity with a satiric jeu d'esprit biographical memoirs of extraordinary painters and his italy with sketches of spain and portugal and recollections of an excursion to the monasteries of alcobaba and batalla were well received but these books could not be expected to survive even three generations whereas vartek the brilliant the unique the inimitable vartek took at once a place in literature which we may now almost dare to call permanent this story not a long one indeed no more than a novelette in size was originally written in french and still lives in that language in which an edition hardly the best has lately been issued under the editorship of m mallarme but its history is complicated by one of the most notable acts of literary treachery and theft on record g 
during the author's slow and finicky composition of it at lausanne he was sending it piecemeal to his friend robert henley in england for henley to make an english version of course to be revised by himself as soon as henley had all the parts he published a hasty and slipshod translation before beckford had seen it or was even ready to publish the french original and not only did so but published it as a tale translated by himself from a genuine arabic original this double violation of good faith of course enraged beckford and practically separated the two men for the rest of their lives indeed the wonder is that beckford would ever recognize henley's existence again the piracy was exposed and set aside, and Beckford, in self-defence, issued the story himself in French as soon as he could. Indeed, he issued it in two versions, with curious and interesting differences, one published at Lausanne and the other at Paris. The Lausanne edition is preferable. Bartek abides today accredited to Beckford in both French and English, a thing to keep his memory green as nothing else of his work or personality will. The familiar legend that in its present form it was composed at a single sitting, with such ardour as to entail a severe illness, and without the author's taking off his clothes, cannot be reconciled with the known facts. But the intensely vivid movement of it certainly suggests swift production, and it could easily be thought that any author had sketched such a story in the heat of some undisturbed sitting, and filled, finished, and polished it at leisure it is an extraordinary performance even in henley's unsatisfactory version it is irresistible we know that beckford expected to add liberally to it by inserting sundry subordinate tales put into the mouths of some of the personages appearing in the last scene it is quite as well that he did not its distinctive orientalism perhaps less remarkable than the unfettered imagination of its episodes the vividness of its characters the easy brilliancy of its literary manner these things with french diction and french wit alternate with startling descriptive impressiveness it is a french combination of cervantes and dante in an oriental and bizarre narrative it is not always delicate but it is never vulgar and the sprightly pages are as admirable as the weird ones its pictures taken out of their connection seem irrelevant and are certainly unlike enough but they are a succession of surprises and fascinations. Such are the famous description of the chase of Vartek's court after the Jaur, the moonlit departure of the caliph for the terrace of Istakhar, the episodes of his stay under the roof of the emir Fakreddin, the pursuit by Karatis on her great camel al Bufaki, attended by the hideous Nerkes and the unrelenting Kafur, Nuranihar drawn to the magic flame in the dell at night, the warning of the good jinn, and the tremendous final tableau of the Hall of Eblis. The man, curious in letters, regards with affection the evidences of vitality in a brief production little more than a century old, unique in English and French literature, and occupying today a high rank among the small group of quasi-oriental narratives that represents the direct workings of Galland on the Occidental literary temperament. Today, Vartek surprises and delights persons whose mental constitution puts them in touch with it, just as potently as ever it did. And simply as a wild story, one fancies that it will appeal quite as effectually, no matter how many editions may be its future, to a public perhaps unsympathetic towards its elliptical satire, its caustic wit, its fantastic course of narrative, and its incongruous wavering between the flippant, the grotesque, and the terrific. The Incantation and the Sacrifice From The History of the Caliph Vartek By secret stairs, known only to herself and her son, she karatis first repaired to the mysterious recesses in which were deposited the mummies that had been brought from the catacombs of the ancient pharaohs of these she ordered several to be taken from thence she resorted to a gallery where under the guard of fifty female negroes mute and blind of the right eye were preserved the oil of the most venomous serpents rhinoceros horns and woods of a subtle and penetrating odour 
procured from the interior of the indies together with a thousand other horrible rarities this collection had been formed for a purpose like the present by carathis herself from a presentiment that she might one day enjoy some intercourse with the infernal powers to whom she had ever been passionately attached and to whose taste she was no stranger to familiarize herself the better with the horrors in view the princess remained in the company of her negresses who squinted in the most amiable manner from the only eye they had and leered with exquisite delight at the skulls and skeletons which carathis had drawn forth from her cabinets whilst she was thus occupied the caliph who instead of the visions he expected had acquired in these insubstantial regions a voracious appetite was greatly provoked at the negresses for having totally forgotten their deafness he had impatiently asked them for food and seeing them regardless of his demand he began to cuff pinch and push them till carathis arrived to terminate a scene so indecent son what means all this said she panting for breath i thought i heard as i came up the shriek of a thousand bats tearing from their crannies in the recesses of a cavern you but ill deserve the admirable provision i have brought you give it me instantly exclaimed the caliph i am perishing for hunger as to that answered she you must have an excellent stomach if it can digest what i have been preparing be quick replied the caliph but o oh, heavens what horrors what do you intend come come returned carathis be not so squeamish but help me to arrange everything properly and you shall see that what you reject with such symptoms of disgust will soon complete your felicity let us get ready the pile for the sacrifice of to-night and think not of eating till that is performed know you not that all solemn rites are preceded by a rigorous abstinence the caliph not daring to object abandoned himself to grief and the wind that ravaged his entrails whilst his mother went forward with the requisite operations files of serpents oil mummies and bones were soon set in order on the balustrade of the tower the pile began to rise and in three hours was as many cubits high at length darkness approached and carathis having stripped herself to her inmost garment clapped her hands in an impulse of ecstasy and struck light with all her force the mutes followed her example but vatek extenuated with hunger and impatience was unable to support himself and fell down in a swoon the sparks had already kindled the dry wood and the venomous oil burst into a thousand blue flames the mummies dissolving emitted a thick dun vapour and the rhinoceros horns beginning to consume all together diffused such a stench that the caliph recovering started from his trance and gazed wildly on the scene in full blaze around him the oil gushed forth in a plenitude of streams and the negresses who supplied it without intermission united their cries to those of the princess at last the fire became so violent and the flames reflected from the polished marble so dazzling that the caliph unable to withstand the heat and the blaze effected his escape and clambered up the imperial standard in the meantime the inhabitants of samara scared at the light which shone over the city arose in haste ascended their roofs beheld the tower on fire and hurried half naked to the square their love to their sovereign immediately awoke and apprehending him in danger of perishing in his tower their whole thoughts were occupied with the means of his safety Morakanabad flew from his retirement wiped away his tears and cried out for water like the rest baba baluk whose olfactory nerves were more familiarized to magical odors readily conjecturing that carathis was engaged in her favorite amusements strenuously exhorted them not to be alarmed 
him however they treated as an old poltroon and forbore not to style him a rascally traitor the camels and dromedaries were advancing with water but no one knew by which way to enter the tower whilst the populace was obstinate in forcing the doors a violent east wind drove such a volume of flame against them as at first forced them off but afterwards rekindled their zeal at the same time the stench of the horns and mummies increasing most of the crowd fell backward in a state of suffocation those that kept their feet mutually wondered at the cause of the smell and admonished each other to retire morakanabad more sick than the rest remained in a piteous condition holding his nose with one hand he persisted in his efforts with the other to burst open the doors and obtain admission a hundred and forty of the strongest and most resolute at length accomplished their purpose Karatis, alarmed at the signs of her mutes advanced to the staircase went down a few steps and heard several voices calling out from below you shall in a moment have water being rather alert considering her age she presently regained the top of the tower and bade her son suspend the sacrifice for some minutes adding we shall soon be enabled to render it more grateful certain dolts of your subjects imagining no doubt that we were on fire have been rash enough to break through those doors which had hitherto remained inviolate for the sake of bringing up water they are very kind you must allow so soon to forget the wrongs you have done them but that is of little moment let us offer them to the jaur let them come up our mutes who neither want strength nor experience will soon dispatch them exhausted as they are with fatigue be it so answered the caliph provided we finish and i dine in fact these good people out of breath from ascending eleven thousand stairs in such haste and chagrined at having spilt by the way the water they had taken were no sooner arrived at the top than the blaze of the flames and the fumes of the mummies at once overpowered their senses it was a pity for they beheld not the agreeable smile with which the mutes and the negresses adjusted the cord to their necks these amiable personages rejoiced however no less at the scene never before had the ceremony of strangling been performed with so much facility they all fell without the least resistance or struggle so that vatek in the space of a few moments found himself surrounded by the dead bodies of his most faithful subjects all of which were thrown on the top of the pile Vatek and Nuranihar in the Halls of Eblis From the History of the Caliph Vatek The Caliph and Nuranihar beheld each other with amazement at finding themselves in a place which, though roofed with a vaulted ceiling, was so spacious and lofty that at first they took it for an immeasurable plain but their eyes at length growing familiar with the grandeur of the objects at hand they extended their view to those at a distance and discovered rows of columns and arcades which gradually diminished till they terminated in a point radiant as the sun when he darts his last beams athwart the ocean the pavement strewed over with gold dust and saffron exhaled so subtle an odour as almost overpowered them they however went on and observed an infinity of censers in which amber grease and the wood of aloes were continually burning between the several columns were placed tables each spread with a profusion of viands and wines of every species sparkling in vases of crystal a throng of genii and other fantastic spirits of each sex danced lasciviously in troops at the sound of music which issued from beneath in the midst of this immense hall a vast multitude was incessantly passing who severally kept their right hands on their hearts without once regarding anything around them they had all the livid paleness of death their eyes deep sunk in their sockets 
resembled those phosphoric meteors that glimmer by night in places of interment some stalked slowly on absorbed in profound reverie some shrieking with agony ran furiously about like tigers wounded with poisoned arrows whilst others grinding their teeth in rage foamed along more frantic than the wildest maniac they all avoided each other and though surrounded by a multitude that no one could number each wandered at random unheedful of the rest as if alone on a desert which no foot had trodden vatek and nuranihar frozen with terror at a sight so baleful demanded of the jaur what these appearances might seem and why these ambulating spectres never withdrew their hands from their hearts perplex not yourselves replied he bluntly with so much at once you will soon be acquainted with all let us haste and present you to eblis they continued their way through the multitude but notwithstanding their confidence at first they were not sufficiently composed to examine with attention the various perspectives of halls and of galleries that opened on the right hand and left which were all illuminated by torches and braziers whose flames rose in pyramids to the centre of the vault at length they came to a place where long curtains brocaded with crimson and gold fell from all parts in striking confusion here the choirs and dances were heard no longer the light which glimmered came from afar after some time vatek and nuranihar perceived a gleam brightening through the drapery and entered a vast tabernacle carpeted with the skins of leopards an infinity of elders with streaming beards and afrites in complete armour had prostrated themselves before the ascent of a lofty eminence on the top of which upon a globe of fire sat the formidable eblis his person was that of a young man whose noble and regular features seemed to have been tarnished by malignant vapours in his large eyes appeared both pride and despair his flowing hair retained some resemblance to that of an angel of light in his hand which thunder had blasted he swayed the iron sceptre that causes the monster uranabad the afrites and all the powers of the abyss to tremble at his presence the heart of the caliph sunk within him and for the first time he fell prostrate on his face nuranihar however though greatly dismayed could not help admiring the person of eblis for she expected to have seen some stupendous giant eblis with a voice more mild than might be imagined but such as transfused through the soul the deepest melancholy said creatures of clay i receive you into mine empire ye are numbered amongst my adorers enjoy whatever this palace affords the treasures of the pre-adamite sultans their bickering sabres and those talismans that compel the deeves to open the subterranean expanses of the mountain of kaf which communicate with these there insatiable as your curiosity may be shall you find sufficient to gratify it you shall possess the exclusive privilege of entering the fortress of ahoman and the halls of argenk where are portrayed all creatures endowed with intelligence and the various animals that inhabited the earth prior to the creation of that contemptible being whom ye denominate the father of mankind vatek and nuranihar feeling themselves revived and encouraged by this harangue eagerly said to the jaur bring us instantly to the place which contains these precious talismans come answered this wicked deef with his malignant grin come and possess all that my sovereign hath promised and more he then conducted them into a long aisle adjoining the tabernacle preceding them with hasty steps and followed by his disciples with the utmost alacrity 
they reached at length a hall of great extent and covered with a lofty dome around which appeared fifty portals of bronze secured with as many fastenings of iron a funereal gloom prevailed over the whole scene here upon two beds of incorruptible cedar lay recumbent the fleshless forms of the pre-adamite kings who had been monarchs of the whole earth they still possessed enough of life to be conscious of their deplorable condition their eyes retained a melancholy motion they regarded each other with looks of the deepest dejection each holding his right hand motionless on his heart at their feet were inscribed the events of their several reigns their power their pride and their crimes soliman rad soliman daki and soliman dijan ben jan who after having chained up the deeds in the dark caverns of kaf became so presumptuous as to doubt of the supreme power all these maintained great state though not to be compared with the eminence of soliman ben daoud solomon the son of david this king so renowned for his wisdom was on the loftiest elevation and placed immediately under the dome he appeared to possess more animation than the rest though from time to time he laboured with profound sighs and like his companions kept his right hand on his heart yet his countenance was more composed and he seemed to be listening to the sullen roar of a vast cataract visible in part through the grated portals this was the only sound that intruded on the silence of these doleful mansions a range of brazen vases surrounded the elevation remove the covers from these cabalistic depositaries said the jaur to vartek and avail thyself of the talismans which will break asunder all these gates of bronze and not only render thee master of the treasures contained within them but also of the spirits by which they are guarded the caliph whom this ominous preliminary had entirely disconcerted approached the vases with faltering footsteps and was ready to sink with terror when he heard the groans of soliman as he proceeded a voice from the livid lips of the prophet articulated these words in my lifetime i filled a magnificent throne having on my right hand twelve thousand seats of gold where the patriarchs and the prophets heard my doctrines on my left the sages and doctors upon as many thrones of silver were present at all my decisions whilst i thus administered justice to innumerable multitudes the birds of the air librating over me served as a canopy from the rays of the sun my people flourished and my palace rose to the clouds i erected a temple to the most high which was the wonder of the universe but i basely suffered myself to be seduced by the love of women and a curiosity that could not be restrained by sublunary things i listened to the counsels of ahoman and the daughter of pharaoh and adored fire and the hosts of heaven i forsook the holy city and commanded the genii to rear the stupendous palace of istachar and the terrace of the watch-towers each of which was consecrated to a star there for a while i enjoyed myself in the zenith of glory and pleasure not only men but supernatural existences were subject also to my will i began to think as these unhappy monarchs around had already thought that the vengeance of heaven was asleep when at once the thunder burst my structures asunder and precipitated me hither where however i do not remain like the other inhabitants totally destitute of hope for an angel of light hath revealed that in consideration of the piety of my early youth my woes shall come to an end when this cataract shall for ever cease to flow till then i am in torments ineffable torments an unrelenting fire preys on my heart having uttered this exclamation soliman raised his hands towards heaven in token of supplication 
and the caliph discerned through his bosom which was transparent as crystal his heart enveloped in flames at a sight so full of horror nouronihar fell back like one petrified into the arms of vartek who cried out with a convulsive sob o oh, jaur whither hast thou brought us allow us to depart and i will relinquish all thou hast promised o oh, mahomet remains there no more mercy none none replied the malicious steve no miserable prince thou art now in the abode of vengeance and despair thy heart also will be kindled like those of the other votaries of eblis a few days are allotted thee previous to this fatal period employ them as thou wilt recline on these heaps of gold command the infernal potentates range at thy pleasure through these immense subterranean domains no barrier shall be shut against thee as for me i have fulfilled my mission i now leave thee to thyself at these words he vanished the caliph and nouronihar remained in the most abject affliction their tears unable to flow scarcely could they support themselves at length taking each other despondingly by the hand they went faltering from this fatal hall indifferent which way they turned their steps every portal opened at their approach the divs fell prostrate before them every reservoir of riches was disclosed to their view but they no longer felt the incentives of curiosity pride or avarice with like apathy they heard the chorus of genii and saw the stately banquets prepared to regale them they went wandering on from chamber to chamber hall to hall and gallery to gallery all without bounds or limit all distinguishable by the same lowering gloom all adorned with the same awful grandeur all traversed by persons in search of repose and consolation but who sought them in vain for every one carried within him a heart tormented in flames shunned by these various sufferers who seemed by their looks to be upbraiding the partners of their guilt they withdrew from them to wait in direful suspense the moment which should render them to each other the like objects of terror what exclaimed nouronihar will the time come when i shall snatch my hand from thine ah said vatek and shall my eyes ever cease to drink from thine long draughts of enjoyment shall the moments of our reciprocal ecstasies be reflected on with horror it was not thou that broughtest me hither the principles by which karatis perverted my youth have been the sole cause of my perdition having given vent to these painful expressions he called to an afrit who was stirring up one of the braziers and bade him fetch the princess karatis from the palace of samara after issuing these orders the caliph and nouronihar continued walking amidst the silent crowd till they heard voices at the end of the gallery presuming them to proceed from some unhappy beings who like themselves were awaiting their final doom they followed the sound and found it to come from a small square chamber where they discovered sitting on sofas five young men of goodly figure and a lovely female who were all holding a melancholy conversation by the glimmering of a lonely lamp each had a gloomy and forlorn air and two of them were embracing each other with great tenderness on seeing the caliph and the daughter of fakreddin enter they arose saluted and gave them place then he who appeared the most considerable of the group addressed himself thus to vartek strangers who doubtless are in the same state of suspense with ourselves as you do not yet bear your hand on your heart if you are come hither to pass the interval allotted previous to the infliction of our common punishment condescend to relate the adventures that have brought you to this fatal place and we in return will acquaint you with ours which deserve but too well to be heard 
we will trace back our crimes to their source though we are not permitted to repent this is the only employment suited to wretches like us the caliph and nouronihar assented to the proposal and vartek began not without tears and lamentations a sincere recital of every circumstance that had passed when the afflicting narrative was closed the young man entered on his own each person proceeded in order and when the fourth prince had reached the midst of his adventures a sudden noise interrupted him which caused the vault to tremble and to open immediately a cloud descended which gradually dissipating discovered caratis on the back of an afrit who grievously complained of his burden she instantly springing to the ground advanced towards her son and said what dost thou here in this little square chamber as the deeds are become subject to thy beck i expected to have found thee on the throne of the pre-adamite kings execrable woman answered the caliph cursed be the day thou gavest me birth go follow this afrit let him conduct thee to the hall of the prophet soliman there thou wilt learn to what these palaces are destined and how much i ought to abhor the impious knowledge thou hast taught me the height of power to which thou art arrived has certainly turned thy brain answered caratis but i ask no more than permission to show my respect for the prophet it is however proper thou shouldest know that as the afrit has informed me neither of us shall return to samara i requested his permission to arrange my affairs and he politely consented availing myself therefore of the few moments allowed me i set fire to the tower and consumed in it the mutes negresses and serpents which have rendered me so much good service nor should i have been less kind to morakanabad had he not prevented me by deserting at last to my brother as for baba balouk who had the folly to return to samara and all the good brotherhood to provide husbands for thy wives i undoubtedly would have put them to the torture could i but have allowed them the time being however in a hurry i only hung him after having caught him in a snare with thy wives whilst them i buried alive by the help of my negresses who thus spent their last moments greatly to their satisfaction with respect to dilara who ever stood high in my favour she hath evinced the greatness of her mind by fixing herself near in the service of one of the magi and i think will soon be our own vatek too much cast down to express the indignation excited by such a discourse ordered the afrit to remove caratis from his presence and continued immersed in thought which his companion durst not disturb caratis however eagerly entered the dome of soliman and without regarding in the least the groans of the prophet undauntedly removed the covers of the vases and violently seized on the talismans then with a voice more loud than had hitherto been heard within these mansions she compelled the deeds to disclose to her the most secret treasures the most profound stores which the afrit himself had not seen she passed by rapid descents known only to eblis and his most favoured potentates and thus penetrated the very entrails of the earth where breathes the sansa or icy wind of death nothing appalled her dauntless soul she perceived however in all the inmates who bore their hands on their hearts a little singularity not much to her taste as she was emerging from one of the abysses eblis stood forth to her view but notwithstanding he displayed the full effulgence of his infernal majesty she preserved her countenance unaltered and even paid her compliments with considerable firmness this superb monarch thus answered princess whose knowledge and whose crimes have merited a conspicuous rank in my empire thou dost well to employ the leisure that remains for the flames and torments which are ready to seize on thy heart will not fail to provide thee with full employment he said this and was lost in the curtains of his tabernacle
Carathis paused for a moment with surprise, but, resolved to follow the advice of Eblis, she assembled all the choirs of genii and all the divs to pay her homage. Thus marched she in triumph through a vapour of perfumes, amidst the acclamations of all the malignant spirits, with most of whom she had formed a previous acquaintance. She even attempted to dethrone one of the Solimans for the purpose of usurping his place, when a voice proceeding from the abyss of death proclaimed, All is accomplished. Instantaneously the haughty forehead of the intrepid princess was corrugated with agony. She uttered a tremendous yell, and fixed no more to be withdrawn her right hand upon her heart, which was become a receptacle of eternal fire. In this delirium, forgetting all ambitious projects and her thirst for that knowledge which should ever be hidden from mortals, she overturned the offerings of the genii, and having execrated the hour she was begotten and the womb that had borne her, glanced off in a whirl that rendered her invisible, and continued to revolve without intermission. At almost the same instant, the same voice announced to the caliph, Nouronihar, the five princes, and the princess, the awful and irrevocable decree. Their hearts immediately took fire, and they at once lost the most precious of the gifts of heaven, hope. These unhappy beings recoiled with looks of the most furious distraction. Vartek beheld in the eyes of Nouronihar nothing but rage and vengeance, nor could she discern aught in his but aversion and despair. The two princes who were friends, and till that moment had preserved their attachment, shrunk back, gnashing their teeth with mutual and unchangeable hatred. Kalila and his sister made reciprocal gestures of imprecation, whilst the two other princes testified their horror for each other by the most ghastly convulsions and screams that could not be smothered. All severally plunged themselves into the accursed multitude, there to wander in an eternity of unabating anguish. End of section 29 Recording by Alan Wayman Section 30 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A recording by Marianne Spiegel. A Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4, Section 30, Essay on Henry Ward Beecher, by Lyman Abbott. Henry Ward Beecher, 1813-1887. to 1887. The life of Henry Ward Beecher may be either compressed into a sentence or expanded into a volume. He was born in Litchfield, Connecticut, on the 24th day of June, 1813, the child of the well-known Lyman Beecher, graduated at Amherst College in 1834, and subsequently studied at Lane Theological Seminary, Cincinnati, of which his father was the president, began his ministerial life as pastor of a home missionary, Presbyterian, church, at the little village of Lawrenceburg, twenty miles south of Cincinnati on the Ohio River was both sexton and pastor, swept the church, built the fires, lighted the lamps, rang the bell, and preached the sermons, was called to the pastorate of the First Presbyterian Church of Indianapolis, the capital of Indiana, where he remained for eight years, 1839 to 1847, and where his preaching soon won for him a reputation throughout the state, and his occasional writing a reputation beyond its boundaries, Thence was called in 1847 to be the first pastor of the newly organized Plymouth Church, Brooklyn, where he remained with an ever-increasing reputation as preacher, lecturer, orator, and writer until the day of his death, March 8, 1887. Such is the outline of a life, the complete story of which would be the history of the United States 
during the most critical half-century of the nation's existence. Living in an epoch, when the one overshadowing political issue was preeminently a moral issue, and when no man could be a faithful preacher of righteousness and not a political preacher, concerned in whatever concerned humanity, believing that love is the essence of all true religion, and that love to God is impossible without love to man, a moral reformer not less than gospel preacher, and statesman even more than theologian, throwing himself into the anti-slavery conflict with all the courage of a heroic nature and all the ardor of an intensely impulsive one, he stands among the first half-score of writers, orators, reformers, statesmen, and soldiers, who combined to make the half-century from 1835 to 1885 as brilliant and as heroic as any in human history. The greatness of Henry Ward Beecher consisted not so much in a predominance of any one quality as in a remarkable combination of many. His physique justified the well-known characterization of Mr. Fowler, the phrenologist, a splendid animal. He was always an eager student, though his methods were desultory. He was familiar with the latest thought and philosophy, had studied Herbert Spencer before his works were republished in the United States, yet was a child among children, and in his old age retained the characteristic faults and virtues of childhood and its innocent impulsiveness. His imagination might have made him a poet, his human sympathies a dramatic poet, had not his strong common sense kept him always in touch with the actualities of life, and a masterful conscience compelled him to use his aesthetic faculties in sterner service than in the entertainment of mankind. The intensity of his moral nature enhanced, rather than subdued, his exuberant humor, which love prevented from becoming satire, and seriousness preserved from degenerating into wit. His native faculty of mimicry led men to call him an actor, yet he wholly lacked the essential quality of a good actor, power to take on another's character, and used the mimic art only to interpret the truth which at the moment possessed him. Such power of passion as was his is not often seen mated to much self-control, for while he spoke with utter abandon, he rarely if ever did so until he had carefully deliberated the cause he was espousing. He thought himself deficient in memory, and in fact rarely borrowed illustrations from his reading either of history or of literature. But his keenness of observation photographed living scenes upon an unfading memory which years after he could and did produce at will. All these contrary elements of his strangely composite, though not incongruous, character entered into his style, or, to speak more accurately, his styles, and make any analysis of them within reasonable limits difficult, if not impossible. For the writer is known by his style, as the wearer by his clothes. Even if it be no native product of the author's mind, but a conscious imitation of carefully studied models, what I may call a tailor-made style, fashioned in a vain endeavor to impart sublimity to commonplace thinking, the poverty of the author is thereby revealed, much as the boar is most clearly disclosed when wearing ill at ease unaccustomed broadcloth. Mr. Beecher's style was not artificial. Its faults, as well as its excellencies, were those of extreme naturalness. He always wrote with fury, rarely did he correct with phlegm. His sermons were published as they fell from his lips, correct and revise he would not. The too few editorials which he wrote, on the eve of the Civil War, were written while the press was impatiently waiting for them, were often taken page by page from his hand, and were habitually left unread by him to be corrected in proof by others. His lighter contributions to the New York ledger were thrown off in the same way, generally while the messenger waited to take them to the editorial sanctum. It was his habit, whether unconscious or deliberate I do not know, to speak to a great congregation with the freedom of personal conversation, and to write for the press with as little reserve as to an intimate friend. This habit of taking the public into his confidence was one secret of his power, but it was also the cause of those violations of conventionality in public address which were a great charm to some and a grave defect to others. There are few writers or orators who have addressed such audiences with such effect, whose style have been so true and unmodified a reflection of their inner life. 
the title of one of his most popular volumes might be appropriately made the title of them all, Life Thoughts. But while his style was wholly unartificial, it was no product of mere careless genius. Carelessness never gives a product worth possessing. The excellencies of Mr. Beecher's style were due to a careful study of the great English writers, its defects to a temperament too eager to endure the dull work of correction. In his early manhood he studied the old English divines, not for their thoughts, which never took hold of him, but for their style, of which he was enamoured. The best characterization of South and Barrow I ever heard he gave me once in a casual conversation. The great English novelists he knew, Walter Scott's novels, of which he had several editions in his library, were great favorites with him, but he read them rather for the beauty of their descriptive passages than for their romantic and dramatic interest. Rushkin's Modern Painters he both used himself and recommended to others as a textbook in the observation of nature, and certain passages in them he read and reread. But in his reading he followed the bent of his own mind rather than any prescribed system. Neither in his public utterances nor in his private conversation did he indicate much indebtedness to Shakespeare among the early writers, nor to Emerson or Carlyle among the moderns. Though not unfamiliar with the greatest English poets, and the great Greek poets in translations, he was less a reader of poetry than of poetical prose. He had, it is true, not only read but carefully compared Dante's Inferno with Milton's Paradise Lost. Still, it was not the Paradise Lost, it was the Areopagitica, which he frequently read on Saturday nights, for the sublimity of its style and the inspiration it afforded to the imagination. He was singularly deficient in verbal memory, a deficiency which is usually accompanied by a relatively slight appreciation of the mere rhythmic beauty of literary form. It is my impression that for amorous poems, such as Moore's songs or even Shakespeare's sonnets, and for purely descriptive poetry, such as the best of Child Harold and certain poems of Wordsworth, he cared comparatively little. But he delighted in religious poetry, whether the religion was that of the pagan Greek tragedies, the medieval Dante, or the Puritan Milton. He was a great lover of the best hymns, and with a Catholicity of affection, which included the Calvinist Toplady, the Armenian Wesley, the Roman Catholic Faber, and the Unitarian Holmes. Generally, however, he cared more for poetry of strength than for that of fancy or sentiment. It was the terrific strength in Watt's famous hymn beginning, My thoughts on awful subjects dwell, damnation and the dead, which caused him to include it in the Plymouth Collection, abhorrent as was the theology of that hymn alike to his heart and to his conscience. In any estimate of Mr. Beecher's style, it must be remembered that he was both by temperament and training a preacher. He was brought up not in a literary, but in a didactic atmosphere. If it were as true as it is false that art exists only for art's sake, Mr. Beecher would not have been an artist. His art always had a purpose, generally a distinct moral purpose. An overwhelming proportion of his contributions to literature consists of sermons, or extracts from sermons, or addresses not less distinctly didactic. His one novel was written avowedly to rectify some common misapprehensions as to New England life and character. Even his lighter papers, products of the mere exuberance of a nature too full of every phase of life to be quiescent, indicated the intensity of a purposeful soul, much as the sparks in a blacksmith's shop come from the very vigor with which the artisan is shaping on the anvil, the nail, or the shoe. But Mr. Beecher was what Mr. Spurgeon has called him, the most myriad-minded man since Shakespeare, and such a mind must both deal with many topics, and if it be true to itself, exhibit many styles. If one were to apply to Mr. Beecher's writings the methods which have sometimes been applied by certain higher critics to the Bible, he would conclude that men who wrote the sermons on evolution and theology could not possibly have also written the humorous descriptions of a house with all the modern improvements. Sometimes grave, sometimes gay, sometimes serious, sometimes sportive, concentrating his whole power on what he was doing, working with all his might, but also playing with all his might. When he is on a literary frolic, the reader would hardly suspect 
that he was ever dominated by a strenuous moral purpose. Yet there were certain common elements in Mr. Beecher's character which appeared in his various styles, though mixed in very different proportions and producing very different combinations. Within the limits of such a study as this, it must suffice to indicate in very general terms some of these elements of character which appear in and really produce his literary method. Predominant among them was a capacity to discriminate between the essentials and the accidentals of any subject, a philosophical perspective which enabled him to see the controlling connection and to discard quickly such minor details as tended to obscure and to perplex. Thus a habit was formed which led him not infrequently to ignore necessary limitations and qualifications, and to make him scientifically inaccurate, though vitally and ethically true. It was this quality which led critics to say of him that he was no theologian, though it is doubtful whether any preacher in America since Jonathan Edwards has exerted a greater influence on its theology. But this quality imparted clearness to his style. He always knew what he wanted to say, and said it clearly. He sometimes produced false impressions by the very strenuousness of his aim and the vehemence of his passion, but he was never foggy, obscure, or ambiguous. This clearness of style was facilitated by the singleness of his purpose. He never considered what was safe, prudent, or expedient to say, never reflected upon the effect which his speech might have on his reputation or his influence, considered only how he could make his hearers apprehend the truth as he saw it. He therefore never played with words, never used them with a double meaning, or employed them to conceal his thoughts. He was indeed utterly incapable of making a speech unless he had a purpose to accomplish. When he tried, he invariably failed. No orator ever had less ability to roll off airy nothings for the entertainment of an audience. Coupled with this clearness of vision and singleness of purpose was a sympathy with men singularly broad and alert. He knew the way to men's minds and adapted his method to the minds he wished to reach. This quality put him at once en rapport with his auditors and with men of widely different mental constitution. Probably no preacher has ever habitually addressed so heterogeneous a congregation as that which he attracted to Plymouth Church. In his famous speech at the Herbert Spencer dinner, he was listened to with equally rapt attention by the philosopher and by the French waiters, who stopped in their service, arrested and held by his mingled humor philosophy, and restrained emotion. This human sympathy gave a peculiar dramatic quality to his imagination. He not only recalled and reproduced material images from the past with great vividness, he recreated in his own mind the experiences of men whose mold was entirely different from his own. As an illustration of this, a comparison of the two sermons on Jacob before Pharaoh, one by Dr. Talmage, the other by Mr. Beecher, is interesting and instructive. Dr. Talmage devotes his imagination wholly to reproducing the outward circumstances, the court in its splendor, and the patriarch with his wagons, his household, and his stuff. This scene Mr. Beecher etches vividly, but carelessly in a few outlines, then proceeds to delineate with care the imagined feelings of the king, awed, despite his imperial splendor, by the spiritual majesty of the peasant herdsman yet Mr. Beecher could paint the outer circumstances with care when he chose to do so. Some of his flower pictures in Fruits, Flowers, and Farming will always remain classic models of descriptive literature, the more amazing that some of them are portraits of flowers he had never seen when he wrote the description. While his imagination illuminated nearly all he said or wrote, it was habitually the instrument of some moral purpose. He rarely ornamented for ornament's sake. His pictures gave beauty, but they were employed not to give beauty, but clearness. He was thus saved from mixed metaphors, the common fault of imaginative writings which are directed to no end, and thus are liable to become first lawless, then false, finally self-contradictory and absurd. The massive Norman pillars of Durham Cathedral are marred by the attempt which some architect has made to give them grace and beauty by adding ornamentation. Rarely, if ever, did Mr. Beecher fall into the error of thus mixing in an incongruous structure two architectural styles. He knew when to use the Norman strength and solidity, and when the Gothic lightness and grace. 
probably his keen sense of humor would have preserved him from this not uncommon error it is said that the secret of humor is the quick perception of incongruous relations this would seem to have been the secret of mr beecher's humor for he had in an eminent degree what the phrenologists call the faculty of comparison this was seen in his arguments which were more often analogical than logical seen not less in that his humor was not employed with deliberate intent to relieve a too serious discourse but was itself the very product of his seriousness he was humorous but rarely witty as for the same reason he was imaginative but not fanciful for both his imagination and his humor were the servants of his moral purpose and as he did not employ the one merely as a pleasing ornament so he never went out of his way to introduce a joke or a funny story to make a laugh speaking broadly mr beecher's style as orator passed through three epochs in the first best illustrated by his sermons to young men preached in indianapolis his imagination is the predominant faculty those sermons will remain in the history of homiletical literature as remarkable of their kind but not as a pulpit classic for all times for the critic will truly say that the imagination is too exuberant the dramatic element sometimes becoming melodramatic and the style lacking in simplicity in the second epoch best illustrated by the harper and brothers edition of his selected sermons preached in the earlier and middle portion of his brooklyn ministry the imagination is still pervasive but no longer predominant the dramatic fire still burns but with a steadier heat imagination dramatic instinct personal sympathy evangelical passion and a growing philosophic thought structure combine to make the sermons of this epoch the best illustration of his power as a popular preacher in each sermon he holds up a truth like his favorite opal turning it from side to side and flashing its opalescent light upon his congregation, but so as always to show the secret fire at the heart of it. In the third epoch, best illustrated by his sermons on evolution and theology, the philosophic quality of his mind predominates. His imagination is subservient to and the instrument of clear statement. His dramatic quality shows itself chiefly in his realization of mental conditions foreign to his own, and his style, though still rich in color and warm with feeling, is mastered, trained, and directed by his intellectual purpose. In the first epoch he is the painter, in the second the preacher, in the third the teacher. Judgments will differ. In mine the last epoch is the best, and its utterances will long live a classic in pulpit literature. The pictures of the first epoch are already fading. The fervid oratory of the second epoch depends so much on the personality of the preacher that as the one grows dim in the distance the other must grow dim also. But the third, more enduring though less fascinating, will remain so long as the heart of man hungers for the truth and life of God, that is, for a rational religion, a philosophy of life, which shall combine reverence and love, and a reverence and love which shall not call for the abdication of the reason. End of section 30。section 31 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. Section 31. Selected Excerpts by Henry Ward Beecher. Bookstores and Books from Star Papers Nothing marks the increasing wealth of our times, and the growth of the public mind toward refinement, more than the demand for books. Within ten years the sale of common books has increased probably two hundred percent, and it is daily increasing. But the sale of expensive works, and of library editions of standard authors and costly bindings, is yet more noticeable. Ten years ago such a display of magnificent works as is to be found at the Appletons would have been a precursor of bankruptcy. There was no demand for them. A few dozen, in one little showcase, was the prudent whole. Now, 
one whole side of an immense store is not only filled with admirably bound library books but from some inexhaustible source the void continually made in the shelves is at once refilled a reserve of heroic books supply the places of those that fall alas where is human nature so weak as in a bookstore speak of the appetite for drink or of a bon vivant's relish for a dinner what are these mere animal throes and ragings compared with those fantasies of taste those yearnings of the imagination those insatiable appetites of intellect which bewilder a student in the great bookseller's temptation hall how easily one may distinguish a genuine lover of books from a worldly man with what subdued and yet glowing enthusiasm does he gaze upon the costly front of a thousand embattled volumes how gently he draws them down as if they were little children how tenderly he handles them he peers at the title page at the text or the notes with the nicety of a bird examining a flower he studies the binding the leather russia english calf morocco the lettering the gilding the edging the hinge of the cover he opens it and shuts it he holds it off and brings it nigh it suffuses his whole body with book magnetism he walks up and down in amaze at the mysterious allotments of providence that gives so much money to men who spend it upon their appetites and so little to men who would spend it in benevolence or upon their refined tastes it is astonishing too how one's necessities multiply in the presence of the supply one never knows how many things it is impossible to do without till he goes to windles or smith's house furnishing stores one is surprised to perceive at some bazaar or fancy and variety store how many conveniences he needs he is satisfied that his life must have been utterly inconvenient aforetime and thus too one is inwardly convicted at appleton's of having lived for years without books which he is now satisfied that one cannot live without then too the subtle process by which the man convinces himself that he can afford to buy no subtle manager or broker ever saw through a maze of financial embarrassments half so quick as a poor book buyer sees his way clear to pay for what he must have he promises himself marvels of retrenchment he will eat less or less costly viands that he may buy more food for the mind he will take an extra patch and go on with his raiment another year and buy books instead of coats yea he will write books that he may buy books the appetite is insatiable feeding does not satisfy it it rages by the fuel which is put upon it as a hungry man eats first and pays afterward so the book buyer purchases and then works at the debt afterward this paying is rather medicinal it cures for a time but a relapse takes place the same longing the same promises of self-denial he promises himself to put spurs on both heels of his industry and then besides all this he will somehow get along when the time for payment comes ah this somehow that word is as big as the whole world and it is stifled with all the vagaries and fantasies that fancy ever bred upon hope and yet is there not some comfort in buying books to be paid for we have heard of a sot who wished his neck as long as the worm of a still that he might so much the longer enjoy the flavor of the draught thus it is a prolonged excitement of purchase if you feel for six months in a slight doubt whether the book is honestly your own or not had you paid down that would have been the end of it there would have been no affectionate and beseeching look of your books at you every time you saw them saying as plain as books eyes can say do not let me be taken from you moreover buying books before you can pay for them promotes caution you do not feel quite at liberty to take them home you are married your wife keeps an account book she knows to a penny what you can and what you cannot afford she has no speculation in her eyes plain figures make desperate work with airy somehows 
it is a matter of no small skill and experience to get your books home, and into their proper places, undiscovered. Perhaps the blundering express brings them to your door just at evening. What is it, my dear? she says to you. Oh, nothing, a few books that I cannot do without. That smile. A true housewife that loves her husband can smile a whole arithmetic at him at one look. Of course she insists, in the kindest way, in sympathizing with you in your literary acquisition. She cuts the strings of the bundle, and of your heart, and out comes the whole story. You have bought a complete set of costly English books, full bound in calf, extra gilt. You are caught, and feel very much as if bound in calf yourself, and admirably lettered. Now, this must not happen frequently. The books must be smuggled home. Let them be sent to some near place. Then, when your wife has a headache, or is out making a call, or has lain down, run the books across the frontier and threshold, hastily undo them, stop only for one loving glance as you put them away in the closet, or behind other books on the shelf, or on the topmost shelf. Clear away the twine and wrapping paper, and every suspicious circumstance. Be very careful not to be too kind. That often brings on detection. Only the other day we heard it said somewhere, Why, how good you have been lately! I am really afraid that you have been carrying on mischief secretly. Our heart smote us. It was a fact. That very day we had bought a few books which we could not do without. After a while you can bring out one volume, accidentally, and leave it on the table. Why, my dear, what a beautiful book! Where did you borrow it? You glance over the newspaper, with the quietest tone you can command. That! Oh! That is mine. Have you not seen it before? It has been in the house these two months. And you rush on with anecdote and incident, and point out the binding, and that peculiar trick of gilding, and everything else you can think of. But it all will not do. You cannot rub out that roguish, arithmetical smile. People may talk about the equality of the sexes. They are not equal." The silent smile of a sensible, loving woman will vanquish ten men. Of course you repent, and in time form a habit of repenting. Another method which will be found peculiarly effective is to make a present of some fine work to your wife. Of course, whether she or you have the name of buying it, it will go into your collection, and be yours to all intents and purposes. But it stops a remark in the presentation. A wife could not reprove you for so kindly thinking of her. No matter what she suspects, she will say nothing. And then, if there are three or four more works which have come home with the gift book, they will pass through the favor of the other. These are pleasures denied to wealth and old bachelors. Indeed, one cannot imagine the peculiar pleasure of buying books if one is rich and stupid. There must be some pleasure, or so many would not do it. But the full flavor, the whole relish of delight, only comes to those who are so poor that they must engineer for every book. They sit down before them, and besiege them. They are captured. Each book has a secret history of ways and means. It reminds you of subtle devices by which you insured and made it yours, in spite of poverty. Selected Paragraphs from Selections from the Published Works of Henry Ward Beecher, compiled by Eleanor Kirk. An intelligent conscience is one of the greatest of luxuries. It can hardly be called a necessity, or how would the world have got along as well as it has to this day? Sermon, Conscience A man undertakes to jump across a chasm that is ten feet wide, and jumps eight feet, and a kind sympathizer says, What is going to be done with the eight feet that he did jump? Well, what is going to be done with it? It is one of those things which must be accomplished in whole, or it is not accomplished at all. Sermon, The True Value of Morality It is hard for a strong-willed man to bow down to a weak-willed woman. It is hard for an elephant to say his prayers to an ant. Sermon The Reward of Loving 
When Peter heard the cock crow, it was not the tail feathers that crew. The crowing came from the inside of the cock. Religion is something more than the outward observances of the church. Sermon The Battle of Benevolence I have heard men, in family prayer, confess their wickedness, and pray that God would forgive them the sins that they got from Adam. But I do not know that I ever heard a father in family prayer confess that he had a bad temper. I never heard a mother confess in family prayer that she was irritable and snappish. I never heard persons bewail those sins which are the engineers and artificers of the moral condition of the family. The angels would not know what to do with a prayer that began, Lord, thou knowest that I am a scold. Sermon Peaceableness Getting up early is venerable. Since there has been a literature or a history, the habit of early rising has been recommended for health, for pleasure, and for business. The ancients are held up to us for examples, but they live so far to the east, and so near the sun, that it was much easier for them than for us. People in Europe always get up several hours before we do, people in Asia several hours before Europeans do, and we suppose, as men go toward the sun, it gets easier and easier, until, somewhere in the Orient, probably they step out of bed involuntarily, or, like a flower blossoming, they find their bedclothes gently opening and turning back, by the mere attraction of light. EYES AND EARS There are some men who never wake up enough to swear a good oath. The man who sees the point of a joke the day after it is uttered, because he is never known to act hastily, is he to take credit for that? Sermon Conscience If you will only make your ideal mean enough, you can every one of you feel that you are heroic. Sermon The Use of Ideals there is nothing more common than for men to hang one motive outside where it can be seen, and keep the others in the background to turn the machinery. Sermon Paul and Demetrius Suppose I should go to God and say, Lord, be pleased to give me salad. He would point to the garden and say, There is the place to get salad, and if you are too lazy to work for it, you may go without. Lecture Room Talks Answers to Prayer God did not call you to be canary birds in a little cage, and to hop up and down on three sticks, within a space no larger than the size of the cage. God calls you to be eagles, and to fly from sun to sun over continents. Sermon The Perfect Manhood Do not be a spy on yourself. A man who goes down the street thinking of himself all the time, with critical analysis, whether he is doing this, that, or any other thing, turning himself over as if he were a goose on a spit before a fire, and basting himself with good resolutions, is simply belittling himself. Lectures on Preaching Many persons boil themselves down to a kind of molasses goodness. How many there are that, like flies caught in some sweet liquid, have got out at the last upon the side of the cup, and crawl along slowly, buzzing a little to clear their wings. Just such Christians I have seen, creeping up the sides of churches, soul poor, imperfect, and drabbled. All sidedness in Christian life. No man, then, need hunt among hair shirts. No man need seek for blankets too short at the bottom and too short at the top. No man need resort to iron seats or cushionless chairs. No man need shut himself up in grim cells. No man need stand on the tops of towers or columns in order to deny himself. Sermon Problem of Joy and Suffering in Life 
End of section 31section 32 of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by marianne spiegel library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 4 section 32 sermon poverty and the gospel by henry ward beecher Text Luke chapter four verses seventeen to twenty one Matthew chapter eleven verses two to six Here was Christ's profession of his faith. Here is the history also of his examination, to see whether he were fit to preach it or not. It is remarkable that in both these instances the most significant indication that he had both of his descent from god and of his being worthy of the messiahship consisted in this simple exposition of the line of his preaching that he took sides with the poor neglected and lost he emphasized this that his gospel was a gospel of mercy to the poor and that word poor in its most comprehensive sense looked at historically includes in it everything that belongs to human misery, whether it is by reason of sin or depravity, or by oppression, or by any other cause. This, then, is the disclosure by Christ himself of the genius of Christianity. It is his declaration of what the gospel meant. It is still further interpreted when you follow the life of Christ, and see how exactly in his conduct he interpreted, or rather fortified, the words of the Declaration. His earliest life was that of labor and poverty. It was labor and poverty in the poorest districts of Palestine. The dignified, educated, and aristocratic part of the nation dwelt in Judea, and the Athens of Palestine was Jerusalem. There Christ spent the least part of his life, and there in perpetual discussions. But in Galilee, the most of his miracles, certainly the earlier, were performed, and the most of his discourses that are contained bodily in the Gospels were uttered. He himself carried out the declaration that the Gospel was for the poor. The very miracles that Christ performed were not philosophical enigmas, as we look at them. They were all of them, miracles of mercy they were miracles to those who were suffering helplessly where natural law and artificial means could not reach them in every case the miracles of christ were mercies though we look at them in a spirit totally different from that in which he performed them in doing thus christ represented the best spirit of the old testament the jewish scriptures teach mercy the very genius of Jewish institutions was that of mercy, and especially to the poor, the weak, the helpless. The crimes against which the prophets thundered their severest denunciations were crimes upon the helpless. It was the avarice of the rich, it was the unbounded lust and cruelty of the strong that were denounced by them. They did not preach against human nature in general. They did not preach against total depravity and the original condition of mankind. They singled out violations of the law in the magistrate, in the king, in rich men, everywhere, and especially all those wrongs committed by power either unconsciously or with purpose, cruelty upon the helpless, the defenseless, the poor, and the needy. When Christ declared that this was his ministry, he took his text from the Old Testament. He spoke in its spirit. It was to preach the gospel to the poor that he was sent. He had come into the world to change the condition of mankind. Beginning at the top? No. Beginning at the bottom, and working up to the top, from the bottom. 
when this view of the gospel enters into our understanding and is fully comprehended by us how exactly it fits in with the order of nature and with the order of the unfolding of human life and human society it takes sides with the poor and so the universal tendency of providence and of history slowly unfolded is on the whole going from low to high from worse to better and from good toward the perfect when we consider we see that man begins as a helpless thing a baby zero without a figure before it and every step in life adds a figure to it and gives it more and more worth on the whole the law of unfolding throughout the world is from lower to higher and though when applied to the population of the globe it is almost inconceivable still with many backsets and reactions the tendency of the universe is thus from lower to higher why let any man consider whether there is not of necessity a benevolent intelligence somewhere that is drawing up from the crude toward the ripe from the rough toward the smooth from bad to good and from good through better toward best the tendency upward runs like a golden thread through the history of the whole world both in the unfolding of human life and in the unfolding of the race itself thus the tendency of nature is in accordance with the tendency of the gospel as declared by jesus christ namely that it is a ministry of mercy to the needy the vast majority of mankind have been and yet are poor there are ten thousand men poor where there is one man even comfortably provided for body and soul and hundreds of thousands where there is one rich taking the whole world together the causes of poverty are worthy of a moment's consideration climate and soil have much to do with it men whose winter lasts nine or ten months in the year and who have a summer but of one or two months as in the extreme north how could they amass property how could they enlarge their conditions of peace and comfort there are many parts of the earth where men live on the borders of deserts or in mountain fastnesses or in arctic rigors where anything but poverty is impossible and where it requires the whole thought genius industry and foresight of men the year round just to feed themselves and to live bad government where men are insecure in their property has always been a very fertile source of poverty the great valley of Esdraelon in northern palestine is one of the most fertile in the world and yet famine perpetually stalks on the heels of the population for if you sow and the harvest waves forth come hordes of bedouins to reap your harvest for you and leave you after all your labor to poverty and starvation when a man has lost his harvest in that way two or three times and is deprived of the reward of his labors he never emerges from poverty but sinks into indolence and that by and by breeds apathetic misery so where the government overtaxes its subjects as in the case in the orient with perhaps nearly all the populations there today it cuts the sinews and destroys all the motives of industry and without industry there can be neither virtue morality nor religion in any long period wars breaking out from whatever cause tend to absorb property or destroy property or to prevent the development of property yet as strange as it may seem the men who suffer from war are those whose passions generally lead on it the king may apply the spark but the combustion is with the common people they furnish the army they themselves become destroyers and the ravages of war in the history of the human family have destroyed more property than it is possible to enter into the thoughts of man to conceive but besides these external reasons of poverty there are certain great primary and fundamental reasons ignorance breeds poverty what is property it is the product of intelligence of skill of thought applied to material substances all property is raw material that has been shaped to uses by intelligent skill where intelligence is low the power of producing property is low it is the husbandman 
who thinks, foresees, plans, and calls on all natural laws to serve him, whose farm brings forth forty, fifty, a hundredfold. The ignorant peasant grubs and groans, and reaps but one handful where he has sown two. It is knowledge that is the gold mine, for although every knowing man may not be able to be a rich man, yet out of ignorance riches do not spring anywhere. Ignorant men may be the factors of wealth when they are guided and governed by superior intelligence. Slave labor produced gigantic plantations and estates. The slave was always poor, but his master was rich, because the master had the intelligence and the knowledge, and the slave gave the work. All through human society, men who represent simple ignorance will be tools, and the men who represent intelligence will be the master mechanics, the capitalists. All society today is agitated with this question of justice as between the laborer and the thinker. Now, it is no use to kick against the pricks. A man who can only work and not think is not the equal in any regard of the man who can think, who can plan, who can combine, and who can live not for today alone, but for tomorrow, for next month, for the next year, for ten years. This is the man whose volume will just as surely weigh down that of the unthinking man as a ton will weigh down a pound upon the scale. Aver de Poise is moral, industrial, as well as material in this respect, and the primary, most usual cause of unprosperity in industrial callings therefore lies in the want of intelligence, either in the slender endowment of the man or more likely the want of education in his ordinary and average endowment. Any class of men who live for today and do not care whether they know anything more than they did yesterday or last year, those men may have a temporary and transient prosperity, but they are the children of poverty just as surely as the decrees of God stand. Ignorance enslaves men among men. Knowledge is the creator of liberty and wealth. As with undeveloped intelligence, so the appetites of men and their passions are causes of poverty. Men who live from the basilar faculties will invariably live in inferior stations. The men who represent animalism are as a general fact at the bottom. They may say it is government, climate, soil, want of capital. They may say what they please, but it is the devil of laziness that is in them or of passion that comes out in eating, in gluttony, in drinking and drunkenness, in wastefulness on every side. I do not say that the laboring classes in modern society are poor because they are self-indulgent, but I say that it unquestionably would be wise for all men who feel irritated so that they are unprosperous, if they would take heed to the moral condition in which they are living, to self-denial in their passions and appetites, and to increasing the amount of their knowledge and fidelity. Although moral conditions are not the sole causes, they are principal causes, of the poverty of the working classes throughout the world. It is their misfortune, as well as their fault, but it is the reason why they do not rise. Weakness does not rise. Strength does. All these causes indicate that the poor need moral and intellectual culture. I was sent to preach the gospel to the poor, not to distribute provisions, not to relieve their wants. That will be included, but that was not Christ's primary idea. It was not to bring in a golden period of fruitfulness when men would not be required to work. It was not that men should lie down on their backs under the trees, and that the boughs should bend over and drop ripe fruit into their mouths. No such conception of equality and abundance entered into the mind of the Creator, or of him who represented the Creator. To preach the gospel to the poor was to awaken the mind of the poor. It was to teach the poor, Take up your cross, deny yourselves, and follow me. Restrain all those sinful appetites and passions, and hold them back by the power of knowledge and by the power of conscience. Grow, because you are the sons of God, into the likeness of your Father. 
so he preached to the poor that was preaching prosperity to them that was teaching them how to develop their outward condition by developing their inward forces to develop that in men which should make them wiser purer and stronger is the aim of the gospel men have supposed that the whole end of the gospel was reconciliation between god and men who had fallen though they were born sinners in their fathers and grandfathers and ancestors to reconcile them with god as if an abstract disagreement had been the cause of all this world's trouble but the plain facts of history are simply that men if they had not come from animals yet have dwelt in animalism and that that which should raise them out of it was some such moral influence as should give them the power of ascension into intelligence into virtue and into true godliness that is what the gospel was sent for good news a new power that is kindled under men that will lift them from their low ignorances and degradations and passions and lift them into a higher realm a power that will take away all the poverty that needs to be taken away men may be doctrinally depraved they are much more depraved practically men may need to be brought into the knowledge of god speculatively but what they do need is to be brought into the knowledge of themselves practically i do not say that the gospel has nothing in it of this kind of spiritual knowledge it is full of it but its aim and the reason why it should be preached is to wake up in men the capacity for good things industries frugalities purities moralities kindnesses one toward another and when men are brought into that state they are reconciled when men are reconciled with the law of creation and the law of their being they are reconciled with god whenever a man is reconciled with the law of knowledge he is reconciled with the god of knowledge so far whenever a man is reconciled with the law of purity he is so far reconciled with the god of purity when men have lifted themselves to that point that they recognize that they are children of god the kingdom of god has begun within them although the spirit and practice of the gospel will develop charities will develop physical comfort will feed men will heal men will provide for their physical needs yet the primary and fundamental result of the gospel is to develop man himself not merely to relieve his want on an occasion it does that as a matter of course but that is scarcely the first letter of the alphabet seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things food and raiment shall be added unto you the way to relieve a man is to develop him so that he will need no relief or to raise higher and higher the character of the help that he demands in testing christianity then i remark first that it is to be tested not by creeds but by conduct the evidence of the gospel the reality of the gospel that is preached in schools or churches is to be found in the spirit that is developed by it not in the technical creeds that men have constructed out of it the biography of men who have died might be hung up in their sepulchres but you could not tell what kind of a man this one had been just by reading his life there while he lay dead in the dust before you there are thousands of churches that have a creed of christianity hung up in them but the church itself is a sepulchre full of dead men's bones and indeed many churches in modern times are gnawing the bones of their ancestors and doing almost nothing else the gospel changed from a spirit of humanity into a philosophical system of doctrine is perverted it is not the gospel the great heresy in the world of religion is a cold heart not a luminous head it is not that intelligence is of no use in religion by no means neither would we wage a crusade against philosophical systems of moral truth but where the active sympathy and humanity of loving hearts for living men and for men in the ratio in which they are low 
is laid aside or diminished to a minimum, and in its place is a well-elaborated philosophical system of moral truths, hewn and jointed. The gospel is gone. If you go along the seashores, you will often find the shells of fish. The fish are dead and gone. The shells are left. And if you go along the shores of ecclesiastical organization, you will find multitudes of shells of the gospel, out of which the living substance has gone long ago. Organized Christianity, that is, the institutions of Christianity, have been in the first instance its power, and in the second instance its damnation. The moment you substitute the machinery of education for education itself, the moment you build schools and do not educate, build colleges that do not increase knowledge in the pupils, you have sacrificed the aim for the instrument by which you were to gain that aim. In churches, the moment it is more important to maintain buildings, rituals, ministers, cantors, and all the paraphernalia of moral education than the spirit of personal sympathy, the moment these are more sacred to men than is the welfare of the population round about which they were set to take care of, that very moment religion in the midst of all its institutions has perished. I am bound to say that in the history of the world, while religious institutions have been valuable and have done a great deal of good, they have perhaps done as much harm as good. There is scarcely one single perversion of civil government. There is scarcely one single persecution of men. There is scarcely a single one of the great wars that have depopulated the globe. There is scarcely one great heresy developed out of the tyranny of the church that has not been the fruit of institutional religion. While that spirit of humanity which was to give the institution its motive power has to a certain extent died out of it. Secondly, churches organized upon elective affinities of men are contrary to the spirit of the gospel. We may associate with men who are of like taste with ours. We have that privilege. If men are knowledgeable and intellectual, there is no sin in their choosing for intimate companions and associates men of like pursuits and like intellectual qualities. That is right. If men are rich, there is no reason why men who hold like property should not confer with each other and form interests and friendships together. If men are refined, if they have become aesthetic, there is no reason why they should not associate in the realm of beauty, artists with artists, nor why the great enjoyers of beauty should not be in sympathy. Exit all these are not to be allowed to do it at the price of abandoning common humanity. You have no right to make your nest in the boughs of knowledge, and let all the rest of the world go as it will. You have no right to make your home among those who are polished and exquisite and fastidious in their taste, whose garments are beauty, and whose house is a temple of art, and all whose associations are of like kind, and neglect common humanity. You have no right to shut yourself up in a limited company of those who are like you in these directions, and let all the rest of men go without sympathy and without care. It is a right thing for a man to salute his neighbor who salutes him. But if you salute those who salute you, says Christ, what thank have ye? Do not even the publicans so? It is no sin that a man, being intellectual in his nature, should like intellectual people, and gratify that which is divine and godlike in him. But if, because he likes intellectual people, he loses all interest in ignorant people, it convicts him of depravity and moral perversion. When this is carried out to such an extent that churches are organized upon sharp classification, upon elective affinities, they not only cease to be Christian churches, but they are heretical not perhaps in doctrine, but worse than that, heretical in heart. The fact is that a church needs poor men and wicked men as much as it does pure men and virtuous men and pious men. 
what man needs is familiarity with universal human nature he needs never to separate himself from men in daily life it is not necessary that in our houses we should bring pestilential diseases or pestilential examples but somehow we must hold on to men if they are wicked somehow the circulation between the top and the bottom must be carried on somehow there must be an atoning power in the heart of every true believer of the lord jesus christ who shall say looking out and seeing that the world is lost and is living in sin and misery i belong to it and it belongs to me when you take the loaf of society and cut off the upper crust slicing it horizontally you get an elect church yes it is the peculiarly elect church of selfishness but you should cut the loaf of society from the top down to the bottom and take in something of everything true every church would be very much edified and advantaged if it had in it scholarly men knowledgeable men but the church is strong in proportion as it has in it something of everything from the very top to the very bottom now I do not disown creeds, provided they are my own. Well, you smile, but that is the way it has been since the world began. No denomination believes in any creed except its own. I do not say that men's knowledge on moral subjects may not be formulated. I criticize the formulation of beliefs from time to time in this, that they are very partial, that they are formed upon the knowledge of a past age, and that that knowledge perishes while higher and nobler knowledge comes in, and that there ought to be higher and better forms, and that while their power is relatively small, the power of the spirit of humanity is relatively great. When I examine a church, I do not so much care whether its worship is to the one God or to the triune God. I do not chiefly care for the catechism nor for the confession of faith, although they are both interesting. I do not even look to see whether it is a synagogue or a Christian church. I do not care whether it has a cross over the top of it or is Quaker plain. I do not care whether it is Protestant, Catholic, or anything else. Let me read the living, the living book. What is the spirit of the people? How do they feel among each other? How do they feel toward the community? What is their life and conduct in regard to the great prime moral duty of man? Love the Lord thy God and thy neighbor as thyself. Whether he be obscure or whether he be smiling in the very plenitude of wealth and refinement. Have you a heart for humanity? Have you a soul that goes out for men? Are you Christ-like? Will you spend yourself for the sake of elevating men who need to be lifted up, that is orthodox i do not care what the creed is if a church has a good creed that is all the more felicitous and if it has a bad creed a good life cures the bad creed one of the dangers of our civilization may be seen in the light of these considerations we are developing so much strength founded on popular intelligence and this intelligence and the incitements to it are developing such large property interests that if the principle of elective affinity shall sort men out and classify them we are steering to the not very remote danger of the disintegration of human society i can tell you that the classes of men who by their knowledge refinement and wealth think they are justified in separating themselves and in making a great void between them and the myriads of men below them are courting their own destruction I look with very great interest on the process of change going on in Great Britain, where the top of society had all the blood, but the circulation is growing larger and larger, and a change is gradually taking place in their institutions. The old nobility of Great Britain is the lordliest of aristocracies existing in the world. Happily, on the whole, a very noble class of men occupy the high positions, but the spirit of suffrage this angel of God that so many hate, is coming in on them, and when every man in Great Britain can vote, no matter whether he is poor or rich, whether he has knowledge or no knowledge, 
there must be a very great change. Before the great day of the Lord shall come, the valleys are to go up, and the mountains are to come down, and the mountains have started already in Great Britain, and must come down. There may be an aristocracy in any nation. That is to say, there may be best men. There ought to be an aristocracy in every community. That is, an aristocracy of men who speak the truth, who are just, who are intelligent. But that aristocracy will be like the wave of the sea. It has to be reconstituted in every generation, and the men who are the best in the state become the aristocracy of that state. But where rank is hereditary, if political suffrage becomes free and universal, aristocracy cannot live. The spirit of the gospel is democratic. The tendency of the gospel is leveling, leveling up, not down. It is carrying the poor and the multitude onward and upward. It is said that democracies have no great men, no heroic men. Why is it so? When you raise the average intelligence and power in the community, it is very hard to be a great man. That is to say, when the great mass of citizens are only ankle-high, when among the Lilliputians a Brobdignacian walks, he is a great man. But when the Lilliputians grow until they get to his shoulder, he is not so great a man as he was by the whole length of his body. So, make the common people grow and there is nobody tall enough to be much higher. The remarkable people of the world are useful in their way, but the common people, after all, represent the nation, the age, and the civilization. Go into any town or city. Do not ask who lives in that splendid house. Do not say, This is a fine town. Here are streets of houses with gardens and yards, and everything that is beautiful the whole way through. Go into the lanes, go into the back streets, go where the mechanic lives, go where the day laborer lives, see what is the condition of the streets there, see what they do with the poor, with the helpless, and the mean. If the top of society bends perpetually over the bottom with tenderness, if the rich and strong are the best friends of the poor and needy, it is a civilized and a Christian community. But if the rich and the wise are the cream, and the great bulk of the population skim milk, that is not a prosperous community. There is a great deal of irreligion in men. There is a great deal of wickedness and depravity in men. But there are times when it is true that the church is more dissipated than the dissipated classes of the community. If there is one thing that stood out more strongly than any other in the ministry of our Lord, it is the severity with which he treated the exclusiveness of men with knowledge, position, and a certain sort of religion, a religion of particularity and carefulness. If there is one class of the community against which he hurled his thunderbolts without mercy and predicted woes, it was the scribes, Pharisees, scholars, and priests of the temples. He told them in so many words, the publican and the harlot will enter the kingdom of God before you. The worst dissipation in this world is not the dry rot of morality and of the so-called piety that separates men of prosperity and of power from the poor and ignoble. They are our wards. I am not a socialist. I do not preach riot. I do not preach the destruction of property. I regard property as one of the sacred things. The real property established by a man's own intelligence and labor is the crystallized man himself. It is the fruit of what his life work has done, and not in vain society makes crime against it amongst the most punishable. But nevertheless, I warn these men in a country like ours, where every man votes, whether he came from Hungary, or from Russia, or from Germany, or from France, or Italy, or Spain, or Portugal, or from the Orient from Japan and China, because they too are going to vote. On the Niagara River, logs come floating down and strike an island, and there they lodge and accumulate for a little while and won't go over. But the rains come, the snow melts, the river rises, and the logs are lifted up and down, and they go swinging over the falls. 
the stream of suffrage of free men having all the privileges of the state is this great stream the figure is defective in this that the log goes over the niagara falls but that is not the way the country is going or will go there is a certain river of political life and everything has to go into it first or last and if in the days to come a man separates himself from his fellows without sympathy if his wealth and power make poverty feel itself more poor and men's miseries more miserable and set against him the whole stream of popular feeling that man is in danger he may not know who dynamites him but there is danger and let him take heed who is in peril there is nothing easier in the world than for rich men to ingratiate themselves with the whole community in which they live and so secure themselves it is not selfishness that will do it it is not by increasing the load of misfortune it is not by wasting substance in riotous living upon appetites and passions it is by recognizing that every man is a brother it is by recognizing the essential spirit of the gospel love thy neighbor as thyself it is by using some of their vast power and riches so as to diffuse joy in every section of the community here then i close this discourse how much it enrolls how very simple it is it is the whole gospel when you make an application of it to all the phases of organization and classification of human interests and developments it seems as though it were as big as the universe yet when you condense it it all comes back to one simple creed thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart and thy neighbor as thyself who is my neighbor a certain man went down to jericho and so on that tells you who your neighbor is whoever has been attacked by robbers has been beaten has been thrown down by liquor by gambling or by any form of wickedness whosoever has been cast into distress and you are called on to raise him up that is your neighbor love your neighbor as yourself that is the gospel end of section 32section thirty three of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by marianne spiegel library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four section thirty three a new england sunday by henry ward beecher it is worth all the inconveniences arising from the occasional overaction of New England Sabbath observance to obtain the full flavor of a New England Sunday. But for this, one should have been born there, should have found Sunday already waiting for him, and accepted it with implicit and absolute conviction, as if it were a law of nature, in the same way that night and day, summer and winter, are parts of nature. He should have been brought up by parents who had done the same thing, as they were by parents even more strict, if that were possible, until not religious persons peculiarly, but everybody, not churches alone, but society itself, and all its population, those who broke it as much as those who kept it, were stained through with the color of Sunday. Nay, until nature had adopted it, and laid its commands on all birds and beasts, on the sun and winds, and upon the whole atmosphere, so that without much imagination one might imagine, in a genuine New England Sunday of the Connecticut River Valley stamp, that God was still on that day, resting from all the work which he had created and made, and that all his work rested with him. Over all the town rested the Lord's peace. The saw was ripping away yesterday in the carpenter shop, and the hammer was noisy enough. Today there is not a sign of life there. The anvil makes no music today, 
Tommy Taft's buckets and barrels give forth no hollow, thumping sound. The mill is silent. Only the brook continues noisy. Listen. In yonder pine woods, what a cawing of crows. Like an echo, in a wood still more remote, other crows are answering. But even a crow's throat to-day is musical. Do they think, because they have black coats on, that they are parsons, and have a right to play pulpit with all the pine trees? Nay, the birds will not have any such monopoly. They are all singing, and singing all together, and no one cares whether his song rushes across another's or not. Larks and robins, blackbirds and orioles, sparrows and bluebirds, mocking catbirds and wrens, were furrowing in the air with such mixtures as no other day but Sunday, when all artificial and human sounds cease, could ever hear. Every now and then a bobolink seemed impressed with the duty of bringing these jangling birds into more regularity, and like a country singing-master, he flew down the ranks, singing all the parts himself in snatches, as if to stimulate and help the laggards. In vain! Sunday is the bird's day, and they will have their own democratic worship. There was no sound in the village street. Look either way, not a vehicle, not a human being. The smoke rose up soberly and quietly, as if it said, It is Sunday. The leaves on the great elms hung motionless, glittering in dew, as if they too, like the people who dwelt under their shadow, were waiting for the bell to ring for meeting. Bees sung and flew as usual, but honey-bees have a Sunday way with them all the week, and could scarcely change for the better on the seventh day. But, oh, the sun! It had sent before, and cleared every stain out of the sky. The blue heaven was not dim and low, as on secular days, but curved and deep, as if on Sunday it shook off all encumbrance which during the week had lowered and flattened it, and sprang back to the arch and symmetry of a dome. All ordinary sounds caught the spirit of the day. The shutting of a door sounded twice as far as usual. The rattle of a bucket in a neighbor's yard, no longer mixed with heterogeneous noises, seemed a new sound. The hens went silently about, and roosters crowed in psalm tunes. And when the first bell rung, Nature seemed overjoyed to find something that it might do without breaking Sunday, and rolled the sound over and over, and pushed it through the air, and raced with it over field and hill, twice as far as on weekdays. There were no less than seven steeples in sight from the belfry, and the sexton said, On still Sundays I have heard the bell at one time and another, when the day was fair and the air moving in the right way, from every one of them steeples, and I guess likely they've all heard ourn. Come, Rose, said Agate Bissell, at an even earlier hour than when Rose usually awakened. Come, Rose, it is the Sabbath. We must not be late Sunday morning, of all days in the week. It is the Lord's Day. There was little preparation required for the day. Saturday night, in some parts of New England, was considered almost as sacred as Sunday itself, after sundown on Saturday night, no play and no work, except such as is immediately preparatory to the Sabbath, were deemed becoming in good Christians. The clothes had been laid out the night before. Nothing was forgotten. The best frock was ready. The hose and shoes were waiting. Every article of linen, every ruffle and ribbon, were selected on Saturday night. Everyone in the house walked mildly. Everyone spoke in a low tone, yet all were cheerful. The mother had on her kindest face, and nobody laughed, but everybody made it up in smiling. The nurse smiled, and the children held on to keep down a giggle within the lawful bounds of a smile. And the doctor looked rounder and calmer than ever, and the dog flapped his tail on the floor with a softened sound, as if he had fresh wrapped it in hair for that very day. And Tootie, the cook, so the children had changed Mrs. Sarah Good's name, was blacker than ever and shinier than ever, and the coffee better and the cream richer, and the broiled chickens juicier and more tender, and the biscuit whiter and the cornbread more brittle and sweet. When the good doctor read the scriptures at family prayer, 
the infection of silence had subdued everything except the clock. Out of the wide hall could be heard in the stillness the old clock, that now lifted up its voice with unwonted emphasis, as if, unnoticed through the bustling week, Sunday was its vantage ground, to proclaim to mortals the swift flight of time. And if the old pendant performed the task with something of an ostentatious precision, it was because in that house nothing else put on official airs, and the clock felt the responsibility of doing it for the whole mansion. And now came mother and catechism, for Mrs. Wentworth followed the old custom, and declared that no child of hers should grow up without catechism. Secretly, the doctor was quite willing, though openly he played off upon the practice a world of good-natured discouragement, and declared that there should be an opposition set up, a catechism of nature, with natural laws for decrees, and seasons for providence, and flowers for graces. The younger children were taught in simple catechism, but Rose, having reached the mature age of twelve, was now manifesting her power over the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and as it was simply an achievement of memory and not of the understanding, she had the book at great advantage, and soon subdued every question and answer in it. As much as possible the doctor was kept aloof on such occasions. His grave questions were not to edification, and often they caused Rose to stumble, and brought down sorely the exultation with which she rolled forth. They that are effectually called do in this life partake of justification, adoption, sanctification, and the several benefits which in this life do either accompany or flow from them. What do these words mean, Rose? Which words, Pa? Adoption, sanctification, and justification. Rose hesitated and looked at her mother for rescue. Doctor, why do you trouble the child? Of course you don't know yet all the meaning, but that will come to her when she grows older. You make a nest of her memory, then, and put words in there, like eggs, for future hatching? Yes, that is it exactly. Birds do not hatch their eggs the minute they lay them. They wait. Laying eggs at twelve to be hatched at twenty is subjecting them to some risk, is it not? It might be so with eggs, but not with the catechism. They will keep without spoiling a hundred years. Because it is so dry. Because it is so good. But do, dear husband, go away, and not put notions in the children's heads. It's hard enough already to get them through their tasks. Here's poor Arthur, who has been two Sundays on one question, and has not got it yet. Arthur, aforesaid, was sharp and bright in anything addressed to his reason, but he had no verbal memory and he was therefore wading painfully through the catechism like a man in a deep and muddy road, with this difference, that the man carries too much clay with him, while nothing stuck to poor Arthur. The beauty of the day, the genial season of the year, brought forth every one, old men and their feebler old wives, young and hearty men and their plump and ruddy companions, young men and girls and children, thick as punctuation points in Hebrew text, filled the street. In a low voice they spoke to each other in single sentences. A fine day. There'll be a good congregation out today. Yes, we may expect a full house. How is Widow Cheney? Have you heard? Well, not much better. Can't hold out many days. It will be a great loss to the children. Yes, but we must all die. Nobody can skip his turn. Does she still talk about them that's gone? They say not. I believe she's sunk into a quiet way, and it looks as if she'd go off easy. Sunday's a good day for dying. It's about the only journey that speeds well on this day. There was something striking in the outflow of people into the street that till now had seemed utterly deserted. There was no fevered hurry, no negligent or poorly dressed people. Every family came in groups old folks and young children, and every member blossomed forth in his best apparel, like a rose-bush in June. Do you know that man in a silk hat and a new black coat? Probably it is some stranger. No, it is the carpenter, Mr. Beggs, who was racing about yesterday with his sleeves rolled up, and a dust and business look in his face. I knew you would not know him. Adams Gardner, the blacksmith, does he not look every inch a judge, 
now that he is clean washed, shaved, and dressed. His eyes are as bright as the sparks that fly from his anvil. Are not the folks proud of their children? See what groups of them. How ruddy and plump are most. Some are roguish, and cut clandestine capers at every chance. Others seem like wax figures, so perfectly proper are they. Little hands go slyly through the pickets to pluck a tempting flower. Other hands carry hymn-books or Bibles, but, carry what they may, dressed as each parent can afford, is there anything the sun shines upon more beautiful than these troops of Sunday children? The old bell had it all its own way up in the steeple. It was the licensed noise of the day. In a long shed behind the church stood a score and half-score of wagons and chaises and carryalls, the horses already beginning the forenoon's work of stamping and whisking the flies. More were coming. Hiram Beers had hitched up and brought two loads with his new hack, and now, having secured the team, he stood with a few admiring young fellows about him, remarking on the people as they came up. "'There's Trowbridge. He'll get to sleep before the first prayer's over. I don't believe he's heard a sermon in ten years. I've seen him sleep, standing up and singing. Here comes Deacon Marble. Smart old feller, ain't he? Wouldn't think it, just to look at him. Face looks like an ear of last summer's sweet corn, all dried up. But I tell ye, he's got the juice in him yet. Aunt Polly's getting old, ain't she? They say she can't walk half the time, lost the use of her limbs. But it's all gone to her tongue. That's as good as a razor, and a sight better mine, for it never needs sharpening. Stand away, boys. There's by a cathcart. Good horses, not fast, but mighty strong, just like the owner. And with that, Hiram touched his new Sunday hat to Mrs. Cathcart and Alice, and as he took the horses by the bit, he dropped his head and gave the Cathcart boys a look of such awful solemnity, all except one eye, and they lost their sobriety. Barton alone remained sober as a judge. Here comes Dot and Go One and his wife. They're my kind of Christians. She is a saint, at any rate. How is it with you, Tommy Taft? Fair to Midland, thank ye. Such weather would have made a handspike blossom, Hiram. Don't you think that's a leetle strong, Tommy, for Sunday? Perhaps you meant it for its cut. Sartin, that's what I mean. But you mustn't stop me, Hiram. Parson Buell be looking for me. He never begins till I get there. You mean you always get there for he begins. Next Hiram's prying eyes saw Mr. Turfmold, the sexton and undertaker, who seemed to be in a pensive meditation upon all the dead that he had ever buried. He looked upon men in a mild and pitying manner, as if he forgave them for being in good health. You could not help feeling that he gazed upon you with a professional eye, and saw just how you would look in the condition which was to him the most interesting period of a man's earthly state. He walked with a soft tread, as if he was always at a funeral, and when he shook your hand, his left hand followed his right, as if he were about beginning to lay you out, and he was one of the few men absorbed by his business, and who unconsciously measured all things from its standpoint. "'Good morning, Mr. Turfmold. How's your health? How is business with you?' "'Good. The Lord be praised. I've no reason to complain.' And he glided silently and smoothly into the church." "'There comes Judge Bacon, white and ugly,' said the critical Hiram. "'I wonder what he comes to meetin' for. Lord knows he needs it, sly, slippery old sinner. Face is as white as a lily, his heart's as black as a chimney flue afore it's cleaned. He'll get his flue burned out if he don't repent, that's certain. He don't believe the Bible. They say he don't believe in God. Wall, I guess it's pretty even between em. Shouldn't wonder if God didn't believe in him neither.' As soon as the afternoon service was over, every horse on the green knew that it was time for him to go home. Some grew restless and whinnied for their masters. Nimble hands soon put them into the shafts, or repaired any irregularity of harness. Then came such a scramble of vehicles to the church door for the older persons, while young women and children, venturing further out upon the green, were taken up hastily, that the impatient horses might as soon as possible turn their heads homeward. Clouds of dust began to arise along every outward-going road. In less than ten minutes not a wagon or chaise was seen upon the village green. 
they were whirling homeward at the very best pace that the horses could raise. Stiff old steeds vainly essayed a nimbler gait, but gave it up in a few rods, and fell back to the steady jog. Young horses, tired of long standing, and with a strong yearning for evening oats, shot along the level ground, rushed up the little hills or down upon the other side, in the most unsunday like haste. The scene was not altogether unlike the return from a military funeral, to which men march with sad music and slow, but from which they return nimbly marching to the most brilliant quickstep. In half an hour Norwood was quiet again. The dinner on Sunday, when for the sake of the outlying population the two services are brought near together in the middle of the day, was usually deferred until the ordinary supper hour. It was evident that the tone of the day was changed. Children were not strictly held in. There was no loud talking, nor was laughing allowed. But a general feeling sprung up around the table that the severer tasks of the day were ended. Devout and age-sobered people sat in a kind of golden twilight of meditation. The minister, in his well-ordered house, tired with a double service, mingled thoughts both glad and sad. His tasks were ended. He was conscious that he had manfully done his best, but that best doing, as he reflected upon it, seemed so poor, so unworthy of the nobleness of the theme, and so relatively powerless upon the stubborn stuff of which his people's dispositions were made, that there remained a vague, unquiet sense of blame upon his conscience. It was Dr. Wentworth's habit to walk with his family in the garden, early in the morning and late in the afternoon. If early, Rose was usually his company. In the afternoon, the whole family, a gate Bissell always accepted. She had in full measure that peculiar New England feeling that Sunday is to be kept by staying in the house, except such time as is spent at church. And though she never, impliedly even, rebuked the doctor's resort to his garden, it was plain that deep down in her heart she thought it an improper way of spending Sunday, and in that view she had the secret sympathy of almost all the noteworthy villagers. Had any one, upon that day, made a gate a visit, unless for some plain end of necessity or mercy, she would have deemed it a personal affront. Sunday was the Lord's Day. A gate acted as if any use of it for her own pleasure would be literal and downright stealing. We have six days for our own work. We ought not to begrudge the Lord one whole day. Two circumstances distressed Honest Agate's conscience. The one was that the incursion of summer visitors from the city was tending manifestly to relax the Sabbath, especially after the church services. The other was that Dr. Wentworth would occasionally allow Judge Bacon to call in and discuss with him topics suggested by the sermons. She once expressed herself in this wise. Either Sunday is worth keeping, or it is not. If you do keep it, it ought to be strictly done. But lately Sunday is raveling out at the end. We take it on like a summer dress, which in the morning is clean and sweet, but at night it is soiled at the bottom and much rumpled all over. Dr. Wentworth sat with Rose on one side and her mother on the other, in the honeysuckle corner, where the west could be seen, great trees lying athwart the horizon and checkering the golden light with their dark masses. Judge Bacon had turned the conversation upon this very topic. I think our Sundays in New England are Puritan and Jewish more than Christian. They are days of restriction rather than of joyousness. They are fast days, not feast days. Do you say that as a mere matter of historical criticism, or do you think they could be improved practically? Both. It is susceptible of proof that the early Christian Sunday was a day of triumph, and of much social joy. It would be well if we could follow primitive example. A judge, I am hardly of your opinion. I should be unwilling to see our New England Sunday changed, except perhaps by a larger social liberty in each family. Much might be done to make it attractive to children, and relieve older persons from ennui. But after all, we must judge things by their fruits. If you bring me good apples, it is vain to abuse the tree as craggy, rude, or homely. The fruit redeems the tree. A very comely figure, doctor, but not very good reasoning. 
New England has had something at work upon her besides her Sundays. What you call the fruit grew, a good deal of it at any rate, on other trees than Sunday trees. You are only partly right. New England character and history are the result of a widespread system of influences of which the Sabbath day was the type, and not only so, but the grand motive power. Almost every cause which has worked benignly among us has received its inspiration and impulse largely from this one solitary day of the week. It is true that all vegetable growths that we see about us here depend upon a great variety of causes, but there is one cause that is the condition of power in every other, and that is the sun. And so, many as have been the influences working at New England's character, Sunday has been a generic and multiplex force, inspiring and directing all others. Indeed, it is the sun's day. It is a little singular that, borrowing the name from the heathen calendar, it should have tallied so with the scripture's name, the Lord's day, that Lord who was the morning star in early day, and at length the sun of righteousness. Jews called it the Sabbath, a day of rest. Modern Christians call it the sun's day, or the day of light, warmth, and growth. If this seems fanciful so far as the names of the day are concerned, it is strikingly characteristic of the real spirit of the two days, in the ancient and modern dispensation. I doubt if the old Jews ever kept a Sabbath religiously, as we understand that term. Indeed, I suspect there was not yet a religious strength in that national character that could hold up religious feelings without the help of social and even physical adjuvants. Their religious days were either fasts or like our Thanksgiving days, but the higher and richer moral nature which has been developed by Christianity enables communities to sustain one day in seven upon a high and spiritual plane with the need of very little social help and without the feasting element at all. That may be very well for a few saints like you and me, doctor, but it is too high for the majority of men. Common people find the strict Sundays a great annoyance and clandestinely set them aside. I doubt it. There are a few in every society that live by their sensuous nature. Sunday must be a dead day to them, a dark room. No wonder they break through. But it is not so with the sturdy, unsophisticated laboring class in New England. If it came to a vote, you would find that the farmers of New England would be the defenders of the day, even if screwed up to the old strictness. Their instinct is right. It is an observance that has always worked its best effects upon the common people. And if I were to change the name, I should call Sunday the poor man's day. Men do not yet perceive that the base of the brain is full of despotism, and the corneal brain is radiant with liberty. I mean that the laws and relations which grow out of men's relations in physical things are the sternest and hardest, and at every step in the ascent toward reason and spirituality the regulations grow more kindly and free. Now, it is natural for men to prefer an animal life. By and by they will learn that such a life necessitates force absolutism. It is natural for unreflecting men to complain when custom or institutions hold them up to some higher degree, but that higher degree has in it an element of emancipation from the necessary despotisms of physical life. If it were possible to bring the whole community up to a plane of spirituality, it would be found that there, and there only, could be the highest measure of liberty. And this is my answer to those who grumble at the restriction of Sunday liberty. It is only the liberty of the senses that suffers. A higher and nobler civil liberty, moral liberty, social liberty, will work out of it. Sunday is the common people's Magna Carta. Well done, doctor. I give up. Hereafter you shall see me radiant on Sunday. I must not get my hay in if storms do threaten to spoil it. But I shall give my conscience a hitch up, and take it out in that. I must not ride out— but then I shall regard every virtuous self-denial as a moral investment with good dividends coming in by and by. I can't let the children frolic in the front dooryard, but then, while they sit waiting for the sun to go down, and your Sunday to be over, I shall console myself that they are one notch near an angelic condition every week. But good night. Good night, Mrs. Wentworth. I hope you may not become so spiritual as to quite disdain the body." 
I really think, for this world, the body has some respectable uses yet. Good night, Rose. The angels take care of you, if there is one of them good enough. And so the judge left. They sat silently looking at the sun, now but just above the horizon. A few scarfs of cloud, brilliant with flame color, and every moment changing forms, seemed like winged spirits, half revealed, that hovered round the retiring orb. Mrs. Wentworth at length broke the silence. "'I always thought, doctor, that you believed Sunday over strictly kept, and that you were in favor of relaxation.' "'I am. Just as fast as you can make it a day of real religious enjoyment, it will relax itself. True and deep spiritual feeling is the freest of all expressions, and it reconciles in itself the most perfect consciousness of liberty with the most thorough observance of outward rules and proprieties. Liberty is not an outward condition, it is an inward attribute, or rather a name for that quality of life produced by the highest moral attributes. When communities come to that condition, we shall see fewer laws and higher morality. The great one poem of New England is her Sunday. Through that she has escaped materialism. That has been a crystal dome overhead, through which imagination has been kept alive. New England's imagination is to be found, not in art and literature, but in her inventions, her social organism, and, above all, in her religious life. The Sabbath has been the nurse of that. When she ceases to have a Sunday, she will be as this landscape is, now growing dark, all its lines blurred, its distances and gradations fast merging into sheeted darkness and night. Come, let us go in. End of section 33section thirty four of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by pamela krantz library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four section thirty four ludwig van beethoven 1770-1827 by E. Irenaeus Stevenson We are warned on high authority that no man can serve two masters. The caution should obtain in aesthetics as well as in ethics. As a general rule, the painter must stick to his easel, the sculptor must carve, the musician must score or play or sing, the actor must act, each with no more than the merest coquettings with sister arts. Otherwise his genius is apt to suffer from what are side issues for temperament. To many minds a taste and even a singular capacity for an avocation has injured the work done in the real vocation. Beethoven. Of course there are exceptions. The versatility has not always been fatal. We recall Leonardo, Angelo, Rossetti, and Blake among painters. In the ranks of musicians we note Hoffman, Berlioz, Schumann, Wagner, Boito. In other art paths such personal pages as those of Cellini and the critical writings of story of today may add their evidence. The essentially autobiographic in such a connection must be accepted with reserve so must be taken much admirable writing as to the art in which the critic or teacher has labored didactics are not necessarily literature perhaps the best basis of determining the right to literary recognition of men and women who have written and printed more or less without actually professing letters will be the interest of the matter they have left to the kind of reader who does not care a pin about their real life work or about their self-expression as it really comes down to us in painting the dual capacity for the brush and for letters has more shining examples than in music but with beethoven schumann boito and wagner comes a striking succession of men who as to autobiography or criticism or verse present a high quality of interest to the general reader in the instance of beethoven the critical or essayistic side is limited it is by his letters and diary that we study, only less vividly than in his music, a character of profound depth and imposing nobility, 
a nature of exquisite sensitiveness in them we follow if fragmentarily the battle of personality against environment the secrets of strong but high passion the artist temperament endowed with a dignity and a moral majesty seldom equalled in an art indeed called divine but with children who frequently remind us that pan absorbed in playing his syrinx has a goat's hoof beethoven in all his correspondence wrote himself down as what he was a superior man a mighty soul in many traits as well as a supreme creative musician his letters are absorbing whether they breathe love or anger discouragement or joy rebellion against untoward conditions of daily life or solemn resignation the religious quality too is strong in them that element more in touch with deism than with one or another orthodoxy withal he is as sincere in every line of such matter as he was in the spoken word his correspondence holds up the mirror to his own nature with its extremes of impulse and reserve of affection and austerity of confidence and suspicion it abounds too in that brusque yet seldom coarse humor which leaps up in the finale of the seventh symphony in the eighth symphony's waggery the last movement of the concerto in e flat they offer likewise verbal admissions of such depression of heart as we recognize in the sternest episodes of the later sonatas and of the gallatin quartets and in the awful allegretto of the symphony in a they hint at the amorous passion of the slow movements of the fourth and ninth symphonies at the moral heroism of the fifth at the more human courage of the heroic at the mysticism of the ninth tremendous opening in interesting relation to the group and merely of superficial interest are his hasty notes his occasional efforts to write in english or in french his touches of musical elusiveness it is not in the purpose of these prefatory paragraphs to a too brief group of beethoven's letters to enter upon his biography that is essentially a musician's life albeit the life of a musician who as mr edward danreuther suggests leaves behind him the domain of mere art and enters upon that of the seer and the prophet he was born in bonn in 1770 on a day the date of which is not certain though we know that his baptism was december seventeenth his youth was not a sunshiny period poverty neglect a drunken father violin lessons under compulsion were the circumstances ushering him into his career he was for a brief time a pupil of mozart just enough so to preserve that succession of royal geniuses expressed in linking mozart to haydn and in remembering that liszt played for beethoven and that schubert stood beside beethoven's last sickbed high patronage and interest gradually took the composer under its care austria and germany recognized him england accepted him early universal intelligence became enthusiastic over utterances in art that seemed as much innovations as wagneristic writing seemed to the next generation in vienna beethoven may be said to have passed his life there were the friends to whom he wrote who understood and loved him afflicted early with a deafness that became total the irony of fate the majority of his masterworks were evolved from a mind shut away from the pleasures and disturbances of earthly sounds and beset by invalidism and suffering naturally genial he grew morbidly sensitive infirmities of temper as well as of body marked him for their own but underneath all superficial shortcomings of his intensely human nature was a shakespearean dignity of moral and intellectual individuality it is not necessary here even to touch on the works that follow him they stand now as firmly as ever perhaps more firmly in the honor and the affection of all the world of auditors in touch with the highest expressions in the tone world the mere mention of such monuments as the sonatas the nine symphonies the mass in d minor the magnificent chain of overtures the dramatic concert arias does not exhaust the list they are the vivid self-expressions of one who learned in suffering what he taught in song a man whose personality impressed itself into almost everything that he wrote upon almost every one whom he met and who towers up as impressively as the author of hamlet the sculptor of moses the painter of the last supper 
it is perhaps interesting to mention that the very chirography of beethoven's letters is eloquent of the man handwriting is apt to be mendelssohn the well-balanced the precise wrote like copper plate wagner wrote a fine strong hand seldom with erasures spontini the soldier-like wrote with the decision of a soldier beethoven's letters and notes are in a large open dashing hand often scrawls always with the blackest of ink full of changes and not a flourish to spare the handwriting of impulse and carelessness as to form compared with a writer's desire of making his meaning clear Irenaeus stevenson from letter to dr wiegler vienna in what an odious light have you exhibited me to myself oh i acknowledge it i do not deserve your friendship it was no intentional or deliberate malice that induced me to act towards you as i did but inexcusable thoughtlessness alone i say no more i am coming to throw myself into your arms and to entreat you to restore me my lost friend and you will give him back to me to your penitent loving and ever grateful beethoven to the same vienna june twenty ninth eighteen hundred my dear and valued wiegler how much i thank you for your remembrance of me little as i deserve it or have sought to deserve it and yet you are so kind that you allow nothing not even my unpardonable neglect to discourage you always remaining the same true good and faithful friend that i can ever forget you or yours once so dear and precious to me do not for a moment believe there are times when i find myself longing to see you again and wishing that i could go to stay with you my fatherland that lovely region where i first saw the light is still as distinct and beauteous in my eyes as when i quitted you in short i shall esteem the time when i once more see you and again greet father rhine as one of the happiest periods of my life when this may be i cannot yet tell but at all events i may say that you shall not see me again till i have become not only eminent as an artist but better and more perfect as a man and if the condition of our fatherland be then more prosperous my art shall be entirely devoted to the benefit of the poor o oh, blissful moment how happy do i esteem myself that i can expedite it and bring it to pass you desire to know something of my position well it is by no means bad however incredible it may appear i must tell you that lichnowsky has been and still is my warmest friend slight dissensions occurred occasionally between us and yet they only served to strengthen our friendship he settled on me last year the sum of six hundred florins for which i am to draw on him till i can procure some suitable situation my compositions are very profitable and i may really say that i have almost more commissions than it is possible for me to execute i can have six or seven publishers or more for every piece if i choose they no longer bargain with me i demand and they pay so you see this is a very good thing for instance i have a friend in distress and my purse does not admit of my assisting him at once but i have only to sit down and write and in a short time he is relieved i am also become more economical than formerly to give you some idea of my extraordinary deafness i must tell you that in the theatre i am obliged to lean close up against the orchestra in order to understand the actors and when a little way off i hear none of the high notes of instruments or singers it is most astonishing that in conversation some people never seem to observe this as i am subject to fits of absence they attribute it to that cause often i can scarcely hear a person if he speaks low i can distinguish the tones but not the words and yet i feel it intolerable if any one shouts to me heaven alone knows how it is to end varing declares that i shall certainly improve even if i be not entirely restored how often have i cursed my existence plutarch led me to resignation i shall strive if possible to set fate at defiance although there must be moments in my life when i cannot fail to be the most unhappy of god's creatures I entreat you to say nothing of my affliction to any one, not even to Larchon. I confide the secret to you alone, and entreat you some day to correspond with Varing on the subject. If I continue in the same state, I shall come to you in the ensuing spring, when you must engage a house for me somewhere in the country, 
amid beautiful scenery and i shall then become a rustic for a year which may perhaps effect a change resignation what a miserable refuge and yet it is my sole remaining one you will forgive my thus appealing to your kindly sympathies at a time when your own position is sad enough farewell my kind faithful wiegler rest assured of the love and friendship of your beethoven from the letters to bettina brentano never was there a lovelier spring than this year i say so and feel it too because it was then i first knew you you have yourself seen that in society i am like a fish on the sand which writhes and writhes but cannot get away till some benevolent galatea casts it back into the mighty ocean i was indeed fairly stranded dearest friend when surprised by you at a moment in which moroseness had entirely mastered me but how quickly it vanished at your aspect i was at once conscious that you came from another sphere than this absurd world where with the best inclinations i cannot open my ears i am a wretched creature and yet i complain of others you will forgive this from the goodness of heart that beams in your eyes and the good sense manifested by your ears at least they understand how to flatter by the mode in which they listen my ears are alas a partition wall through which i can with difficulty hold any intercourse with my fellow-creatures otherwise perhaps i might have felt more assured with you but i was only conscious of the full intelligent glance from your eyes which affected me so deeply that never can i forget it my dear friend dearest girl art who comprehends it with whom can i discuss this mighty goddess how precious to me were the few days when we talked together or i should rather say corresponded i have carefully preserved the little notes with your clever charming most charming answers so i have to thank my defective hearing for the greater part of our fugitive intercourse being written down since you left this i have had some unhappy hours hours of the deepest gloom when i could do nothing i wandered for three hours in the schonbrunn ali after you left us but no angel met me there to take possession of me as you did pray forgive my dear friend this deviation from the original key but i must have such intervals as a relief to my heart you have no doubt written to goethe about me i would gladly bury my head in a sack so that i might neither see nor hear what goes on in the world because i shall meet you there no more but i shall get a letter from you hope sustains me as it does half the world through life she has been my close companion or what would have become of me I send you Kenst du das Land, written with my own hand, as a remembrance of the hour when I first knew you. If you mention me when you write to Goethe, strive to find words expressive of my deep reverence and admiration. I am about to write to him myself with regard to Egmont, for which I have written some music solely from my love for his poetry, which always delights me. Who can be sufficiently grateful to a great poet? the most precious jewel of a nation kings and princes can indeed create professors and privy councillors and confer titles and decorations but they cannot make great men spirits that soar above the base turmoil of this world there their powers fail and this it is that forces them to respect us when two persons like goethe and myself meet these grandees cannot fail to perceive what such as we consider great yesterday on our way home we met the whole imperial family we saw them coming some way off when goethe withdrew his arm from mine in order to stand aside and say what i would i could not prevail on him to make another step in advance i pressed down my hat more firmly on my head buttoned up my greatcoat and crossing my arms behind me i made my way through the thickest portion of the crowd princes and courtiers formed a lane for me archduke rudolph took off his hat and the empress bowed to me first these great ones of the earth know me to my infinite amusement i saw the procession defile past goethe who stood aside with his hat off bowing profoundly i afterwards took him sharply to task for this i gave him no quarter and upbraided him with all his sins to countess giulietta guicciardi monday evening july sixth you grieve dearest of all beings i have just heard that the letters must be sent off very early 
Mondays and Thursdays are the only days when the post goes to K from here. You grieve. Ah, where I am, there you are ever with me. How earnestly shall I strive to pass my life with you, and what a life will it be? Whereas now, without you, and persecuted by the kindness of others, which I neither deserve nor try to deserve, the servility of man towards his fellow man pains me, and when I regard myself as a component part of the universe, what am I? What is he who is called the greatest? And yet herein are displayed the godlike feelings of humanity. I weep in thinking that you will receive no intelligence from me till probably Saturday. However dearly you may love me, I love you more fondly still. Never conceal your feelings from me. Good night as a patient at these baths i must now go to rest a few words are here effaced by beethoven himself o oh, heavens so near and yet so far is not our love a truly celestial mansion but firm as the vault of heaven itself july seventh good morning even before i rise my thoughts throng to you my immortal beloved sometimes full of joy and yet again sad waiting to see whether fate will hear us i must live either wholly with you or not at all indeed i have resolved to wander far from you till a moment arrives when i can fly into your arms and feel that they are my home and send forth my soul in unison with yours into the realm of spirits alas it must be so you will take courage for you know my fidelity never can another possess my heart never never Oh, heavens, why must I fly from her I so fondly love, and yet my existence in W. was as miserable as here? Your love made me the most happy, and yet the most unhappy, of men. At my age life requires a uniform equality. Can this be found in our mutual relations? My angel, I have this moment heard that the post goes every day, so I must conclude that you may get this letter the sooner." be calm for we can only attain our object of living together by the calm contemplation of our existence continue to love me yesterday to-day what longings for you what tears for you for you for you my life my all farewell oh love me for ever and never doubt the faithful heart of your lover l ever thine ever mine ever each other's to my brothers Karl and Johann Beethoven. Heiligenstadt, October 6, 1802. Oh, ye who think or declare me to be hostile, morose, and misanthropical, how unjust you are, and how little you know the secret cause of what appears thus to you! My heart and mind were ever from childhood prone to the most tender feelings of affection, and I was always disposed to accomplish something great but you must remember that six years ago i was attacked by an incurable malady aggravated by unskilful physicians deluded from year to year too by the hope of relief and at length forced to the conviction of a lasting affliction the cure of which may go on for years and perhaps after all prove impracticable born with a passionate and excitable temperament keenly susceptible to the pleasures of society i was yet obliged early in life to isolate myself and to pass my existence in solitude if i at any time resolved to surmount all this oh how cruelly was i again repelled by the experience sadder than ever of my defective hearing and yet i found it impossible to say to others speak louder shout for i am deaf alas how could i proclaim the deficiency of a sense which ought to have been more perfect with me than with other men a sense which i once possessed in the highest perfection to an extent indeed that few of my profession ever enjoyed alas i cannot do this forgive me therefore when you see me withdraw from you with whom i would so gladly mingle my misfortune is doubly severe from causing me to be misunderstood no longer can i enjoy recreation and social intercourse refined conversation or mutual outpourings of thought completely isolated i only enter society when compelled to do so i must live like an exile in company i am assailed by the most painful apprehensions from the dread of being exposed to the risk of my condition being observed it was the same during the last six months i spent in the country 
my intelligent physician recommended me to spare my hearing as much as possible which was quite in accordance with my present disposition though sometimes tempted by my natural inclination for society i allowed myself to be beguiled into it but what humiliation when any one beside me heard a flute in the far distance while i heard nothing or when others heard a shepherd singing and i still heard nothing such things brought me to the verge of desperation and well-nigh caused me to put an end to my life art art alone deterred me ah how could i possibly quit the world before bringing forth all that i felt it was my vocation to produce and thus i spared this miserable life so utterly miserable that any sudden change may reduce me at any moment from my best condition into the worst it is decreed that i must now choose patience for my guide this i have done i hope the resolve will not fail me steadfastly to persevere till it may please the inexorable fates to cut the thread of my life perhaps i may get better perhaps not i am prepared for either constrained to become a philosopher in my twenty-eighth year this is no slight trial and more severe on an artist than on any one else god looks into my heart he searches it and knows that love for man and feelings of benevolence have their abode there oh ye who may one day read this think that you have done me injustice and let any one similarly afflicted be consoled by finding one like himself who in defiance of all the obstacles of nature has done all in his power to be included in the ranks of estimable artists and men my brothers karl and johann as soon as i am no more if professor schmidt be still alive beg him in my name to describe my malady and to add these pages to the analysis of my disease that at least so far as possible the world may be reconciled to me after my death i also hereby declare you both heirs of my small fortune if so it may be called share it fairly agree together and assist each other you know that anything you did to give me pain has been long forgiven i thank you my brother karl in particular for the attachment you have shown me of late my wish is that you may enjoy a happier life and one more free from care than mine has been recommend virtue to your children that alone and not wealth can ensure happiness i speak from experience it was virtue alone which sustained me in my misery i have to thank her and art for not having ended my life by suicide farewell love each other i gratefully thank all my friends especially prince lichnovsky and professor schmidt i wish one of you to keep prince l's instruments but i trust this will give rise to no dissension between you if you think it more beneficial however you have only to dispose of them how much i shall rejoice if i can serve you even in the grave so be it then i joyfully hasten to meet death if he comes before i have had the opportunity of developing all my artistic powers then notwithstanding my cruel fate he will come too early for me and i should wish for him at a more distant period but even then i shall be content for his advent will release me from a state of endless suffering come when he may i shall meet him with courage farewell do not quite forget me even in death i deserve this from you because during my life i so often thought of you and wished to make you happy amen ludwig van beethoven written on the outside thus then i take leave of you and with sadness too the fond hope i brought with me here of being to a certain degree cured now utterly forsakes me as autumn leaves fall and wither so are my hopes blighted almost as i came i depart even the lofty courage that so often animated me in the lovely days of summer is gone for ever o oh, providence vouchsafe me one day of pure felicity how long have i been estranged from the glad echo of true joy when o oh my god when shall i again feel it in the temple of nature and of man never ah that would be too hard to be read and fulfilled after my death by my brothers karl and johann to the royal and imperial high court of appeal january seventh eighteen twenty the welfare of my nephew is dearer to my heart than it can be to any one else i am myself childless and have no relations except this boy 
who is full of talent, and I have good grounds to hope the best for him, if properly trained. My efforts and wishes have no other aim than to give the boy the best possible education, his abilities justifying the brightest hopes, and to fulfill the trust placed in my brotherly love by his father. The shoot is still flexible, but if longer neglected it will become crooked, and outgrow the gardener's training hand, and upright bearing, intellect, and character be destroyed for ever. I know no duty more sacred than the education and training of a child. The chief duties of a guardian consist in knowing how to appreciate what is good, and in adopting a right course. Then alone has proper attention been devoted to the welfare of his ward, whereas in opposing what is good he neglects his duty. Indeed, keeping in view what is most for the benefit of the boy, I do not object to the mother in so far sharing in the duties of a guardian that she may visit her son and see him and be apprised of all the measures adopted for his education but to entrust her with his sole guardianship without a strict guardian by her side would cause the irretrievable ruin of her son on these cogent grounds i reiterate my well-founded solicitation and feel the more confident of a favourable answer as the welfare of my nephew alone guides my steps in this affair to Baroness von Drostick. I live in entire quiet and solitude, and even though occasional flashes of light arouse me, still since you all left I feel a hopeless void which even my art, usually so faithful to me, has not yet triumphed over. Your pianoforte is ordered, and you shall soon have it. What a difference you must have discovered between the treatment of the theme I extemporized on the other evening, and the mode in which I have recently written it out for you. You must explain this yourself, only do not find the solution in the punch. How happy you are to get away so soon to the country! I cannot enjoy this luxury till the eighth. I look forward to it with the delight of a child. What happiness I shall feel in wandering among groves and woods, and among trees and plants and rocks! No man on earth can love the country as I do. Thickets, trees, and rocks supply the echo man longs for. To Zmiskal, 1811. Most high-born of men, we beg you to confer some goose-quills on us. We will in return send you a whole bunch of the same sort, that you may not be obliged to pluck out your own. It is just possible that you may yet receive the grand cross of the order of the violoncello. We remain your gracious and most friendly of all friends, Beethoven. To Zmiskal, February 2nd, 1812. Most wonderful of men! We beg that your servant will engage a person to fit up my apartment. As he is acquainted with the lodgings, he can fix the proper price at once. Do this soon, you carnival scamp! The enclosed note is at least a week old. To his brother Johann. Baden, May 6th, 1825. The bell and bell pulls, etc., etc., are on no account whatever to be left in my former lodging. No proposal was ever made to these people to take any of my things. Indisposition prevented my sending for it, and the locksmith had not come during my stay to take down the bell. Otherwise it might have been at once removed and sent to me in town, as they have no right whatever to retain it. Be this as it may, I am quite determined not to leave the bell there for I require one here, and therefore intend to use the one in question for my purpose, as a similar one would cost me twice as much as in Vienna, bell-pulls being the most expensive things locksmiths have. If necessary, apply at once to the police. The window in my room is precisely in the same state as when I took possession, but I am willing to pay for it, and also for the one in the kitchen, two florins, twelve kreutzers, for the two. The key I will not pay for, as I found none, on the contrary the door was fastened or nailed up when I came, and remained in the same condition till I left. There never was a key, so of course neither I myself nor those who preceded me could make use of one. Perhaps it is intended to make a collection, in which case I am willing to put my hand in my pocket. Ludwig van Beethoven To Stephen V. Bruning My dear and much-loved Stephen may our temporary estrangement be forever effaced by the portrait i now send 
I know that I have rent your heart. The emotion which you cannot fail now to see in mine has sufficiently punished me for it. There was no malice towards you in my heart, for then I should be no longer worthy of your friendship. It was passion, both on your part and on mine, but mistrust was rife within me, for people had come between us, unworthy both of you and of me. My portrait was long ago intended for you. You knew that it was destined for someone, and to whom could I give it with such warmth of heart as to you, my faithful, good, and noble Stephan? Forgive me for having grieved you, but I did not myself suffer less when I no longer saw you near me. I then first keenly felt how dear you were, and ever will be to my heart. Surely you will once more fly to my arms as you formerly did. End of section 34 Recording by Pamela Krantz Section 35 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. Section 35 Selected Poems by Carl Michael Bellman. Carl Michael Bellman, 1740 to 1795, by Olga Flinch. Carl Michael Bellman was born in Stockholm on the 4th of February, 1740. His father, son of a professor at Uppsala University, held a government office. Of his mother he wrote that she was fair as day, unspeakably good, dressed prettily, was kind to everybody, of a refined nature, and had an excellent voice. From her he undoubtedly inherited the warm, genial heart which beats in every one of his songs. His father's house was the rendezvous of many of the noted men of the day among them the poet Dahlen, who was then at the zenith of his popularity. The boy's unusual gifts were early recognized, and everything was done to give him the best instruction, especially after an attack of fever, during which he not only spoke in rhyme, but sang his first improvised songs in a clear, true voice. The tutor who was then chosen taught him, besides the art of making verse, English, French, German, and Italian, and he progressed far enough in these studies to translate several German hymns and religious and philosophic essays, no doubt influenced in this choice of subjects by the religious atmosphere of his home. Moreover, he taught himself to play the zither, and very soon began to pick out his own melodies as an accompaniment to his songs. The instrument he used had been brought home from Italy by his grandfather, became his closest companion throughout life, and is now kept at the Royal Academy of Arts at Stockholm. At eighteen he entered the University of Uppsala, and while there wrote a satirical poem, The Moon, which he submitted to the criticism of Dahlen, who, however, made but a single correction. It was written in the manner of Dahlen, and he continued to be influenced by the latter until his twenty-fifth year. At this time, and within the same year, his father and mother died, and seeking among his friends the social stimulus which his nature craved, he became a frequent guest at the inns in the company of Hallmann and Krexel who were making their mark by their poetic and dramatic writings. It was then that his peculiar talent came to its own. He threw away all foreign influence, and began to sing his songs, born of the impression of the moment, and full of the charm of spontaneity. Some of them he jotted down quickly, most of them he sang to the sound of his zither, 
often fashioning them to suit well-known melodies, and again creating the melody with the words, for the greater part set in a form of verse not previously used. And so inseparably linked are words and melody, that it has not occurred to any one to set any other music to Bellman's songs than what he originally chose. He took all his characters out of the life he saw around him, and with the appreciation of the man to whom the present is everything, he seized the charm of the fleeting moment and expressed it with such simplicity and truth, and deep feeling withal, that it stands forth immortally fresh and young. A number of these songs have probably been lost. He had no thirst for fame, and took no pains to circulate them, but they found their way to the public in written copies and cheap prints, and his name was soon known throughout the country. This way of living and singing like the birds of the air was, however, not very conducive to the satisfaction of material wants. He had made two attempts to go into business, but the more he was seen at the ends, the less he was seen at his business. Fortunately for him, Gustavus the Third, who was himself a poet, became at this time King of Sweden. He was an adherent of the French school of poetry, and Bellman's muse could hardly be said to belong to this, but with considerable talent as a dramatic writer, Gustavus appreciated the dramatic quality in Bellman's songs and when Belmont sent him a rhymed petition, still kept, in which he wrote that if his majesty would not most graciously give him an office, he would most obediently be obliged to starve to death before Christmas. The king made him secretary of the lottery, with the title of court secretary, and a yearly income of three thousand dollars. Belmont promptly gave half of this to an assistant, who did the work, and continued his troubadour life on the other half with a superb disdain of future needs. His affairs so well in order, he could afford to get married, and chose for his wife Lovisa Gurenland, a girl of a bright intellect and strong character of which she ultimately had great need, the responsibilities of their married life being left altogether to her. Bellman was now at his best. About this time he wrote most of Fredman's songs, and actions concerning the chapter of Bacchus order, both rich in lyric gems. He was the favorite companion of the king, to whom his devotion was boundless, and he was happy in his chosen friends whose company inspired him. Nevertheless he was now, as ever, in need of money. Atterbaum tells that one day the king met him on the street, so poorly dressed, that he instinctively exclaimed, My dear Bellman, how poorly you are clad! The poet answered with a bow, I can nevertheless most obediently assure your majesty that I am wearing my entire wardrobe. His ready wit never left him. How goes the world with you? asked the king once when they met. You don't look to me as if you could turn a single rhyme to-day. The poet bowed and replied on the spur of the moment, No scrip my purse doth hold, my lyre's unstrung, alas! but yet upon my glass stands Gustav's name in gold. Another time the king sent his men for him, with the order to bring him in whatever condition they found him. He was found not entirely free from drink, and not very presentable, but was nevertheless carried off, zither and all, to Haga Castle, where he drank some champagne, sang some songs, drank a little more, and finally fell asleep. The king left him so to go to his supper, and when he returned and found his guest still sleeping, he remarked, I wonder what Belmont would say if I awoke him now and asked him to give me a song. The poet sat up, blinked with his eyes, and said, Then Belmont would say, Listen, 
whereupon he sang to the tune of malbrook saint vatan guerre oh so heavily heavily trailing the clouds over haga are sailing and the stars their bright glances are veiling while woods in the gloom disappear go king thy rest is dear go king thy respite taking rest softly rest softly then waking when dawn through the darkness is breaking thy people with mild rule thou cheer then he fell into his former position again and was carried home asleep with a little gift in his hand the task of collecting preserving and publishing his works fell entirely upon his friends if it had depended on him they would probably never have been collected much less published during the last fifteen years of his life from seventeen eighty to seventeen ninety five his health grew very poor in seventeen ninety one he was invited to be present at the distribution of degrees at upsala and at the dinner he returned a toast with a song born of the moment but his voice had grown so weak from lung trouble that only those nearest to him could hear him to add to his sufferings he had to meet the great sorrow of his king's death at the hand of a murderer and his poem on the death and memory of the king was not of a nature to make friends for him at the new court thus it happened that poor and broken in health he was put into the debtor's prison in the very castle where he had been so happy a guest hallman and krexel and others of his best friends as devoted to him as ever were unable to obtain his release but he was at last bailed out by some one who as recompense asked him to sing one of his jolly songs and in his poor broken voice he sang drink out thy glass see death awaits thee atterbaum remarks about the man in question and maybe he did not find that song so jolly after all while in prison he sent in a petition to the king somewhat different from his first petition to gustavus the third in which he asked permission to live in the castle until his death the following is one of the verses spring commands the birds are singing bees are swarming fishes play now and then the zephyrs stray breath of life the poet bringing lift my load of sorrow clinging spare me one small nook i pray of his death atterbaum writes as follows he had been the favorite of the nation and the king content with the mere necessities of life free from every care not even desiring the immortality of fame moderate in everything except in enthusiasm he had enjoyed to the full what he wanted friendship wine and music now he lived to see the shadows fall over his life and genius feeling that his last hour was not far off he sent word to his nearest friends that a meeting with them as in old times would be dear to him he came to meet them almost a shadow but with his old friendly smile even in the toasts he took part however moderately and then he announced that he would let them hear belmont once more the spirit of song took possession of him more powerfully than ever and all the rays of his dying imagination were centered in an improvised good-bye song throughout an entire night under continual inspiration he sang his happy life his mild king's glory his gratitude to providence who let him be born among a noble people in this beautiful northern country finally he gave his grateful good-bye to every one present in a separate strophe and melody expressing the peculiar individuality of the one addressed and his relation to the poet his friends begged him with tears to stop and spare his already much weakened lungs 
but he replied let us die as we have lived in music emptied his last glass of champagne and began at dawn the last verse of his song after this he sang no more a few days later he went to bed lingered for ten weeks and died on the eleventh of february seventeen ninety five aged fifty four years he was buried in clara cemetery bellman's critics have given themselves much trouble about his personal character some have thought him little better than a coarse drunkard others again have made him out a cynic who sneered at the life he depicted again others have laid the weight on the note found in drink out thy glass and have seen only the underlying sad pathos of his songs his contemporaries agree that he was a man of great consideration for form and assert that if there are coarse passages in his songs it is because they only could express what he depicted all coarseness was foreign to his nature he was reserved and somewhat shy and only in the company of his chosen few did he open his heart his critics have moreover assiduously sought the moral of his works if any was intended it may have been that of fighting sentimentality and all false feeling but it seems more in accordance with his entire life that he sang out of the fullness of his heart as a bird sings simply because it must sing olga flinch to ula ula mine ula tell me may i hand thee reddest of strawberries in milk or wine or from the pond a lively fish command me or from the well a bowl of water fine doors are blown open the wind gets the blaming perfumes exhale from flower and tree clouds fleck the sky and the sun rises flaming as you see isn't it heavenly the fish market so heavenly oh heavenly see the stately trees there standing row on row fresh green leaves show and that pretty bay sparkling there ah yes and seen where sunbeams play the meadow's loveliness are they not heavenly those bright fields confess heavenly heavenly skull and good noon fair one in window leaning hark how the city bells their peals prolong see how the dust the verdant turf is screening where the calashes and the wagons throng hand from the window he's drowsy the speaker in my saddle i nod cousin mine primo a crust and secundo a beaker hochlander wine isn't it heavenly the fish market so heavenly oh heavenly see the stately trees there standing row on row fresh green leaves show and that pretty bay sparkling there ah yes and seen where sunbeams play the meadow's loveliness are they not heavenly those bright fields confess heavenly heavenly look ulla dear to the stable they're taking whinnying prancing my good steed i see still in his stall door he lifts his head making efforts to look up to thee just to thee nature itself into flames will be bursting keep those bright eyes in control clang at your casement my heart too is thirsting clang your skull isn't it heavenly the fish market so heavenly oh heavenly see the stately trees there standing row on row fresh green leaves show and that pretty bay sparkling there 
ah yes and seen where sunbeams play the meadow's loveliness are they not heavenly those bright fields confess heavenly heavenly cradle song for my son carl little carl sleep soft and sweet thou wilt soon enough be waking soon enough ill days thou wilt meet their bitterness partaking earth's an isle with grief o'ercast breathe our best death comes at last we but dust forsaking once where flowed a peaceful brook through a rye field stubble stood a little boy to look at himself his double sweet the picture was to see all at once it ceased to be vanished like a bubble and thus it is with life my pet and thus the years go flying live we wisely gaily yet there's no escape from dying little carl on this must muse when the blossoms bright he views on spring's bosom lying slumber little friend so we joy thy joy is bringing clipped from paper thou shalt see a sleigh and horses springing then a house of cards so tall we will build and see it fall and little songs be singing amaryllis up amaryllis darling awaken through the still bracken soft airs swell iris all dightly vestured so brightly coloureth lightly wood and dell amaryllis thy sweet name pronouncing thee and neptune's cool embrace announcing slumbers god the while his sway renouncing o'er your eyes sighs and speech yields his spell now comes the fishing the net we fasten this minute hasten follow me don your skirt and jacket and veil or you'll lack it pike and trout wait a racket sails flap free waken amaryllis darling waken let me not by thy smile be forsaken then by dolphins and fair sirens overtaken in our gay boat we'll sport in company come now your rods lines and nets with you taking the day is breaking hasten thee nigh sweet little treasure think ill in no measure for thee twere no pleasure me to deny let us to the little shallows wander or beside the inlet over yonder where the pledge not made our fond love fonder or which thyrsus erst was moved to sigh step in the boat then both of us singing love his wand swinging over our fate Eol is moving but though wild proving in your arms loving comfort doth wait blessed on angry waves of ocean riding by thee clasped vain twere this dear thought hiding death shall find me in thy pathway biding sirens sing ye and my voice imitate art and politics good servant molberg what's happened to thee whom without coat and hatless i see bloody thy mouth and thou art lacking a tooth where have you been brother tell me the truth at rostock good sir did the trouble occur over me and my harp an argument sharp arose touching my playing pling plingly plang and a bow-legged cobbler coming along struck me in the mouth pling plingly plang 
i sat there and played no carouse could one see the polish queen's polka g major the key the best kind of people were gathered around and each drank his chopin down to the ground i don't know just how began freshly the row but some one from my head knocked my hat and thus said what is poland to thee pling plingily plang play us no polka another one sang now silent be pling plingily plang here by Messinus, what still came to pass as i sat there in quiet enjoying my glass on poland's condition the silence i broke know ye good people aloud thus i spoke that all the monarchs i on this earth do defy my harp to prevent from giving song vent throughout all this land pling plingily plang did only a single string to it hang i'd play a polka pling plingily plang there sat in the corner a sergeant old two notaries and a dragoon bold who cried down with him the cobbler is right poland earns the means of her evil might from behind the stove came an old squint-eyed dame and flung at the harp a glass broken and sharp but the cobbler pling plangily plang made a terrible hole in my neck that long there hast thou the story pling plingily plang o righteous world now i ask of thee if i suffer not wrongly why certainly was i not innocent bless you most sure the harp rent asunder my nose torn and sore twas hard treatment i trow now no better i know than to go through the land with my harp in my hand play for bacchus and venus clang clang with masters best that e'er played or sang attend me apollo pling plingily plang drink out thy glass drink out thy glass see on thy threshold nightly staying his sword stands death awaiting thee be not alarmed the grave door opened slightly closes again a full year it may be ere thou art dragged poor sufferer to the grave pick the octave tune up the strings sing of life with glee golden's the hue thy dull wan cheeks are showing shrunken's thy chest and flat each shoulder blade give me thy hand each dark vein larger growing is to my touch as if in water laid damp are these hands stiff are these veins becoming pick now and strumming empty thy bottle sing drink unafraid skull then my boy old bacchus sends last greeting friar's farewell receive thou o'er thy bowl fast in her praise thy thin blood flows repeating its old time force as it was wont to roll sing read forget nay think and weep while thinking art thou for drinking another bottle thou art dead no skull End of section 35, the recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 36 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Loveday Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4 Section 36 Selected Excerpts by Jeremy Bentham Jeremy Bentham, 1748-1832 Bentham, 
whose name rightly stands sponsor for the utilitarian theory of morals in legislation, though not its originator, was a mighty and unique figure in many ways. His childhood reminds us of that of his disciple John Stuart Mill in its precocity, but fortunately for him, life had more juice in it for young Bentham than it had for Mill. In his maturity and old age, he was widely recognised as a commanding authority, notwithstanding some startling absurdities. He was born in London, February 15th, 1747-8, to eight, the child of an attorney of ample means, who was proud of the youth, and did not hesitate to show him off. In his fourth year he began the study of Latin, and a year later was known in his father's circle as the philosopher. At six or seven he began the study of French. He was then sent to Westminster School, where he must have had a rather uncomfortable time, for he was small in body, sensitive and delicate, and not fond of boyish sports. He had a much happier life at the houses of his grandmothers at Barking and at Browning Hill, where much of his childhood was spent. His reminiscences of these days, as related to his biographer, are full of charm. He was a great reader and a great student, and going to Oxford early, was only sixteen when he took his degree. It must be confessed that he did not bear away with him a high appreciation of the benefits which he owed to his alma mater. Mendacity and insincerity, in these I found the effects, the sure and only sure effects, of an English university education. He wrote a Latin ode on the death of George the Second, which was much praised. In later years he himself said of it, it was a mediocre performance on a trumpery subject, written by a miserable child. On taking his degree, he entered at Lincoln's Inn, but he never made a success in the practice of the law. He hated litigation, and his mind became immediately absorbed in the study and development of the principles of legislation and jurisprudence, and this became the business of his life. He had an intense antipathy to Blackstone, under whom he had sat at Oxford, and in 1776 he published anonymously a severe criticism of his work, under the title Fragments on Government, or a Commentary on the Commentaries, which was at first attributed to Lord Mansfield, Lord Camden, and others. His identification as the author of the Fragments brought him into relations with Lord Shelbourne, who invited him to Bowood, where he made a long and happy visit, of which bright and gossipy letters tell the story. Here he worked on his Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation, in which he developed his utilitarian theory, and here he fell in love with a young lady who failed to respond to his wishes. Writing in 1827, he says, I am alive, more than two months advanced in my eightieth year, more lively than when you presented me in ceremony with a flower in Green Lane. Since that day, not a single one has passed, not to speak of nights, in which you have not engrossed more of my thoughts than I could have wished. Embrace, blank, though it is for me, as it is by you, she will not be severe, nor refuse her lips to me as she did her hand at a time perhaps not yet forgotten by her, any more than by me. Bentham wrote voluminously on morals, on rewards and punishments, on the poor laws, on education, on law reform, on the codification of laws, on special legislative measures, on a vast variety of subjects. His style, at first simple and direct, became turgid, involved, and obscure. He was in the habit of beginning the same work independently many times, and usually drove several horses abreast. He was very severe in his strictures upon persons in authority, and upon current notions, and was constantly being warned that if he should publish such or such a work, he would surely be prosecuted. Numerous books were therefore not published until many years after they were written. His literary style became so prolix and unintelligible that his disciples, 
Dumont, Mill, and others, came to his rescue, and disentangled and prepared for the press his innumerable pamphlets, full of suggestiveness and teeming with projects of reform more or less completely realised since. His publications include more than seventy titles, and he left a vast accumulation of manuscript, much of which has never been read. He had a wide circle of acquaintances, by whom he was held in high honour, and his correspondence with the leading men of his time was constant and important. In his later years he was a pugnacious writer, but he was on intimate and jovial terms with his friends. In 1814 he removed to Ford Abbey, near Chard, and there wrote Crestomatia, a collection of papers on the principles of education, in which he laid stress upon the value of instruction in science, as against the excessive predominance of Greek and Latin. In 1823, in conjunction with James Mill and others, he established the Westminster Review, but he did not himself contribute largely to it. He continued, however, to the end of his life to write on his favourite topics. Robert Dale Owen, in his autobiography, gives the following description of a visit to Bentham during the philosopher's later years. Quote, I preserve a most agreeable recollection of that grand old face, beaming with benignity and intelligence, and occasionally with a touch of humour which I did not expect. I do not remember to have met any one of his age, 78, who seemed to have more complete possession of his faculties, bodily and mental, and this surprised me the more because I knew that in his childhood he had been a feeble-limbed, frail boy. I found him, having overpassed by nearly a decade the allotted threescore years and ten, with step as active and eye as bright and conversation as vivacious as one expects in a hale man of fifty. I shall never forget my surprise when we were ushered by the venerable philosopher into his dining-room. An apartment of good size, it was occupied by a platform about two feet high, and which filled the whole room, except a passageway some three or four feet wide, which had been left so that one could pass all round it. Upon this platform stood the dinner-table and chairs, with room enough for the servants to wait upon us. Around the head of the table was a huge screen, to protect the old man, I suppose, against the draught from the doors. When another half-hour had passed, he touched the bell again. This time his order to the servant startled me. "'John, my nightcap!' I rose to go, and one or two others did the same. Neil sat still. "'Ah!' said Bentham, as he drew a black silk nightcap over his spare grey hair. "'You think that's a hint to go? Not a bit of it. Sit down. I'll tell you when I'm tired. I'm going to vibrate a little. That assists digestion, too.' And with that he descended into the trench-like passage, of which I have spoken, and commenced walking briskly back and forth, his head nearly on a level with ours, as we sat. Of course we all turned toward him. For full half an hour, as he walked, did he continue to pour forth such a witty and eloquent invective against kings, priests, and their retainers, as I have seldom listened to. Then he returned to the head of the table, and kept up the conversation, without flagging, till midnight ere he dismissed us. His parting words to me were characteristic. "'God bless you, if there be such a being. And at all events, my young friend, take care of yourself.'" End of quote. His weak childhood had been followed by a healthy and robust old age, but he wore out at last, and died June 6, 1832, characteristically leaving his body to be dissected for the benefit of science. The greater part of his published writings were collected by Sir John Browning, his executor, and issued in nine large volumes in 1843. Of the Principle of Utility From An Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. On the one hand the standard of right and wrong, on the other the chain of causes and effects, are fastened to their throne. 
they govern us in all we do in all we say in all we think every effort we can make to throw off our subjection will serve but to demonstrate and confirm it in words a man may pretend to abjure their empire but in reality he will remain subject to it all the while the principle of utility recognises this subjection and assumes it for the foundation of that system the object of which is to rear the fabric of felicity by the hands of reason and of law systems which attempt to question it deal in sounds instead of sense in caprice instead of reason in darkness instead of light but enough of metaphor and declamation it is not by such means that moral science is to be improved the principle of utility is the foundation of the present work it will be proper therefore at the outset to give an explicit and determinate account of what is meant by it by the principle of utility is meant that principle which approves or disapproves of every action whatsoever according to the tendency which it appears to have to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interest is in question or what is the same thing in other words to promote or to oppose that happiness i say of every action whatsoever and therefore not only of every action of a private individual but of every measure of government by utility is meant that property in any object whereby it tends to produce benefit advantage pleasure good or happiness all this in the present case comes to the same thing or what comes again to the same thing to prevent the happening of mischief pain evil or unhappiness to the party whose interest is considered if that party be the community in general then the happiness of the community if a particular individual then the happiness of that individual the interest of the community is one of the most general expressions that can occur in the phraseology of morals no wonder that the meaning of it is often lost when it has a meaning it is this the community is a fictitious body composed of the individual persons who are considered as constituting as it were its members the interest of the community then is what the sum of the interests of the several members who compose it it is vain to talk of the interest of the community without understanding what is the interest of the individual a thing is said to promote the interest or to be for the interest of an individual when it tends to add to the sum total of his pleasures or what comes to the same thing to diminish the sum total of his pains an action then may be said to be conformable to the principle of utility or for shortness's sake to utility meaning with respect to the community at large when the tendency it has to augment the happiness of the community is greater than any it has to diminish it a measure of government which is but a particular kind of action performed by a particular person or persons may be said to be conformable to or dictated by the principle of utility when in like manner the tendency which it has to augment the happiness of the community is greater than any which it has to diminish it when an action or in particular a measure of government is supposed by a man to be conformable to the principle of utility it may be convenient for the purposes of discourse to imagine a kind of law or dictate called a law or dictate of utility and to speak of the action in question as being conformable to such law or dictate a man may be said to be a partisan of the principle of utility when the approbation or disapprobation he annexes to any action or to any measure is determined by and proportioned to the tendency which he conceives it to have to augment or to diminish the happiness of the community or in other words to its conformity or unconformity to the laws or dictates of utility of an action that is conformable to the principle of utility one may always say either that it is one that ought to be done or at least that it is not one that ought not to be done one may say also that it is right it should be done at least that it is not wrong it should be done that it is a right action at least that it is not a wrong action 
When thus interpreted, the words ought and right and wrong, and others of that stamp, have a meaning, when otherwise they have none. Reminiscences of Childhood During my visits to Barking, I used to be my grandmother's bedfellow. The dinner hour being as early as two o'clock, she had a regular supper, which was served up in her own sleeping room, and immediately after finishing it she went to bed. Of her supper I was not permitted to partake, nor was the privation a matter of much regret. I had what I preferred, a portion of gooseberry pie. Hers was a scrag of mutton, boiled with parsley and butter. I do not remember any variety. My amusements consisted in building houses with old cards, and sometimes playing at beat the knave out of doors with my grandmother. My time of going to bed was perhaps an hour before hers, but by way of preparation I never failed to receive her blessing. Previous to the ceremony I underwent a catechetical examination, of which one of the questions was, Who were the children that were saved in the fiery furnace? Answer, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But as the examination frequently got no further, the word Abednego got associated in my mind with very agreeable ideas, and it ran through my ears like Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go, in a sort of pleasant confusion, which is not yet removed. As I grew in years, I became a fit receptacle for some of my grandmother's communications, among which the state of her family and the days of her youth were most prominent. There hung on the wall, perpetually in view, a sampler, the produce of the industry and ingenuity of her mother or her grandmother, of which the subject matter was the most important of all theological human incidents, the fall of man in paradise. There was Adam, there was Eve, and there was the serpent. In these there was much to interest and amuse me. One thing alone puzzled me. It was the forbidden fruit. The size was enormous. It was larger than that species of the genus Orangium which goes by the name of the forbidden fruit in some of our West India settlements. Its size was not less than that of the outer shell of a coconut. All the rest of the objects were as usual in plano. This was in alto, indeed in altissimo, relievo. What to make of it, at a time when my mind was unable to distinguish fictions from realities, I knew not. The recollection is strong in me of the mystery it seemed to be. My grandmother promised me the sampler after her death as a legacy, and the promise was no small gratification. But the promise, with many other promises of jewels and gold coins, was productive of nothing but disappointment. Her death took place when I was at Oxford. My father went down, and without consulting me, or giving the slightest intimation of his intention, let the house, and sold to the tenant almost everything that was in it. It was doing as he was wont to do, notwithstanding his undoubted affection for me. In the same way he sold the estate he had given to me as a provision on the occasion of his second marriage. In the mass went some music-books which I had borrowed of Mrs. Brown. Not long after she desired them to be returned. I stood before her like a defenceless culprit, conscious of my inability to make restitution, and at the same time such was my state of mental weakness that I knew not what to say for apology or defence. My grandmother's mother was a matron, I was told, of high respectability and corresponding piety, well-informed and strong-minded. She was distinguished, however, for while other matrons of her age and quality had seen many a ghost, she had seen but one. She was in this particular on a level with the learned lecturer, afterwards judge, the commentator Blackstone. But she was heretical, and her belief bordered on Unitarianism. And by the way, this subject of ghosts has been among the torments of my life. Even now, when sixty or seventy years have passed over my head since my boyhood received the impression which my grandmother gave it, though my judgment is wholly free, my imagination is not wholly so. My infirmity was not unknown to the servants. It was a permanent source of amusement to ply me with horrible phantoms in all imaginable shapes. 
under the pagan dispensation every object a man could set his eyes on had been the seat of some pleasant adventure at barking in the almost solitude of which so large a portion of my life was passed every spot that could be made by any means to answer the purpose was the abode of some spectre or group of spectres so dexterous was the invention of those who worked upon my apprehensions that they managed to transform a real into a fictitious being his name was palethorpe and palethorpe in my vocabulary was synonymous with hobgoblin the origin of these horrors was this my father's house was a short half-mile distant from the principal part of the town from that part where was situated the mansion of the lord of the manor sir crisp gascoigne one morning the coachman and the footman took a conjunct walk to a public-house kept by a man of the name palethorpe they took me with them it was before i was breached they called for a pot of beer took each of them a sip and handed the pot to me on their requisition i took another and when about to depart the amount was called for the two servants paid their quota and i was called on for mine nemo dat quod non habet this maxim to my no small vexation i was compelled to exemplify mr palethorpe the landlord had a visage harsh and ill-favoured and he insisted on my discharging my debt at this very early age without having put in for my share of the gifts of fortune i found myself in the state of an insolvent debtor the demand harassed me so mercilessly that i could hold out no longer the door being open i took to my heels and as the way was too plain to be missed i ran home as fast as they could carry me the scene of the terrors of mr palethorpe's name and visitation in pursuit of me was the country house at barking but neither was the town-house free from them for in those terrors the servants possessed an instrument by which it was in their power at any time to get rid of my presence level with the kitchen level with the landing-place in which the staircase took its commencement were the usual offices when my company became troublesome a sure and continually repeated means of exonerating themselves from it was for the footman to repair to the adjoining subterraneous apartments invest his shoulders with some strong covering and concealing his countenance stalk in with a hollow menacing and inarticulate tone lest that should not be sufficient the servants had stuck by the fireplace the portraiture of a hobgoblin to which they had given the name of palethorpe for some years i was in the condition of poor dr priestley on whose bodily frame another name too awful to be mentioned used to produce a sensation more than mental letter from bowood to george wilson 1781 sunday twelve o'clock where shall i begin let me see the first place by common right to the ladies the ideas i brought with me respecting the female part of this family are turned quite topsy-turvy and unfortunately they are not yet cleared up i had expected to find in lady shelburne a lady louisa fitzpatrick sister of an earl of ossory whom i remember at school instead of her i find a lady who has for her sister a miss caroline v is not this the maid of honour the sister to lady g the lady who was fond of lord c and of whom he was fond and whom he quitted for an heiress and a pair of horns be they who they may the one is loveliest of matrons the other of virgins they have both of them more than i could wish of reserve but it is a reserve of modesty rather than of pride the quadrupeds whom you know i love next consist of a child of a year old a tiger a spaniel formerly attached to lady shelburne at present to my lord besides four plebeian cats who are taken no notice of horses etc and a wild boar who is sent off on a matrimonial expedition to the farm the four first i have commenced a friendship with especially the first of all to whom i am body coachman extraordinary en titre d'office henry for that is his name note the present lord lansdowne for such an animal has the most thinking countenance i ever saw being very clean i can keep him without disgust and even with pleasure especially after having been rewarded as i have just now for my attention to him by a pair of the sweetest smiles imaginable from his mamma and aunt 
as providence hath ordered it they both play on the harpsichord and at chess i am flattered with the hopes of engaging with them before long either in war or harmony not to-day because whether you know it or not it is sunday i know it having been paying my devotions our church the hall our minister a sleek young parson the curate of the parish our saints a naked mercury an apollo in the same dress and a venus de medici our congregation the two ladies captain blanket and your humble servant upon the carpet by the minister below the domestics superioris et inferioris ordinis among the former i was concerned to see poor matthews the librarian who i could not help thinking had as good a title to be upon the carpet as myself of lord fitzmaurice i know nothing but from his bust and letters the first bespeaks him a handsome youth the latter an ingenious one he is not sixteen and already he writes better than his father he is under the care of a mr jervis a dissenting minister who has had charge of him since he was six years old he has never been at any public school of education he has now for a considerable time been travelling about the kingdom that he may know something of his own country before he goes to others and be out of the way of adulation i am interrupted adieu le resta l'ordinaire prochain fragment of a letter to lord lansdowne seventeen ninety it was using me very ill that it was to get upon stilts as you did and resolve not to be angry with me after all the pains i had taken to make you so you have been angry let me tell you with people as little worth it before now and your being so niggardly of it in my instance may be added to the account of your injustice i see you go upon the old christian principle of heaping coals of fire upon people's heads which is the highest refinement upon vengeance i see moreover that according to your system of cosmogony the difference is but accidental between the race of kings and that of the first baron of lixmore that ex-lawyers come like other men from adam and ex-ministers from somebody who started up out of the ground before him in some more elevated part of the country to lower these pretensions it would be serving you right if i were to tell you that i was not half so angry as i appeared to be that therefore according to the countryman's rule you have not so much the advantage over me as you may think you have that the real object of what anger i really felt was rather the situation in which i found myself than you or anybody but that as none but a madman would go to quarrel with a nonentity called a situation it was necessary for me to look out for somebody who somehow or other was connected with it end of section thirty six recording by loveday section thirty seven of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four section thirty seven selected poems by pierre jean de beranger pierre jean de beranger seventeen eighty to eighteen fifty seven by alcee fortier beranger like hugo has commemorated the date of his birth but their verses are very different hugo's poem is lofty in style beginning ce siècle avait deux ans rome remplacé sparte déjà napoléon percé sous bonaparte et du premier consul déjà par maint endroit le front de l'empereur brisait le masque étroit this century was two years old rome displaced sparta napoleon already was visible in bonaparte and the narrow mask of the first consul in many places was already pierced by the forehead of the emperor beranger's verses have less force but are charming in their simplicity dans ce paris plein d'or et de misère en l'an de christ mille sept cent quatre-vingt chez un tailleur mon pauvre et vieux grand-père moi nouveau-né sachez ce qui m'advint in this paris full of gold and misery in the year of christ one thousand seven hundred and eighty at the house of a tailor my grandfather poor and old 
i a newborn child knew what happened to me authors of the eighteenth and the nineteenth centuries are more subjective in their writings than those of the seventeenth whose characters can rarely be known from their works a glance at the life and surroundings of Béranger will show their influence on his genius. Béranger's mother was abandoned by her husband shortly after her marriage, and her child was born at the house of her father, the old tailor referred to in the song The Tailor and the Fairy. She troubled herself little about the boy, and he was forsaken in his childhood. Béranger tells us that he does not know how he learned to read. In the beginning of the year 1789 he was sent to a school in the Faubourg Saint Antoine, and there, mounted on the roof of a house, he saw the capture of the Bastille on the 14th of July. This event made a great impression on him, and may have laid the foundations of his republican principles. When he was nine and a half, his father sent him to one of his sisters, an innkeeper at Peronne that town in the north of france famous for the interview in fourteen sixty eight between louis the eleventh and charles the bold when the fox put himself in the power of the lion as related so vividly in quentin durward beranger's aunt was very kind to him at peron he went to a free primary school founded by balu de belanglise where the students governed themselves electing their mayor their judges and their justices of the peace Béranger was president of a republican club of boys and was called upon several times to address members of the convention who passed through peronne his aunt was an ardent republican and he was deeply moved by the invasion of france in seventeen ninety two he heard with delight of the capture of toulon in seventeen ninety three and of bonaparte's exploits conceiving a great admiration for the extraordinary man who was just beginning his military career at the age of fifteen beranger returned to paris where his father had established a kind of banking-house the boy had previously followed different trades and had been for two years with a publishing-house as a printer's apprentice there he learned spelling and the rules of french prosody he began to write verse when he was twelve or thirteen but he had a strange idea of prosody in order to get lines of the same length he wrote his words between two parallel lines traced from the top to the bottom of the page his system of versification seemed to be correct when applied to the alexandrine verse of racine but when he saw the fables of la fontaine in which the lines are very irregular he began to distrust his prosody Béranger became a skilful financier and was very useful to his father in his business when the banker failed the young man was thrown into great distress he now had ample opportunity to become familiar with the garret of which he has sung so well in eighteen o four he applied for help to lucien bonaparte and received from napoleon's brother his own fee as member of the institute he obtained shortly afterwards a position in a bureau of the university having a weak constitution and defective sight he avoided the conscription he was however all his life a true patriot with republican instincts and he says that he never liked voltaire because that celebrated writer unjustly preferred foreigners and vilified joan of arc the true patriotic divinity who from my childhood was the object of my worship he had approved of the eighteenth of brumaire for my soul says he has always vibrated with that of the people as when i was nineteen years old and the great majority of the french people in seventeen ninety nine wished to see bonaparte assume power and govern with a firm hand in eighteen thirteen beranger wrote the king of yvetot a pleasing and amusing satire on napoleon's reign what a contrast between the despotic emperor and ruthless warrior and the simple king whose crown is a nightcap and whose chief delight is his bottle of wine the song circulated widely in manuscript form and the author soon became popular he made the acquaintance of desaugiers and became a member of the caveau concerning this joyous literary society m anatole france says in his vie littéraire that the first caveau was founded in seventeen twenty nine by gallet piron prebillon fils collet and panin 
they used to meet at l'audel the tavern keepers the second caveau was inaugurated in seventeen fifty nine by marmontel Suard, lanou and brissy and lasted until the revolution in eighteen o six armand gouffet and capel established the modern caveau of which desaugiers was president the members met at balen's restaurant in eighteen thirty four the society was reorganized at champlanc's restaurant the members wrote and published songs and sang them after dinner the caveau says m france is the french academy of song and as such has some dignity the same is true of the lys while the chat noir is most fin de siècle to understand beranger's songs and to excuse them somewhat we must remember that the french always delighted in witty songs and tales and pardoned the immorality of the works on account of the wit and humour this is what is called l'esprit gaulois and is seen principally in old french poetry in the fabliaux the farces and le roman de renard moliere had much of this as also had la fontaine and voltaire and beranger's wildest songs appear mild and innocent when compared with those of the chat noir in his joyous songs he continues the traditions of the farces and fabliaux of the middle ages and in his political songs he uses wit and satire just as in the sottises of the time of louis the twelfth beranger's first volume of songs appeared at the beginning of the second restoration and although it was hostile to the bourbons the author was not prosecuted in eighteen twenty one when his second volume was published he resigned his position as clerk at the university and was brought to trial for having written immoral and seditious songs he was condemned after exciting scenes in court to three months imprisonment and a fine of five hundred francs and in eighteen twenty eight to nine months imprisonment and a fine of ten thousand francs which was paid by public subscription no doubt he contributed to the revolution of july eighteen thirty but although he was a republican he favored the monarchy of louis philippe saying that it was a plank to cross over the gutter a preparation for the republic the king wished to see him and thank him but beranger replied that he was too old to make new acquaintances he was invited to apply for a seat in the french academy and refused that honor as he had refused political honors and positions he said that he wished to be nothing and when in eighteen forty eight he was elected to the constitutional assembly he resigned his seat almost immediately he has been accused of affectation and of exaggeration in his disinterestedness but he was naturally timid in public and preferred to exert an influence over his countrymen by his songs rather than by his voice in public assemblies beranger was kind and generous and ever ready to help all who applied to him he had a pension given to rouget de lille the famous author of the marseillaise who was reduced to poverty and in eighteen thirty five he took into his house his good aunt from peyronne and gave hospitality also to his friend mademoiselle judith frere in eighteen thirty four he sold all his works to his publisher perrotin for an annuity of eight hundred francs which was increased to four thousand by the publisher on this small income beranger lived content till his death on july sixteenth eighteen fifty seven the government of napoleon the third took charge of his funeral which was solemnized with great pomp although beranger was essentially the poet of the middle classes and was extremely popular care was taken to exclude the people from the funeral procession while he never denied that he was the grandson of a tailor he signed de beranger to be distinguished from other writers of the same name the de however had always been claimed by his father who had left him nothing but that pretense of nobility for forty years from eighteen fifteen to his death beranger was perhaps the most popular french writer of his time and he was ranked among the greatest french poets there has been a reaction against that enthusiasm and he is now severely judged by the critics they say that he lacked inspiration and was vulgar bombastic and grandiloquent 
little attention is paid to him therefore in general histories of french literature but if he is not entitled to stand on the high pedestal given to him by his contemporaries we yet cannot deny genius to the man who for more than a generation swayed the hearts of the people at his will and exerted on his countrymen and on his epoch an immense influence many of his songs are coarse and even immoral but his muse was often inspired by patriotic subjects and in his poems on napoleon he sings of the exploits of the great general defending french soil from foreign invasion or he delights in the victories of the emperor as reflecting glory upon france victor hugo shared this feeling when he wrote his inspiring verses in praise of the conqueror both poets beranger and hugo contributed to create the napoleonic legend which facilitated the election of louis napoleon to the presidency in eighteen forty eight and brought about the second empire what is more touching than the reminiscences of the people are we not inclined to cry out like the little children listening to the old grandmother who speaks of napoleon he spoke to you grandmother he sat down there grandmother you have yet his glass grandmother the whole song is poetic natural and simple francois copet the great poet said of it ah if i had only written the reminiscences of the people i should not feel concerned about the judgment of posterity other works of beranger's are on serious subjects as mary stuart's farewell to france the holy alliance the swallows and the old banner all his songs have a charm his wit is not of the highest order and he lacks the finesse of la fontaine but he is often quaint and always amusing in his songs devoted to love and lisette to youth and to wine he is not one of the greatest french lyric poets and cannot be compared with lamartine hugo musset and vigny nevertheless he has much originality and is without doubt the greatest song-writer that france has produced he elevated the song and made it both a poem and a drama full of action and interest beranger wrote slowly and with great care and many of his songs cost him much labor he was filled with compassion for the weak for the poor and unfortunate he loved humanity and above all he dearly loved france posterity will do him justice and will preserve at least a great part of his work m rené lagouvé in his interesting work la lecture en action relates that one day while walking with beranger in the bois de boulogne the latter stopped in the middle of an alley and taking hold of m lagouvé's hand said with emotion my dear friend my ambition would be that one hundred of my lines should remain m lagouvé adds there will remain more than that and his words have been confirmed if we read aloud if we sing them we too shall share the enthusiasm of our fathers who were carried away by the pathos the grandeur the wit the inexpressible charm of the unrivalled chansonnier from the gypsies les bohemiens to see is to have come hurry anew life on the wing is a rapturous thing to see is to have come hurry anew for to see the world is to conquer it too so not do we own from pride left free from statutes vain from heavy chain so not do we own from pride left free cradle nor house nor coffin have we but credit our jollity none the less noble or priest or servant or master but credit our jollity none the less liberty always means happiness the gadfly la mouche in the midst of our laughter and singing mid the clink of our glasses so gay what gadfly is over us winging that returns when we drive him away tis some god yes i have a suspicion of our happiness jealous he's come let us drive him away to perdition that he bore us no more with his hum transformed to a gadfly unseemly i am certain that we must have here old reason 
the grumbler extremely annoyed by our joy and our cheer he tells us in tones of monition of the clouds and the tempests to come let us drive him away to perdition that he bore us no more with his hum it is reason who comes to me quaffing and says it is time to retire at your age one stops drinking and laughing stops loving nor sings with such fire an alarm that sounds ever its mission when the sweetest of flames overcome let us drive him away to perdition that he bore us no more with his hum it is reason look out there for lizzie his dart is a menace all way he has touched her she swoons she is dizzy come cupid and drive him away pursue him compel his submission until under your strokes he succumb let us drive him away to perdition that he bore us no more with his hum hurrah victory see he is drowning in the wine that lizetta has poured come the head of joy let us be crowning that again he may reign at our board he was threatened just now with dismission and a fly made us all rather glum but we've sent him away to perdition he will bore us no more with his hum translation of walter learned draw it mild les petits coups let's learn to temper our desires not harshly to constrain and since excess makes pleasure less why so much more refrain small table cosy corner here we well may be beguiled our worthy host old wine can boast drink drink but draw it mild he who would many an evil shun will find my plan the best to trim the sail as shifts the gale and half seas over rest enjoyment is an art disgust is bred of joy run wild too deep a drain upsets the brain drink drink but draw it mild our indigence let's cheer it up tis nonsense to repine to give to hope the fullest scope needs but one draught of wine and oh be temperate to enjoy ye on whom fate hath smiled if deep the bowl your thirst control drink drink but draw it mild what phyllis dost thou fear at this my lesson dost thou scoff or wouldst thou say light draughts betray the toper falling off keen taste eyes keen whate'er be seen of joy in thine fair child love's filter use but don't abuse drink drink but draw it mild yes without hurrying let us roam from feast to feast of gladness and reach old age if not quite sage with method in our madness our health is sound good wines abound friends these are riches piled to use with thrift the twofold gift drink drink but draw it mild translation of william young the king of yvetot there was a king of yvetot of whom renown hath little said who let all thoughts of glory go and dawdled half his days abed and every night as night came round by jenny with a nightcap crowned slept very sound sing ho 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 and he 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 that's the kind of king for me and every day it came to pass that four lusty meals made he and step by step upon an ass rode abroad his realms to see and wherever he did stir what think you was his escort sir why an old cur sing ho 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 and he 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 that's the kind of king for me if e'er he went into excess twas from a somewhat lively thirst but he who would his subjects bless odds fish must wet his whistle first and so from every cask they got our king did to himself a lot at least a pot sing ho 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 and he 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 that's the kind of king for me to all the ladies of the land a courteous king and kind was he the reason why you'll understand they named him potter patrie 
each year he called his fighting men and marched a league from home and then marched back again saying ho 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 and he 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 that's the kind of king for me neither by force nor false pretense he sought to make his kingdom great and made oh princes learn from hence live and let live his rule of state twas only when he came to die that his people who stood by were known to cry sing ho 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 and he 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 that's the kind of king for me the portrait of this best of kings is extant still upon a sign that on a village tavern swings famed in the country for good wine the people in their sunday trim filling their glasses to the brim look up to him singing ha 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 and he 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 that's the sort of king for me version of w m thackeray fortune rap rap is that my lass rap rap is rapping there it is fortune let her pass i'll not open the door to her rap rap all of my friends are making gay my little room with lips wine wet we only wait for you lisette fortune you may go your way rap rap if we might credit half her boast what wonders gold has in its gift well we have twenty bottles left and still some credit with our host rap rap her pearls and rubies too she quotes and mantles more than sumptuous lord but the purple's not to us we're just now taking off our coats rap rap she treats us as the rawest youths with talk of genius and of fame thank calumny alas for shame our faith is spoiled in laurel growths rap rap far from our pleasures we care not her highest heavens to attain she fills her big balloons in vain till we have swamped our little boat rap rap yet all our neighbors crowd to be within her ring of promises ah surely friends our mistresses will cheat us more agreeably rap rap the people's reminiscences les souvenirs du peuple ay many a day the straw-thatched cot shall echo with his glory the humblest shed these fifty years shall know no other story there shall the idle villagers to some old dame resort and beg her with those good old tales to make their evenings short what though they say he did us harm our love this cannot dim come granny talk of him to us come granny talk of him well children with a train of kings once he passed by this spot twas long ago i had but just begun to boil the pot on foot he climbed the hill whereon i watched him on his way he wore a small three-cornered hat his overcoat was gray i was half frightened till he said good day my dear to me oh granny granny did he speak what granny you and he next year as i poor soul by chance through paris strolled one day i saw him taking with his court to notre dame his way the crowd were charmed with such a show their hearts were filled with pride what splendid weather for the fete heaven favors him they cried softly he smiled for god had given to his fond arms a boy oh how much joy you must have felt oh granny how much joy but when at length our poor champagne by foes was overrun he seemed alone to hold his ground nor dangers would he shun one night as might be now i heard a knock the door unbarred and saw good god twas he himself with but a scanty guard oh what a war is this he cried taking this very chair what granny granny there he sat what granny he sat there i'm hungry said he quick i served thin wine and hard brown bread he dried his clothes and by the fire in sleep dropped down his head waking he saw my tears cheer up good dame says he i go neath paris walls to strike for france one last avenging blow he went but on the cup he used such value did i set it has been treasured what till now you have it granny yet 
here it is but twas the hero's fate to ruin to be led he whom a pope had crowned alas in a lone isle lies dead twas long denied no no said they soon shall he reappear or ocean comes he and the foe shall find his master here ah what a bitter pang i felt when forced to own twas true poor granny heaven for this will look will kindly look on you translation of william young the old tramp le vieux vagabond here in this gutter let me die weary and sick and old i've done he's drunk will say the passers-by all right i want no pity none i see the heads that turn away while others glance and toss me sue off to your junket go i say old tramp to die i need no help from you yes of old age i'm dying now of hunger people never die i hoped some almshouse might allow a shelter when my end was nigh but all retreats are overflowed such crowds are suffering and forlorn my nurse alas has been the road old tramp here let me die where i was born when young it used to be my prayer to craftsmen let me learn your trade clear out we've got no work to spare go beg was all reply they made you rich who bid me work i fed with relish on the bones you threw made of your straw an easy bed old tramp i have no curse to vent on you poor wretch i had the choice to steal but no i'd rather beg my bread at most i thieved a wayside meal of apples ripening overhead yet twenty times have i been thrown in prison twas the king's decree robbed of the only thing i own old tramp at least the sun belongs to me the poor man is a country his what are to me your corn and wine your glory and your industries your orators they are not mine and when the foreign foe waxed fat within your undefended walls i shed my tears poor fool at that old tramp his hand was open to my calls why like the hateful bug you kill did you not crush me when you could or better teach me ways and skill to labor for the common good the ugly grub an ant may end if sheltered from the cold and fed you might have had me for a friend old tramp i die your enemy instead translated for the world's best literature fifty years cinquante ans wherefore these flowers floral applause ah no these blossoms came to say that i am growing old because i number fifty years to-day o oh, rapid ever fleeting day o oh, moments lost i know not how o oh, wrinkled cheek and hair grown gray alas for i am fifty now sad age when we pursue no more fruit dies upon the withering tree hark some one rapped upon my door nay open not tis not for me or else the doctor calls not yet must i expect his studious bow once i'd have called come in lisette alas for i am fifty now in age what aches and pains abound the torturing gout racks us a while blindness a prison dark profound or deafness that provokes a smile then reason's lamp grows faint and dim with flickering ray children allow old age the honor due to him alas for i am fifty now ah heaven the voice of death i know who rubs his hands in joyous mood the sexton knocks and i must go farewell my friends the human brood below are famine plague and strife above new heavens my soul endow since god remains begin new life alas for i am fifty now but no tis you sweetheart whose youth tempting my soul with dainty ways shall hide from it the sombre truth this incubus of evil days 
springtime is yours and flowers come then scatter your roses on my brow and let me dream of youth again alas for i am fifty now translation of walter learned the garret with pensive eyes the little room i view where in my youth i weathered it so long with a wild mistress a staunch friend or two and a light heart still breaking into song making a mock of life and all its cares rich in the glory of my rising sun lightly i vaulted up four pair of stairs in the brave days when i was twenty-one yes tis a garret let him know it who will there was my bed full hard it was and small my table there and i decipher still half a lame couplet charcoal on the wall ye joys that time hath swept with him away come to mine eyes ye dreams of love and fun for you i pawned my watch how many a day in the brave days when i was twenty-one and see my little jessie first of all she comes with pouting lips and sparkling eyes behold how roguishly she pins her shawl across the narrow casement curtain-wise now by the bed her petticoat glides down and when did women look the worse in none i have heard since who paid for many a gown in the brave days when i was twenty-one one jolly evening when my friends and i made happy music with our songs and cheers a shout of triumph mounted up thus high and distant cannon opened on our ears we rise we join in the triumphant strain napoleon conquers austerlitz is won tyrants shall never tread us down again in the brave days when i was twenty-one let us be gone the place is sad and strange how far far off these happy times appear all that i have to live i'd gladly change for one such month as i have wasted here to draw long dreams of beauty love and power from founts of hope that never will outrun and drink all life's quintessence in an hour give me the days when i was twenty-one version of w m thackeray my tomb montembeau what whilst i'm well beforehand you design at vast expense for me to build a shrine friends tis absurd to no such outlay go leave to the great the pomp and pride of woe take what for marble or for brass would pay for a dead beggar garb by far too gay and buy life-stirring wine on my behalf the money for my tomb right gaily let us quaff a mausoleum worthy of my thanks at least would cost you twenty thousand francs come for six months rich vale and balmy sky as gay recluses be it ours to try concerts and balls where beauty's self invites shall furnish us our castle of delights i'll run the risk of finding life too sweet the money for my tomb right gaily let us eat but old i grow and lizzie's youthful yet costly attire then she expects to get for too long fast a show of wealth resigns bear witness longchamp where all paris shines you to my fair one something surely owe a cashmere shawl she's looking for i know twere well for life on such a faithful breast the money for my tomb right gaily to invest no box of state good friends would i engage for mine own use where spectres tread the stage what poor one man with haggard eyes is this soon must he die ah let him taste of bliss the veteran first should the raised curtain see there in the pit to keep a place for me tired of his wallet long he cannot live the money for my tomb to him let's gaily give what doth it boot me that some learned eye may spell my name on gravestone by and by as to the flowers they promise for my beer i'd rather living scent their perfume here and thou posterity that ne'er mayest be 
waste not thy torch in seeking signs of me like a wise man i deemed that i was bound the money for my tomb to scatter gaily round translation of william young from his preface to his collected poems i have treated it the revolution of eighteen thirty as a power which might have whims one should be in a position to resist all or nearly all my friends have taken office i have still one or two who are hanging from the greased pole i am pleased to believe that they are caught by the coat-tails in spite of their efforts to come down i might therefore have had a share in the distribution of offices unluckily i have no love for sinecures and all compulsory labor has grown intolerable to me except perhaps that of a copying clerk slanderers have pretended that i acted from virtue pshaw i acted from laziness that defect has served me in place of merits wherefore i recommend it to many of our honest men it exposes one however to curious reproaches it is to that placid indolence that severe critics have laid the distance i have kept myself from those of my honourable friends who have attained power giving too much honour to what they choose to call my fine intellect and forgetting too much how far it is from simple good sense to the science of great affairs these critics maintain that my counsels might have enlightened more than one minister if one believes them i crouching behind our statesmen's velvet chairs would have conjured down the winds dispelled the storms and enabled france to swim in an ocean of delights we should all have had liberty to sell or rather to give away but we are still rather ignorant of the price ah my two or three friends who take a song-writer for a magician have you never heard then that power is a bell which prevents those who set it ringing from hearing anything else doubtless ministers sometimes consult those at hand consultation is a means of talking about oneself which is rarely neglected but it will not be enough even to consult in good faith those who will advise in the same way one must still act that is the duty of the position the purest intentions the most enlightened patriotism do not always confer it who has not seen high officials leave a counsellor with brave intentions and an instant after return to him from i know not what fascination with a perplexity that gave the lie to the wisest resolutions oh they say we will not be caught there again what drudgery the more shamefaced add i'd like to see you in my place when a minister says that be sure he has no longer a head there is indeed one of them but only one who without having lost his head has often used this phrase with the utmost sincerity he has therefore never used it to a friend end of section thirty seven Section 38 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. Section 38. Selected Excerpts by George Barclay George Barclay, 1685-1753 Few readers in the United States are unfamiliar with the lines, Westward the course of empire takes its way. It is vaguely remembered that a certain Bishop Barclay was the author of a treatise on tar water. There is, moreover, a general impression that this Bishop Barclay contended for the unreality of all things outside of his own mind, and now and then some recall Byron's lines. When Bishop Barclay said there was no matter, and proved it, t'was no matter what he said. This is the substance of the popular knowledge of one of the profoundest thinkers of the early part of the eighteenth century, the time of Shaftesbury and Locke, 
of Addison and Steele, of Butler, Pope, and Swift. One of the most fascinating men of his day, and one of the best of any age. Beside, or rather above, Byron's line, should be placed Pope's tribute. To Barclay, every virtue under heaven. Barclay was born in Ireland, probably at Dysart Castle in the Valley of Noor, near Kilkenny, March 12, 1685. The family, having but lately come into Ireland, Barclay always accounted himself an Englishman. At Kilkenny School, he met the poet Pryor, who became his intimate friend, his business representative, and his most regular correspondent for life. Swift preceded him at this school and at Trinity College, Dublin, whither Berkeley went March 21, 1700, being then fifteen years of age. Here, as at Kilkenny, he took rank much beyond his years, and was soon deep in philosophical speculations. In Professor Fraser's edition of The Life and Works of Barclay appears a commonplace book, kept during the Trinity College terms, and full of the most remarkable memoranda for a youth of his years. In 1709, while still at Trinity, he published an essay toward a new theory of vision, which foreshadowed imperfectly his leading ideas. In the following year, he published a treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge, Two or three years later, he went to London, where he was received with unusual favor, and quickly became intimate in the literary circles of the day. He made friends everywhere, being attractive in all ways, young, handsome, graceful, fascinating in discourse, enthusiastic, and full of thought. Swift was especially impressed by him, and did much to further his fortunes. His philosophical conceptions he at this time popularized in Three Dialogues Between Hylas and Philonius, a work rated by some critics as at the head of its class. Before going to London, Barclay had been made a Fellow of Trinity, and had been appointed to various college offices, and had taken orders. He remained away from Dublin for about eight years, on leave frequently extended, writing in London, and traveling, teaching, and writing on the continent. On his return from his foreign travels in 1720 or 1721, he found society completely demoralized by the collapse of the South Sea bubble. He was much depressed by the conditions around him, and sought to awaken the moral sense of the people by an essay toward preventing the ruin of Great Britain. Returning to Dublin and resuming his college duties, he was shortly made Dean of Dromore, and then Dean of Derry. Hardly had he received these dignified appointments, when he began planning to rid himself of them, being completely absorbed in a scheme for a university in the Bermudas, which should educate scholars, teachers, and ministers for the new world, to which his hope turned. To this scheme he devoted himself for many years. A singular occurrence, which released him from pecuniary cares, enabled him to give his time as well as his heart to the work. Miss Van Homerick, the Vanessa of Swift, upon her mother's death, left London and went to live in Ireland, to be near her beloved Dean, and there she was informed of Swift's marriage to Stella. The news killed her, but she revoked the will by which her fortune was bequeathed to Swift, and left one half of it, or about four thousand pounds, to Barclay, whom she had met but once. He must have kept an atmosphere, as Badgett says of Francis Horner. Going to London on fire with his great scheme, prepared to resign his deanery and cast his lot with that of the proposed university, Barclay wasted years in the effort to secure a charter and grant from the administration. His enthusiasm and his fascinating manners affected much, and over and over again only the simplest formalities seemed necessary to success. Only the will of Sir Robert Walpole stood in the way, but Walpole's will sufficed. At last, in September 1728, tired of waiting at court, Barclay, who had just married, sailed with three or four friends, including the artist Smybert, for Rhode Island, intending to await the completion of his grant, and then proceed to Bermuda. He bought a farm near Newport, and built a house which he called Whitehall, in which he lived for about three years, leaving a tradition of benignant but retired and scholastic life. Among the friends who were here drawn to him was the Reverend Samuel Johnson of Stratford, afterward the first president of King's, now Columbia, College, with whom he corresponded during the remainder of his life, and through whom he was able to aid greatly the cause of education in America. 
the Newport life was idyllic. Barclay wrote home that the winters were cooler than those of the south of Ireland, but not worse than he had known in Italy. He brought over a good library, and read and wrote. The principal work of this period, written in a romantic cleft in the rocks, was Alciphron, or the Minute Philosopher, in seven dialogues directed especially against atheism. At length, through Lord Percival, Barclay learned that Walpole would not allow the parliamentary grant of £20,000 for the Bermuda College, and returned to England at the close of 1732. His Whitehall estate he conveyed to Yale College for the maintenance of certain scholarships. From England he sent over nearly a thousand volumes for the Yale Library, the best collection of books ever brought at one time to America, being helped in the undertaking by some of the Bermuda subscribers. A little later he sent a collection of books to Harvard College also, and presented a valuable organ to Trinity Church at Newport. Shortly after his return, Barclay was appointed Bishop of Cloyne, near Cork, in Ireland, and here he remained for about eighteen years. Although a recluse, he wrote much, and he kept up his loving relations with old friends who still survived. He had several children to educate, and he cultivated music and painting. He attempted to establish manufactures, and to cultivate habits of industry and refinement among the people. The winter of 1739 was bitterly cold. This was followed by general want, famine, and disease. Barclay and his family lived simply, and gave away what they could save. Large numbers of people died from an epidemic. In America, Barclay's attention had been drawn to the medicinal virtues of tar, and he experimented successfully with tar water as a remedy. Becoming more and more convinced of its value, he exploited his supposed discovery with his usual ardor, writing letters and essays, and at length, a chain of philosophical reflections and enquiries concerning the virtues of tar water and divers other subjects connected together and arising one from another. This was called Cirrus in a second edition, which was soon demanded. Beginning with the use of tar water as a remedy, the treatise gradually developed into the treatment of the largest themes and offered the ripest fruits of the bishop's philosophy. Barclay's system was neither consistent nor complete but much of it remains sound. In brief, he contended that matter has no independent existence, but is an idea in the supreme mind, which is realized in various forms by the human mind. Without mind nothing exists. Cause cannot exist except as it rests in mind and will. All so-called physical causes are merely cases of constant sequences of phenomena. Far from denying the reality of phenomena, Barclay insists on it, but contends that reality depends upon the supremacy of mind. Abstract matter does not and cannot exist. The mind can only perceive qualities of objects, and infers the existence of the objects from them. Or, as a modern writer tersely puts it, the only thing certain is mind. Matter is a doubtful and uncertain inference of the human intellect. The essay upon tar water attracted great attention. The good bishop wrote much, also for periodicals, mainly upon practical themes, and in the queerest and intermittent journal considered many matters of ethical and political importance to the country. Though a bishop of the established church, he lived upon the most friendly terms with his Roman Catholic neighbors, and his labors were highly appreciated by them. But his life was waning. His friends had passed away. He had lost several children. His health was broken. He desired to retire to Oxford, and spend the remainder of his life in scholarly seclusion. He asked to exchange his bishopric for a canonry, but this could not be permitted. He then begged to be allowed to resign his charge, but the king replied that he might live where he pleased, but that he could die a bishop in spite of himself. In August 1752, Bishop Barclay removed himself, his wife, his daughter, and his goods to Oxford, where his son George was a student and there, on the 14th of the following January, as he was resting on his couch by the fireside at tea-time, his busy brain stopped thinking, and his kind heart ceased to beat. On the Prospect of Planting Arts and Learning in America The muse, disgusted at an age and clime, barren of every glorious theme, in distant lands now waits a better time producing subjects worthy fame. 
in happy climes where from the genial sun and virgin earth such scenes ensue the force of art by nature seems outdone and fancied beauties by the true in happy climes the seat of innocence where nature guides and virtue rules where men shall not impose for truth and sense the pedantry of courts and schools there shall be sung another golden age the rise of empire and of arts the good and great inspiring epic rage the wisest heads and noblest hearts not such as europe breeds in her decay such as she bred when fresh and young when heavenly flame did animate her clay by future poets shall be sung westward the course of empire takes its way the four first acts already passed a fifth shall close the drama with the day time's noblest offspring is the last essay on tar water from cirrus the seeds of things seem to lie latent in the air ready to appear and produce their kind whenever they light on a proper matrix the extremely small seeds of fern mosses mushrooms and some other plants are concealed and wafted about in the air every part whereof seems replete with seed of one kind or another the whole atmosphere seems alive there is everywhere acid to corrode and seed to engender iron will rust and mold will grow in all places virgin earth becomes fertile crops of new plants ever and anon show themselves all which demonstrate the air to be a common seminary and receptacle of all vivifying principles the eye by long use comes to see even in the darkest cavern and there is no subject so obscure but we may discern some glimpse of truth by long poring on it truth is the cry of all but the game of a few certainly where it is the chief passion it doth not give way to vulgar cares and views nor is it contented with a little ardor in the early time of life active perhaps to pursue but not so fit to weigh and revise he that would make a real progress in knowledge must dedicate his age as well as his youth the later growth as well as first fruits at the altar of truth as the nerves are instruments of sensation it follows that spasms in the nerves may produce all symptoms and therefore a disorder in the nervous system shall imitate all distempers and occasion in appearance an asthma for instance a pleurisy or a fit of the stone now whatever is good for the nerves in general is good against all such symptoms but tar water as it includes in an eminent degree the virtues of warm gums and resins is of great use for comforting and strengthening the nerves curing twitches in the nervous fibres cramps also and numbness in the limbs removing anxieties and promoting sleep in all which cases i have known it very successful this safe and cheap medicine suits all circumstances and all constitutions operating easily curing without disturbing raising the spirits without depressing them a circumstance that deserves repeated attention especially in these climates where strong liquors so fatally and so frequently produce those very distresses they are designed to remedy and if i am not misinformed even among the ladies themselves who are truly much to be pitied their condition of life makes them prey to imaginary woes which never fail to grow up in minds unexercised and unemployed to get rid of these it is said there are who betake themselves to distilled spirits and it is not improbable they are led gradually to the use of those poisons by a certain complacent pharmacy too much used in the modern practice palsy drops poppy cordial plague water and such like which being in truth nothing but drams disguised yet coming from the apothecaries are considered only as medicines the soul of man was supposed by many ancient sages to be thrust into the human body as into a prison for punishment of past offences but the worst prison is the body of an indolent epicure whose blood is inflamed by fermented liquors and high sauces or rendered putrid sharp and corrosive by a stagnation of the animal juices through sloth and indolence whose membranes are irritated by pungent salts whose mind is agitated by painful oscillations of the nervous system and whose nerves are mutually affected by the irregular passions of the mind this ferment in the animal economy darkens and confounds the intellect 
it produceth vain terrors and vain conceits, and stimulates the soul with mad desires, which, not being natural, nothing in nature can satisfy. No wonder, therefore, there are so many fine persons of both sexes, shining themselves, and shown on by fortune, who are inwardly miserable and sick of life. The hardness of stubbed, vulgar constitutions renders them insensible of a thousand things that fret and gall those delicate people, who, as if their skin was peeled off, feel to the quick everything that touches them. The remedy for this exquisite and painful sensibility is commonly sought from fermented, perhaps from distilled liquors, which render many lives wretched that would otherwise have been only ridiculous. The tender nerves and low spirits of such poor creatures would be much relieved by the use of tar-water, which might prolong and cheer their lives. I do therefore recommend to them the use of a cordial, not only safe and innocent, but giving health and spirit as sure as other cordials destroy them. I do verily think there is not any other medicine whatsoever so effectual to restore a crazy constitution and cheer a dreary mind or so likely to subvert that gloomy empire of the spleen, which tyrannizeth over the better sort, as they are called, of these free nations, and maketh them, in spite of their liberty and property, more wretched slaves than even the subjects of absolute power, who breathe clear air in a sunny climate, while men of low degree often enjoy a tranquillity and content that no advantage of birth or fortune can equal. Such indeed was the case while the rich alone could afford to be debauched, but when even beggars become debauchees, the case was altered. The public virtue and spirit of the British legislature never showed itself more conspicuous in any act than in that for suppressing the immoderate use of distilled spirits among the people, whose strength and numbers constitute the true wealth of a nation. Though evasive arts will, it is feared prevail so long as distilled spirits of any kind are allowed, the character of Englishmen in general being that of Brutus, quick quid vult valde vult, whatever he desires, he desires intensely. But why should such a canker be tolerated in the vitals of a state under any pretense, or in any shape whatsoever? Better by far the whole present set of distillers were pensioners of the public, and their trade abolished by law since all the benefit thereof put together would not balance the hundredth part of its mischief. This tar-water will also give charitable relief to the ladies, who often want it more than the parish poor, being many of them never able to make a good meal, and sitting pale and puny, and forbidden like ghosts at their own table, victims of vapours and indigestion. Studious persons also, pent up in narrow holes, breathing bad air and stooping over their books, are much to be pitied, as they are debarred the free use of air and exercise. This I will venture to recommend as the best succedaneum to both, though it were to be wished that modern scholars would, like the ancients, meditate and converse more in walks and gardens and open air, which upon the whole would perhaps be no hindrance to their learning, and a great advantage to their health. My own sedentary course of life had long since thrown me into an ill habit, attended with many ailments, particularly a nervous colic, which rendered my life a burden, and the more so because my pains were exasperated by exercise. But since the use of tar-water, I find, though not a perfect recovery from my old and rooted illness, yet such a gradual return of health and ease, that I esteem my having taken this medicine the greatest of all temporal blessings, and am convinced that under providence I owe my life to it. End of section 38. Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham, Connecticut. Section 39 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording by Andrew Dunscombe. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hector Berlioz, 1803-1869 To the concert-goer the name Hector Berlioz calls up a series of vast and magnificent whirlwinds of vocal and orchestral sonority. 
the thoughts of scores that sound and look imposingly complex to the eyes and ears of both the educated and uneducated in the composer's art. We have a vision of close pages embodying the most unequivocal and drastic of musical realism. The full audacity and mastery of a certain sort of genius are represented in his vast works. They bespeak, too, the combative musician and reformer. Berlioz took the kingdom of music by violence. His chef d'oeuvre do not all say to us as much as he meant them to say, not as much as they all uttered twenty years ago. There is much clay as well as gold in them, but such tremendous products of his energy and intellect as the Requiem, the Te Deum, the Damnation of Faust, his best descriptive symphonies, such as the Romeo and Juliet, are yet eloquent to the public and to the critical-minded. His best was so very good that his worst, weighed as a matter of principle or execution, regarded as music or program music, can be excused. Berlioz's actual biography is a long tale of storm and stress. Not only was he slow in gaining appreciation while he lived, full comprehension of his power was not granted him till after his energetic life was over. Recognition in his own country is incomplete today. He was born in 1803, near picturesque Grenoble, in the little town of Cotte saint andre the son of an excellent country doctor. Sent to Paris to study medicine, he became a musician against his father's wish, and in lieu of the allowance that his father promptly withdrew, the young man lived by engaging in the chorus of the gymnase and by catching at every straw for subsistence. He became a regular music student of the conservatory under the admirable Le Sœur und Reicher, quitted the conservatory in disgust at its pedantry in 1825 and lived and advanced in musical study as best he could for a considerable time. His convictions in art were founded largely on the rock of Gluck, Mozart, Beethoven and Weber. And however modern and however widely his work departs from such academic models, Berlioz never forswore a certain allegiance to these great and serene masters. He returned to the conservatory, studied hard, gained the Prix de Rome, gradually took a prominent place among Parisian composers and was as enthusiastically the subject of a cult as was Wagner. His concerts and the production of his operas encountered shameful cabals. His strongest works were neglected or ill-served. To their honour, German musicians understood him, Schumann and Liszt in especial. Only in Germany today are his colossal operas heard. The Italian Paganini showed a generous interest in his struggles. Russia and Austria too admired him, while his compatriots hissed. His career was one of endless work, disappointments, brief successes, battles, hopes and despairs. Personally, too, it was full of the happiness and unhappiness of the artistic temperament. It was between the two periods of his conservatory life that he endured his chief sentimental misfortune, his falling in love and finally marrying Henrietta Smithson. Miss Smithson was a young English actress playing Shakespearean roles in France with a passing success. She was exquisitely lovely. Delaroche has painted her spiritual beauty in his Ophelia. The marriage was a typically unfortunate artist match, and she became a paralytic invalid for years. After her death, Tours in Germany and elsewhere, new works, new troubles, enthusiasms and disappointments filled up the remainder of the composer's days. He returned to his beloved Dauphiné, war-worn and almost as one who has outlived life. In his provincial retreat, he composed the huge operatic duology The Trojans at Carthage and The Taking of Troy, turning once more to Virgil, his early literary love. Neither of them is often heard now, any more than his amazing Benvenuto Cellini. 
There also died in Dauphiné in 1869, weary, disenchanted, but conscious that he would be greater in the eyes of a coming generation than ever he had been during his harassed life. Berlioz's literary remains are valuable as criticisms, and their personal matter is of brisk and varied charm. His intense feeling for Shakespeare influenced his whole aesthetic life. He was extremely well read. His most unchecked tendency to romanticism was balanced by a fine feeling for the classics. He loved the greater Greek and Latin writers. His autobiography is a perfect picture of himself emotionally and exhibits his wide aesthetic nature. His letters are equally faithful as portraiture. He possessed a distinctively literary style. He tells us how he fell in love twice, thrice, records the disgraceful cabals and intrigues against his professional success and explains how a landscape affected his nerves. He is excellent reading, apparently without taking much pains to be so. Vivacity, wit, sincerity are salient traits. In his volume of musical essays entitled A Travers Chant, an untranslatable title which may be paraphrased Memoirs of Music and Musicians, are superior appreciations of musicians and interpreters and performances in opera house and concert hall expressed with grace and taste in the feuilletonist's best manner. In the Journal des Débats, year by year, he wrote himself down indisputably among the great French critics, and he never misused his critical post to make it a lever for his own advantage. His great treatise on orchestration is a standard work not displaced by Javert or more recent authorities. He was not only a musical intelligence of enormous capacity, he offers perhaps as typical an embodiment of the French artistic temperament as can be pointed out. The Italian Race as Musicians and Auditors from Berlioz's Autobiography it appears, however, so at least I am assured, that the Italians do occasionally listen. But at any rate, music to the Milanese, no less than to the Neapolitans, Romans, Florentines and Genoese, means nothing but an air, a duet or a trio well sung. For anything beyond this, they feel simply aversion or indifference. Perhaps these antipathies are mainly due to the wretched performance of their choruses and orchestras, which effectually prevents their knowing anything good outside the beaten track they have so long followed. Possibly, too, they may to a certain extent understand the flights of men of genius, if these latter are careful not to give too rude a shock to their rooted predilections. The great success of William Tell at Florence supports this opinion, and even Spontini's sublime Vestale obtained a series of brilliant representations at Naples some 25 years ago. Moreover, in those towns which are under the Austrian rule, you will see the people rush after a military band and listen with avidity to the beautiful German melodies, so unlike their usual insipid cavatinas. Nevertheless, in general, it is impossible to disguise the fact that the Italians as a nation really appreciate only the material effects of music and distinguish nothing but its exterior forms. Indeed, I am much inclined to regard them as more inaccessible to the poetical side of art and to any conceptions at all above the common than any other European nation. To the Italians, music is a sensual pleasure and nothing more. For this most beautiful form of expression, they have scarcely more respect than for the culinary art. In fact, they like music which they can take in at first hearing, without reflection or attention, just as they would do with a plate of macaroni. Now, we French, mean and contemptible musicians as we are, although we are no better than the Italians when we furiously applaud a trill or a chromatic scale by the last new singer and miss altogether the beauty of some grand recitative or animated chorus, yet at least we can listen, 
and if we do not take in a composer's ideas, it is not our fault. Beyond the Alps, on the contrary, people behave in a manner so humiliatingly both to art and to artists whenever any representation is going on that I confess I would as soon sell pepper and spice at a grocer's in the Rue Saint-Denis as write an opera for the Italians. Nay, I would sooner do it. Added to this, they are slaves to routine and to fanaticism to a degree one hardly sees nowadays, even at the Academy. The slightest unforeseen innovation, whether in melody, harmony, rhythm or instrumentation, puts them into a perfect fury, so much so that the dilettanti of Rome on the appearance of Rossini's Barbiere di Sevilla, which is Italian enough in all conscience, were ready to kill the young maestro for having the insolence to do anything unlike Paisiello. But what renders all hope of improvement quite chimerical and tempts one to believe that the musical feeling of the Italians is a mere necessary result of their organisation, the opinion both of Gall and Spurzheim, is their love for all that is dancing, brilliant, glittering and gay, to the utter neglect of the various passions by which the characters are animated, and the confusion of time and place, in a word, of good sense itself. Their music is always laughing, and if by chance the composer in the course of the drama permits himself for one moment not to be absurd, he at once hastens back to his prescribed style, his melodious roulades and gruppetti, his trills and contemptible frivolities, either for voice or orchestra, and these, succeeding so abruptly to something true to life, have an unreal effect and give the opera seria all the appearance of a parody or caricature. I could quote plenty of examples from famous works, but speaking generally of these artistic questions, it is not from Italy that we get these stereotyped conventional forms adopted by so many French composers, resisted by Cherubim and Spontini alone among the Italians, though rejected entirely by the Germans. What well-organised person with any sense of musical expression could listen to a quartet in which four characters, animated by totally conflicting passions, should successively employ the same melodious phrase to express such different words as these O oh, toi que j'adore, quelle terreur me glace, mon cœur bat de plaisir, la fureur me transporte. To suppose that music is a language so vague that the natural inflections of fury will serve equally well for fear, joy and love only proves the absence of that sense which to others makes the varieties of expression in music as incontestable a reality as the existence of the sun. I regard the course taken by Italian composers as the inevitable result of the instincts of the public which react more or less on the composers themselves. The famous snuff-box treachery from the autobiography. Now for another intrigue, still more cleverly contrived, the black depths of which I hardly dare fathom. I incriminate no one. I simply give the naked facts, without the smallest commentary, but with scrupulous exactness. General Bernard, having himself informed me that my requiem was to be performed on certain conditions, I was about to begin my rehearsals when I was sent for by the director of the Beaux-Arts. You know, said he, that Habeneck has been commissioned to conduct all the great official music festivals. Come, good, thought I, here is another tile for my devoted head. It is true that you are now in the habit of conducting the performance of your works yourself, but Habeneck is an old man, another tile, and I happen to know that he will be deeply hurt if he does not preside at your requiem. What terms are you on with him? What terms? We have quarrelled. I hardly know why. For three years he has not spoken to me. I am not aware of his motives, and indeed have not cared to ask. He began by rudely refusing to conduct one of my concerts. His behaviour towards me has been as inexplicable as it is uncivil. However, as I see plainly that he wishes on the present occasion to figure at Marshal d'Ambremont's ceremony, 
and as it would evidently be agreeable to you, I consent to give up the baton to him, on condition that I have at least one full rehearsal. Agreed, replied the director. I will let him know about it. The rehearsals were accordingly conducted with great care. Habeneck spoke to me as if our relations with each other had never been interrupted and all seemed likely to go well. The day of the performance arrived in the church of the Invalides. Before all the princes, peers and deputies, the French press, the correspondence of foreign papers and an immense crowd. It was absolutely essential for me to have a great success. A moderate one would have been fatal and a failure would have annihilated me altogether. Now listen attentively. The various groups of instruments in the orchestra were tolerably widely separated especially the four brass bands introduced in the tuba mirum, each of which occupied a corner of the entire orchestra. There is no pause between the dies irae and the tuba mirum, but the pace of the latter movement is reduced to half what it was before. At this point the whole of the brass enters, first all together and then in passages answering and interrupting, each a third higher than the last. It is obvious that it is of the greatest importance that the four beats of the new tempo should be distinctly marked, or else the terrible explosion which I had so carefully prepared with combinations and proportions never attempted before or since, and which, rightly performed, gives such a picture of the last judgment as I believe is destined to live, would be a mere enormous and hideous confusion. With my habitual mistrust, I had stationed myself behind Habeneck, and turning my back on him, overlooked the group of kettle drums which he could not see, when the moment approached for them to take part in the general melee. There are perhaps one thousand bars in my requiem, precisely in that of which I have just been speaking, when the movement is retarded and the wind instruments burst in with their terrible flourish of trumpets. In fact, just in the one bar where the conductor's motion is absolutely indispensable, Habeneck puts down his baton, quietly takes out his snuff box, and proceeds to take a pinch of snuff. I always had my eye in his direction, and instantly turned rapidly on one heel, and springing forward before him, I stretched out my arm and marked the four great beats of the new movement. The orchestras followed me, each in order. I conducted the piece to the end, and the effect which I had longed for was produced. When at the last words of the chorus Habeneck saw that the tuba mirum was saved, he said, What a cold perspiration I have been in. Without you we should have been lost. Yes, I know, I answered, looking fixedly at him. I did not add another word. Had he done it on purpose? Could it be possible that this man had dared to join my enemy, the director, and Cherubini's friends in plotting and attempting such rascality? I don't wish to believe it, but I cannot doubt it. God forgive me if I am doing the man injustice. On Gluck, from the Autobiography Of all the ancient composers, Gluck has, I believe, the least to fear from the incessant revolutions of art. He sacrificed nothing, either to the caprices of singers, the exigencies of fashion, or the inveterate routine with which he had to contend on his arrival in France after his protracted struggles with the Italian theatres. Doubtless his conflicts at Naples, Milan and Parma, instead of weakening him, had increased his strength by revealing its full extent to himself. For in spite of the fanaticism then prevalent in our artistic customs, he broke these miserable trammels and trod them underfoot with the greatest ease. True, the clamour of the critics once succeeded in forcing him into a reply, but it was the only indiscretion with which he had to reproach himself, and thenceforth, as before, he went straight to his aim in silence. We all know what that aim was. We also know that it was never given to any man to succeed more fully. With less conviction or less firmness, it is probable that 
notwithstanding his natural genius, his degenerate works would not have long survived those of his mediocre rivals now completely forgotten. But truth of expression, purity of style, and grandeur of form belong to all time. Gluck's fine passages will always be fine. Victor Hugo is right. The heart never grows old. On Bach, from the autobiography. You will not, my dear Demarest, expect an analysis from me of Bach's great work. Such a task would quite exceed my prescribed limits. Indeed, the movement performed at the Conservatoire three years ago may be considered the type of the author's style throughout the work. The Germans profess an unlimited admiration for Bach's recitatives, but their peculiar characteristic necessarily escaped me as I did not understand the language and was unable to appreciate their expression. Whoever is familiar with our musical customs in Paris must witness in order to believe the attention, respect and even reverence with which a German public listens to such a composition. Everyone follows the words on the book with his eyes, not a movement among the audience, not a murmur of praise or blame, not a sound of applause. They are listening to a solemn discourse. They are hearing the gospel sung. They are attending divine service rather than a concert. And really such music ought to be thus listened to. They adore Bach and believe in him without supposing for a moment that his divinity could ever be called into question. A heretic would horrify them. He is forbidden even to speak of him. God is God and Bach is Bach. Some days after the performance of Bach's chef d'oeuvre, the Singing Academy announced Grounds taught Jesu. This is another sacred work, a holy book, the worshippers of which are, however, mainly to be found in Berlin, whereas the religion of Bach is professed throughout the north of Germany. Music as an Aristocratic Art, from the Autobiography. Dramatic art in the time of Shakespeare was more appreciated by the masses than it is in our day by those nations which lay most claim to possess a feeling for it. Music is essentially aristocratic. It is a daughter of noble race, such as princes only can dower nowadays. It must be able to live poor and unmated rather than form a mesalliance. The beginning of a grand passion from the autobiography. I have now come to the grand drama of my life, but I shall not relate all its painful details. It is enough to say that an English company came over to perform Shakespeare's plays, then entirely unknown in France at the Odeon. I was present at the first performance of Hamlet, and there, in the part of Ophelia, I saw Miss Smithson, whom I married five years afterward. I can only compare the effect produced by her wonderful talent, or rather her dramatic genius, on my imagination and heart, with the convulsion produced on my mind by the work of the great poet whom she interpreted. It is impossible to say more. This sudden and unexpected revelation of Shakespeare overwhelmed me. The lightning flash of his genius revealed the whole heaven of art to me, illuminating its remotest depths in a single flash. I recognised the meaning of real grandeur, real beauty and real dramatic truth, and I also realised the utter absurdity of the ideas circulated by Voltaire in France about Shakespeare and the pitiful pettiness of our old poetic school, the offspring of pedagogues and frères ignorantins. But the shock was too great, and it was a long while before I recovered from it. I became possessed by an intense, overpowering sense of sadness that in my then sickly, nervous state produced a mental condition adequately to describe which would take a great physiologist. I could not sleep. I lost my spirits. My favourite studies became distasteful to me, and I spent my time wandering aimlessly about Paris and its environs. 
During that long period of suffering, I can only recall four occasions on which I slept, and then it was the heavy, death-like sleep produced by complete physical exhaustion. These were one night when I had thrown myself down on some sheaves in a field near Vigeuif, one day in a meadow in the neighbourhood of Sceaux, once on the snow on the banks of the frozen Seine near Neuilly, and lastly on a table in a café du Cardinal at the corner of the Boulevard des Italiens and the Rue Richelieu, where I slept for five hours to the terror of the garçons who thought I was dead and were afraid to come near me. It was on my return from one of these wanderings in which I must have seemed like one seeking his soul that my eyes fell on Moore's Irish melodies lying open on my table at the song beginning When He Who Adores Thee. I seized my pen and then and there wrote the music to that heart-rendering farewell which is published at the end of my collection of songs Irlande under the title Elegie. This is the only occasion on which I have been able to vent any strong feeling in music while still under its influence, and I think that I have rarely reached such intense truth of musical expression combined with so much realistic power of harmony. On Theatrical Managers in Relation to Art from the Autobiography I have often wondered why theatrical managers everywhere have such a marked predilection for what genuine artists, cultivated minds and even a certain section of the public itself persist in regarding as very poor manufacture, short-lived productions, the handiwork of which is as valueless as the raw material itself. Not as though platitudes always succeeded better than good works, indeed the contrary is often the case. Neither is it that careful compositions entail more expense than shoddy. It is often just the other way. Perhaps it arises simply from the fact that the good works demand the care, study, attention, and in certain cases, even the mind, talent, and inspiration of everyone in the theatre, from the manager down to the prompter. The others, on the contrary, being made especially for lazy, mediocre, superficial, ignorant and silly people, naturally find a great many supporters. Well, a manager likes above everything whatever brings him in amiable speeches and satisfied looks from his underlings. He likes things that require no learning and disturb no accepted ideas or habits which gently go with the stream of prejudice and wound no self-love because they reveal no incapacity, in a word, things which do not take too long to get up. End of section 39. Recording by Andrew Dunscombe, Lucerne. Section 40 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4, Section 40. Selected Excerpts by Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, 1091 to 1153. Born in 1091 at Fontaine, a castle of his father Tesselin near Dijon, France, and devotedly instructed by his pious and gentle mother Alette, Bernard of Clairvaux was from early childhood imbued with an active religious enthusiasm. When the time came to choose his way of life, instead of going into battle with his knighted brothers, he made them, as well as his uncle, the Count of Touillon, join a band of thirty companions, with whom he knelt in the rude chapel at Citeaux, to beg the tonsure from Abbot Stephen Harding. 
to rise at two o'clock in the morning and chant the prayer offices of the church until nine to do hard manual labor until two when the sole meal of the day composed of vegetable food only was taken to labor again until nightfall and sing the vespers until an early bedtime hour such was the cistercian's daily observance of his vows of poverty chastity and obedience vows which bernard and his followers were to lay down only upon the cross of ashes spread upon the hard cell floor to receive their outstretched dying bodies citeaux became famous from the coming of these new recruits there was in those tough old days a soldierly admiration for faithfulness to discipline and when bernard was professed in eleven fourteen abbot stephen was obliged to enlarge the field of work bernard was sent in eleven fifteen to build a house and clear and cultivate a farm in a thickly wooded and thief-infested glen to the north of dijon known as the valley of wormwood here at the age of twenty-four in a rude house built by their own hands with timber cut from the land the young abbot and his companions lived like the sturdy pioneers of our northwest the earth their floor and narrow wooden bunks in a low dark loft their beds of course the stubborn forest gave way slowly and grudgingly opened sunny hillsides to the vine and wheat sheaf the name of the settlement was changed to clairvaux but for many years the poor monk's only food was barley bread with broth made from boiled beech leaves here tesselin came in his old age to live under the rule of his sons and Numbeline, the wealthy and rank-proud daughter one day left her gay retinue at the door of the little abbey and went to join the nuns at Jouilly. while bernard was studying and planting at clairvaux the word of his piety and worth went everywhere through the land and he came to be consulted not only by his superior at citeaux but by villain and noble even to the august persons of louis the fat of france and henry the norman of england his gentleness and integrity became the chief reliance of the royal house of france and his sermons and letters began to be quoted at council board and synod even as far as rome the austerity and poverty of the cistercians had caused some friends of the monks of cluny to fall under bernard's zealous indignation he wrote to william of saint thierry a famous letter mildly termed an apology in which by the most insinuating and biting satire the laxity and indulgence which had weakened or effaced the power of monastic example from which arraignment the proud house of cluny was deemed not to escape scot-free were lashed with uncompromising courage france and burgundy with the more or less helpful aid of the norman dukes in england had been very loyal to the interests of the papacy when the schism of anacletus the second rose in eleven thirty innocent the second driven from rome by the armed followers of peter de leon found his way at once to the side of louis the sixth there he found bernard and upon him he leaned from that time until the latter had hewed a road for him back to rome through kings prelates statesmen and intriguers with the same unflinching steadfastness with which he had cut away to the sunlight for his vines and vegetables in the valley of wormwood bernard it was who persuaded henry of england to side with innocent and it was he who stayed the revival of the question of investitures and won the emperor to the pope at liege at the council of reims in october eleven thirty one bernard was the central figure and when the path was opened for a return to italy the restored pope took the abbot with him leaving in return a rescript releasing citeaux from tithes bernard stayed in italy until eleven thirty five and left innocent secure in rome 
after a short period of peace at clairvaux he had to hurry off again to italy on account of the defection of the influential monastery of monte cassino to anacletus not long after his last return from italy bernard met pierre abelard this brilliant and unfortunate man had incurred the charge of heresy and at some time in the year eleven thirty nine bernard was induced to meet and confer with him nothing seems to have resulted from the conference for abelard went in eleven forty to the bishop of sens and demanded an opportunity of being confronted with bernard at an approaching synod the abbot of clairvaux although unwilling was at last persuaded to accept the challenge louis the seventh king of france count theobald of champagne and the nobles of the realm assembled to witness the notable contest abelard came with a brilliant following but on the second day of the synod to the surprise of everybody he abruptly closed the proceeding by appealing to rome the works of abelard were condemned but his appeal and person were respected and bernard prepared a strong condemnatory letter to be sent to the pope as the great scholar was on his way to rome to follow his appeal he stayed to rest at cluny with peter the venerable who persuaded him to go to bernard when the two great hearts met in the quiet of clairvaux all animosities were resolved in peace and abelard returning to cluny abandoned his appeal and observed the rule of the house until his death which he endured as peter the venerable wrote to eloise fully prepared and comforted at chalon in eleven forty two the infidels of the east having taken edessa in eleven forty six the power of the christians in the holy land was broken and eugenius the third who had been a monk of clairvaux appointed bernard to preach a new crusade he set on foot a vast host under the personal leadership of louis the seventh and conrad the emperor accompanied by queen eleanor and many noble ladies of both realms the ill fortunes which attended this war brought to bernard the greatest bitterness of his life so signal was the failure of the second crusade that but a pitiful remnant of the brilliant army which had crossed the bosporus returned to europe and bernard was assailed with execration from hut and castle throughout the length of europe his only answer was as gentle as his life better that i be blamed than god he did not neglect however to point out that the evil lives and excesses of those who attempted the crusade were the real causes of the failure of the christian arms in languedoc in eleven forty seven he quelled a dangerous heresy and silenced gilbert bishop of poitiers at the council of reims in eleven forty eight malachi archbishop of armagh and primate of ireland who nine years before had visited clairvaux and formed a lasting friendship for bernard came there again to die in the arms of his friend it is related that the two saints had exchanged habits upon the first visit and that malachi wore that of bernard on his deathbed the funeral sermon preached by bernard upon the life and virtue of his irish comrade is reputed to be one of the finest extant it seemed as if the gale had come to show the goth the way of death bernard's health early broken by self-imposed austerity and penances had never been robust and it had often seemed that nothing but the vigour of his will had kept him from the grave in the year eleven fifty three he was stricken with a fatal illness yet when the archbishop of treves came to his bedside imploring his aid to put an end to an armed quarrel between the nobles and the people of metz he went cheerfully but feebly to the field between the contending parties and by words which came with pain and in the merest whispers he persuaded the men who were already at each other's throats to forget their enmities he died at clairvaux on january twelfth eleven fifty three and was buried as he wished 
in the habit of St. Malachi. In 1174 he was sainted, and his life is honored in the liturgy of the church on the 20th of August. The marks of St. Bernard's character were sweetness and gentle tolerance in the presence of honest opposition, and implacable vigor against shams and evil doing. His was the perfect type of well-regulated individual judgment. His humility and love of poverty were true and unalterable. In Italy he refused the mitres of Genoa and Milan in turn, and in France successively declined the sees of Chalon, Langres, and Rennes. He wrote and spoke with simplicity and directness, and with an energy and force of conviction which came from absolute command of his subject. He did not disdain to use a good-tempered jest as occasion required, and his words afford some pleasant examples of naive puns. He was a tireless letter-writer, and some of his best writings are in that form. He devoted much labor to his sermons on the Canticle of Canticles, the work remaining unfinished at his death. He wrote a long poem on the Passion, one beautiful hymn of which is included in the Roman breviary. St. Bernard's Hymn Jesu, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast, but sweeter far thy face to see, and in thy presence rest. Nor voice can sing, nor heart can frame, nor can the memory find a sweeter sound than thy blessed name, O Saviour of mankind. O hope of every contrite heart, O joy of all the meek, to those who fall how kind thou art, how good to those who seek. But what do those who find, ah, this nor tongue nor pen can show, the love of Jesus, what it is, none but his loved ones know. Jesu, our only joy be thou, as thou our prize wilt be. Jesu, be thou our glory now, and through eternity. Monastic Luxury from the Apology to the Abbot William of St. Thierry there is no conversation concerning the scriptures, none concerning the salvation of souls, but small talk, laughter, and idle words fill the air. At dinner the palate and ears are equally tickled, the one with dainties, the other with gossip and news, which together quite prevent all moderation in feeding. In the meantime dish after dish is set on the table, and to make up for the small privation of meat, a double supply is provided of well-grown fish. When you have eaten enough of the first, if you taste the second course, you will seem to yourself hardly to have touched the former. Such is the art of the cooks, that after four or five dishes have been devoured, the first does not seem to be in the way of the last, nor does satiety invade the appetite. Who could say, to speak of nothing else, in how many forms eggs are cooked and worked up, with what care they are turned in and out, made hard or soft or chopped fine, now fried, now roasted, now stuffed, now they are served mixed with other things, now by themselves. Even the external appearance of the dishes is such that the eye, as well as the taste, is charmed. Not only have we lost the spirit of the old monasteries, but even its outward appearance. For this habit of ours, which of old was the sign of humility, by the monks of our day is turned into a source of pride. We can hardly find in the whole province wherewithal we condescend to be clothed. The monk and the knight cut their garments, the one his cowl, the other his cloak, from the same piece. No secular person, however great, whether king or emperor, would be disgusted at our vestments if they were only cut and fitted to his requirements. But say you religion is in the heart, not in the garments? True, 
but you when you are about to buy a cow rush over the towns visit the markets examine the fairs dive into the houses of the merchants turn over all their goods undo their bundles of cloth feel it with your fingers hold it to your eyes or to the rays of the sun and if anything coarse or faded appears you reject it but if you are pleased with any object of unusual beauty or brightness you at once buy it whatever the price i ask you does this come from the heart or your simplicity i wonder that our abbots allow these things unless it arises from the fact that no one is apt to blame any error with confidence if he cannot trust in his own freedom from the same and it is a right human quality to forgive without much anger those self-indulgences in others for which we ourselves have the strongest inclination how is the light of the world overshadowed those whose lives should have been the way of life to us by the example they give of pride become blind leaders of the blind what a specimen of humility is that to march with such pomp and retinue to be surrounded with such an escort of hairy men so that one abbot has about him people enough for two bishops i lie not when i say i have seen an abbot with sixty horses after him and even more would you not think as you see them pass that they were not fathers of monasteries but lords of castles not shepherds of souls but princes of provinces then there is the baggage containing tablecloths and cups and basins and candlesticks and well-filled wallets not with the coverlets but the ornaments of the beds my lord abbot can never go more than four leagues from his home without taking all his furniture with him as if he were going to the wars or about to cross a desert where necessaries cannot be had is it quite impossible to wash one's hands in and drink from the same vessel will not your candle burn anywhere but in that gold or silver candlestick of yours which you carry with you is sleep impossible except upon a variegated mattress or under a foreign coverlet could not one servant harness the mule wait at dinner and make the bed if such a multitude of men and horses is indispensable why not at least carry with us our necessaries and thus avoid the severe burden we are to our hosts by the sight of wonderful and costly vanities men are prompted to give rather than to pray some beautiful picture of a saint is exhibited and the brighter the colors the greater the holiness attributed to it men run eager to kiss they are invited to give and the beautiful is more admired than the sacred is revered in the churches are suspended not coronae but wheels studded with gems and surrounded by lights which are scarcely brighter than the precious stones which are near them instead of candlesticks we behold great trees of brass fashioned with wonderful skill and glittering as much through their jewels as their lights what do you suppose is the object of all this the repentance of the contrite or the admiration of the gazers oh vanity of vanities but not more vain than foolish the church's walls are resplendent but the poor are not there the curious find wherewith to amuse themselves the wretched find no stay for them in their misery why at least do we not reverence the images of the saints with which the very pavement we walk on is covered often an angel's mouth is spit into and the face of some saint trodden on by passers-by but if we cannot do without the images why can we not spare the brilliant colors what has all this to do with monks with professors of poverty with men of spiritual minds again in the cloisters what is the meaning of those ridiculous monsters of that deformed beauty that beautiful deformity before the very eyes of the brethren when reading what are disgusting monkeys therefore 
or setters or ferocious lions or monstrous centaurs or spotted tigers or fighting soldiers or huntsmen sounding the bugle you may see there one head with many bodies or one body with numerous heads here is a quadruped with a serpent's tail there is a fish with the beast's head there is a creature in front a horse behind a goat another has horns at one end and a horse's tail at the other in fact such an endless variety of forms appears everywhere that it is more pleasant to read in the stonework than in books and to spend the day in admiring these oddities than in meditating on the law of god good god if we are not ashamed of these absurdities why do we not grieve at the cost of them from his sermon on the death of gerard as the tents of kedar as the curtains of solomon solomon song one five perhaps both members of the comparison namely as the tents of kedar as the curtains of solomon refer only to the first words i am black it may be however that the simile is extended to both clauses and each is compared with each the former sense is the more simple the latter the more obscure let us try both beginning with the latter which seems the more difficult there is no difficulty however in the first comparison i am black as the tents of kedar but only in the last for kedar which is interpreted to mean darkness or gloom may be compared with blackness justly enough but the curtains of solomon are not so easily likened to beauty moreover who does not see that tents fit harmoniously with the comparison for what is the meaning of tents except our bodies in which we sojourn for a time nor have we an abiding city but we seek one to come in our bodies as under tents we carry on warfare truly we are violent to take the kingdom indeed the life of man here on earth is a warfare and as long as we do battle in this body we are absent from the lord that is from the light for the lord is light and so far as any one is not in him so far is he in darkness that is in kedar let each one then acknowledge the sorrowful exclamation as his own woe is me that my sojourn is prolonged i have dwelt with those who dwell in kedar my soul hath long sojourned in a strange land therefore this habitation of the body is not the mansion of the citizen nor the house of the native but either the soldier's tent or the traveller's inn this body i say is a tent and a tent of kedar because by its interference it prevents the soul from beholding the infinite light nor does it allow her to see the light at all except through a glass darkly and not face to face do you not see whence blackness comes to the church whence a certain rust cleaves to even the fairest souls doubtless it comes from the tents of kedar from the practice of laborious warfare from the long continuance of a painful sojourn from the straits of our grievous exile from our feeble cumbersome bodies for the corruptible body presseth down the soul and the earthly tabernacle weigheth down the mind that museth upon many things therefore the souls desire to be loosed that being freed from the body they may fly into the embraces of christ wherefore one of the miserable ones said groaning o oh, wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from the body of this death for a soul of this kind knoweth that while in the tents of kedar she cannot be entirely free from spot or wrinkle nor from stains of blackness and wishes to go forth and to put them off and here we have the reason why the spouse calls herself black as the tents of kedar 
but now how is she beautiful as the curtains of solomon behind these curtains i feel that an indescribable holiness and sublimity are veiled which i dare not presume to touch save at the command of him who shrouded and sealed the mystery for i have read he that is a searcher of majesty shall be overwhelmed with the glory i pass on therefore it will devolve on you meanwhile to obtain grace by your prayers that we may the more readily because more confidently recur to a subject which needs attentive minds and it may be that the pious knocker at the door will discover what the bold explorer seeks in vain end of section forty recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section forty one of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. Section 41. Brief Life is Here Our Portion. By Bernard of Cluny. Bernard of Cluny, 12th Century. By William C. Prime little is known concerning the monk bernard sometimes called bernard of morlaix and sometimes bernard of cluny the former name is probably derived from the place of his origin the latter from the fact that in the introduction to his poem de contemptu mundi he describes himself as a brother of the monks of cluny he lived in the twelfth century a period of much learning in the church, and that he was himself a man of broad scholarship and brilliant abilities. The Latin poem, his only surviving work, abundantly testifies. This poem, divided into three books, consists in all of about three thousand lines. It is introduced by a short address in prose to Father Peter the abbot of the monastery in which the author describes the peculiar operations of his mind in undertaking and accomplishing his marvellous poem he believes and asserts not arrogantly but in all humility and therefore boldly that he had divine aid unless the spirit of wisdom and understanding had been with me and filled me i had never been able to construct so long a work in such a difficult metre this metre is peculiar in technical terms each line consists of three parts the first part including two dactyls the second part two dactyls the third part one dactyl and one trochee the final trochee a long and a short syllable rhymes with the following or preceding line there is also a rhyme in each line of the second dactyl with the fourth this will be made plain to the ordinary reader by quoting the first two lines of the poem divided into feet line one foot one hora no foot two wisima three tempora four pessima five sunt vigi six lemus line two foot one eke me two nakiter three imenet four arbiter five ile su six primus 
the adoption of such a meter would seem to be a clog on flexibility and force of expression but in this poem it is not so the author rejoices in absolute freedom of diction the rhythm and rhyme alike lend themselves to the uses now of bitter satire and revilings now of overpowering hope and exultant joy the title scarcely gives an idea of the subject matter of the poem the old benedictine living for the time in his cell had nevertheless known the world of his day had lived in it and been of it to him it seemed an evil world full of crimes of moils of deceits of abominations the church seemed corrupt venal shameless and rome the centre and the soul of this accursed world pondering on these conditions the monk turned his weary gaze toward the celestial country the country of purity and peace and to the king on his throne the centre and source of eternal beatitude the contrast on which he dwelt for a long time filled him on the one hand with burning indignation on the other with entrancing visions and longings at last he broke out into magnificent poetry it is not possible to translate him into any other language than the latin in which he wrote and preserve any of the grandeur and beauty which result from the union of ardent thought with almost miraculous music of language dr neale aptly speaks of the majestic sweetness which invests bernard's poem the expression applies specially to those passages abounding in all parts of the poem in which he describes the glory and the peace of the better country many of these have been translated or closely imitated by dr neale with such excellent effect that several hymns which are very popular in churches of various denominations have been constructed from dr neale's translations other portions of the poem especially those in which the vices and crimes of the rome of that time are denounced and lashed with unsparing severity have never been translated and are not likely ever to be because of the impossibility of preserving in english the peculiar force of the meter and translation without this would be of small value the fire of the descriptions of heaven is increased by the contrast in which they stand with descriptions of rome in the twelfth century here for example is a passage addressed to rome fas mihi dicere fas mihi scribere roma fuisti ob ruta moenibus ob ruta moribus occubuisti orbs ruis inclita tam modo subdita quam prius alta quo prius altior tam modo pressior et labefacta fas mihi scribere fas mihi dicere roma peristi sunt tua moenia vociferantia roma ruisti and here is one addressed to the city of god o sine luxibus o sine luctibus o sine lite splendida curia florida patria patria vitae orb sion inclita patria condita litore tuto te peto te colo te flagro te volo canto saluto while no translation exists of this remarkable work nor indeed can be made to reproduce the power and melody of the original yet a very good idea of its spirit may be had from the work of dr j mason neal who made from selected portions this english poem which is very much more than what he modestly called it a close imitation 
Dr. Neal has made no attempt to reproduce the meter of the original. Brief life is here our portion. Brief life is here our portion, brief sorrow, short-lived care, the life that knows no ending, the tearless life, is there. O happy retribution, short toil, eternal rest, for mortals and for sinners a mansion with the blest, that we should look, poor wanderers, to have our home on high, that worms should seek for dwellings beyond the starry sky. And now we fight the battle, and then we wear the crown of full and everlasting and passionless renown. Then glory, yet unheard of, shall shed abroad its ray, resolving all enigmas, an endless Sabbath day. Then, then, from his oppressors, the Hebrew shall go free, and celebrate in triumph the year of jubilee, and the sunlit land that wrecks not of tempest or of fight shall fold within its bosom each happy Israelite, midst power that knows no limit and wisdom free from bound, the beatific vision shall glad the saints around, and peace, for war is needless, and rest, for storm is past, and goal from finished labor, and anchorage at last. There God, my King and portion, in fullness of his grace, shall we behold forever, and worship face to face. There Jacob, into Israel, from earthlier self estranged, and Leah into Rachel forever shall be changed. There all the halls of Sion, for I shall be complete, and in the land of beauty all things of beauty meet. To thee, O oh dear, dear country, mine eyes their vigils keep. For very love beholding thy happy name they weep. The mention of thy glory is unction to the breast, and medicine in sickness, and love, and life, and rest. O one, O only mansion, O paradise of joy, where tears are ever banished, and smiles have no alloy. Beside thy living waters all plants are great and small, the cedar of the forest, the hyssop of the wall with jaspers glow thy bulwarks thy streets with emeralds blaze the sardius and the topaz unite in thee their rays thine ageless walls are bonded with amethyst unpriced thy saints build up its fabric and the cornerstone is christ thou hast no shore fair ocean thou hast no time bright day dear fountain of refreshment to pilgrims far away. Upon the rock of ages they raise thy holy tower. Thine is the victor's laurel, and thine the golden dower. Thou feel'st in mystic rapture, O bride that know'st no guile, the prince's sweetest kisses, the prince's loveliest smile. Unfading lilies, bracelets of living pearl, thine own the lamb is ever near thee the bridegroom thine alone and all thine endless leisure in sweetest accents sings the ills that were thy merit the joys that are thy kings jerusalem the golden with milk and honey blessed beneath thy contemplation sink heart and voice oppressed I know not, oh, I know not, what social joys are there, what radiancy of glory, what light beyond compare. And when I fain would sing them, my spirit fails and faints, and vainly would it image the assembly of the saints. They stand, those halls of Zion, all jubilant with song, 
and bright with many an angel and many a martyr throng the prince is ever in them the light is i serene the pastures of the blest are decked in glorious sheen there is the throne of david and there from toil released the shout of them that triumph the song of them that feast and they beneath their leader who conquered in the fight for ever and for ever are clad in robes of white jerusalem the glorious the glory of the elect o oh, dear and future vision that eager hearts expect even now by faith i see thee even here thy walls discern to thee my thoughts are kindled and strive and pant and yearn jerusalem the only that lookst from heaven below in thee is all my glory in me is all my woe and though my body may not my spirit seeks thee fain till flesh and earth return me to earth and flesh again o land that ceased no sorrow o state that fierced no strife o princely bowers o land of flowers o realm and home of life End of section 41section forty two of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by martin geeson library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four Section forty two The Treatise of Fishing with an Angle by Juliana Berners Juliana Berners, fifteenth century. About the year fourteen seventy five, one William Caxton, a prosperous English wool merchant of good standing and repute, began printing books the art which he introduced into his native country was quickly taken up by others first it seems by certain monks at st albans and shortly afterward by winkin de ward who had been an apprentice to caxton in 1486 the press at st albans issued two books printed in english of which one was entitled the book of st albans of this volume only three perfect copies are known to exist it is a compilation of treatises on hawking on hunting and on heraldry and contained but little evidence as to their authorship ten years later winkin de ward reprinted the work with additions under the following elaborate title in the fashion of the time treatise pertaining to hawking hunting and fishing with an angle also a richt noble treatise on the lineage of coat armors ending with a treatise which specifies of blazing of arms juliana berners the authorship of this volume one of the earliest books printed in the english language has generally been ascribed to a certain or uncertain juliana berners burns or barnes who lived in the early part of the fifteenth century and who is reputed to have been prioress of the nunnery of sopwell long since in ruins near st albans and close to the little river ver which still conceals in its quiet pools the speckled trout if this attribution be correct dame berners was the first woman to write a book in english although the question of the authorship is by no means settled yet it is clear that the printer believed the treatise on hunting to have been written by this lady 
and the critics now generally assign a portion at least of the volume to her in the sixteenth century the book became very popular and was reprinted many times of the several treatises it contains that on fishing has the greatest interest an interest increased by the fact that it probably suggested the complete angler of isaac walton which appeared one hundred and sixty years later here begins the treatise of fishing with an angler salomon in his parables says that a glad spirit maketh a fluring arch that is a fire arch and a long and since it is so he asks this question which ben the manes and the causes that induce a man into a merry spirit truly to me best discretion it seemeth good disports and honest games in whom a man joyeth without any repentance after then followeth it that good disports and honest games when cows of man's fire age and longer leaf and therefore no while he chose of four good disports and honest games that is to wit of hunting hawking fishing and fooling the best to me simple discretion which is fishing call it angling with a rod and a lean and an hook and thereof to tread as me simple wit my suffice both for the side raison of salomon and also for the raison that physic maketh in this wise si tibi deficiant medici tibi fiant hec tria mens leta labor et moderata dieta ye shall understand that this is for to say if a man lack lech or medicine he shall make three things his lech and medicine and he shall need never no more the first of them is a merry thought the second is labor not outrageous the third is diet mesurable here followeth the order mad to all those which shall have the understanding of this foresight treatise and use it for their pleasures ye that can angle and tuck fish to your pleasures as this foresight treatise teacheth and showeth you he charge and require you in the name of all noble men that ye fish not in no poor man's several water as his pond stew or other necessary things to keep fish in without his license and good will nor that ye use not to break no man's gins lying in their wares and in other places due unto them nay to tuck the fish away that is tucken in them for after a fish is tucken in a man's gin if the gin be lied in the common waters or else in such waters as he heareth it is his own proper goods and if ye tuck it away ye rob him which is a richt shameful dead to ony noble man to do it that thieves and bribers don which are punished for their evil deeds by the neck and other ways when they may be a speared and tucken and also if ye do in like manner as this treatise showeth you ye shall have no need to tuck of other men's well as ye shall have enough of your own tucking if ye list to labour therefore which shall be to you a very pleasure to see the fire bricht sheening scarlet fishes decided by your crafty menace and drawn upon land also that ye break no man's hedges in going about your disports 
ne open no manus gartus but that ye should to them again also ye shall not use this foresight crafty disport for no covetousness to the increasing and sparring of your money only but principally for your solace and to cause the health of your body and specially of your soul for when ye purpose to go on your disports in fishing ye will not desire greatly many persons with you which mich the letter you of your game and then ye may serve god devoutly in sighing affectuously your customable prayer and so stowing ye shall eschew and void many vices as idleness which is principal cause to induce man to many other vices as it is right well knowen also ye shall not be too ravenous in tucking of your side gum as too much at own team which ye may lightly do if ye do in every point as this present treatise showeth you in every point which lightly be occasion to destroy your own disportes and other men's also as when ye have a sufficient mess ye should covet no more as at that time also ye shall busy yourself to nourish the gum in all that ye may and to destroy all such things as being devourers of it and all those that don after this rule shall have the blessing of god and saint peter which by them grant that with his precious blood us bought and for because that this present treatise should not come to the hondes of each idle person which would desire it if it were imprinted alone by itself and put in a little pamphlet therefore he have compiled it in a greater volume of diverse books concerning to gentle and noble men to the intent that the foresight idle persons which should have but little mesure in the side disport of fishing should not by this man utterly destroy it imprinted at westminster be winking the word the year the incarnation of our lord a thousand four hundred six and ninety reprinted by thomas white crane court eighteen hundred and twenty seven end of section forty two section forty three of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Perard. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. Section 43, Old Time London, by Walter Besant. Walter Besant, 1838 to blank. Walter Besant born in portsmouth england in eighteen thirty eight did not begin his career as a novelist till he was thirty years old his preparation for the works that possess so certain a maturity of execution with as certain an ideal of performance was made at king's college london and afterwards at christ's college cambridge where he took mathematical honours abandoning his idea of entering the church he taught for seven years in the royal college of mauritius ill health compelled his return to england and he then took up literature as a profession his first novel he had the courage to burn when the first publisher to whom he showed it refused it but the succeeding years brought forth studies in early french poetry a delicate and scholarly series of essays and edition of rabelais 
of whom he is the biographer and disciple, and, with Professor Palmer, a History of Jerusalem, a work for which he had equipped himself when secretary of the Palestine Exploration Fund. Mr. Besant was also a student in another special field. He knew his Dickens as no other undergraduate in the university knew that branch of polite literature, and passed an examination on the Pickwick Papers, which the author declared that he himself would have failed in. By these processes, Mr. Besant fitted himself mentally and socially for the task of storytelling. The relations of a man of letters to the rest of the world are comprehensively revealed in the long list of his novels. From the beginning, he was one who comes with a tale, quote, which holdeth children from play and old men from the chimney corner, unquote. Nor is the charm lessened by the sense of a living and kindly voice addressing the hearer. His novels are easy reading, and do not contain an obscure sentence. As art is an expression of the artist's mind, and not a rigid ecclesiastical canon, it may be expressed in as many formulas as there are artists. Therefore, while to few readers life casts the rosy reflection that we have learned to call Byzantine, one would not wish it to disappear, nor to be discredited. It was in the year 1869 that Walter Besson, by a happy chance, made the acquaintance of James Rice, the editor of Once a Week, and became a contributor to that magazine. In 1871, that literary partnership between them began, which is interesting in the history of collaboration. Mr. Rice had been a barrister, and added legal lore to Mr. Besant's varied and accurate literary equipment. The brilliant series of novels that followed includes Ready Money Morty Boy, My Little Girl, With Harp and Crown, The Golden Butterfly, the seamy side, and the chaplain of the fleet. The latter story, that of an innocent young country girl, left to the guardianship of her uncle, chaplain of the fleet prison, by the death of her father, is delicately and surprisingly original. The influence of Dickens is felt in the structure of the story, and the faithful, almost photographic fidelity to locality betrays in which footsteps the authors have followed. Almost but the chaplain, though he belongs to a family whose features are familiar to the readers of Little Dorrit and Great Expectations, has not existed until he appears in these pages, pompous, clever, and without principle, but not lacking in natural affection. The young girl, whose guileless belief in everybody forces the worst people to assume the characters her purity and innocence endows them with is to the foul prison what Piscicola was to Charney. Nor will the moralist find fault with the author whose kind heart teaches him to include misfortune in his catalogue of virtues. Mr. Rice died in 1882, and all sorts and conditions of men. Mr. Besant's first independent novel appeared the same year. It is a novel with a purpose, and accomplished its purpose because an artist's hand was necessary to paint the picture of East London that met with such a response as the People's Palace. The appeal to philanthropy was a new one. It was a plea for a little more of the pleasures and graces of life for the two million of people who inhabit the east end of the great city. It is not a picture of life in the lowest phases, where the scenes are as dramatic as in the highest social world, but a story of human life, the nobility, the meanness, the pathos of it in hopelessly commonplace surroundings, where the fight is not a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with bitter poverty or crime, but with dullness and monotony. The characters in all sorts and conditions of men are possibly more typical than real, but one hesitates to question either characters or situation. The impossible story has become true, and the vision that the enthusiastic young hero and heroine 
dream has materialized into a lovely reality the children of gibeon 1884 and the world went very well then 1885 are written with the same philanthropic purpose but if sir walter besant were not first of all a storyteller the possessor of a living voice that holds one spellbound till he has finished his tale the reader would be more sensible of the wide knowledge of the novelist in his familiarity with life in its very forms here are about thirty novels displaying an intimate knowledge of many crafts trades and professions the ways of landsman and voyager of country and town of the new world and the old of modern charlatanism as shown in herr paulus of the woman question among london jews as in the rebel queen and the suggestion of the repose and sufficiency of life's simple needs as told in hall her mind and celia's arbor in the ivory gate the hero is the victim of a remarkable hallucination in the story of the inner house the plummet of suggestion plunges into depths not sounded before and the soul's regeneration is unfolded in the loveliest of parables the range of sir walter besant reaches from the somewhat conventionalized dorothy forster to st catherine's tower where deep tragedy approaches the melodramatic or from the fascination of the master craftsman to the whopping idol of the heaps of miser's treasure there is largeness of stroke in this list and a wide prospect his humour is of the cheerful outdoor kind and the laugh is at foibles rather than weakness he pays little attention to fashion and literature except to give a good-natured nod to a passing fad it would be difficult to classify him under any school his stories are not analytical nor is one conscious of that painstaking fidelity to art which is no longer class among the minor virtues when he fights it is with wrong and oppression and the cheerless monotony of the lives of the poor but he fights classes rather than individuals although certain characters like fielding the plagiarist in armorel of lioness are studied from life the village of bankrupts in all in a garden fair is a whimsical conceit like the disguise of angela in all sorts and conditions of men and the double identity of edmund gray in the ivory gate in reading besant we are constantly reminded that humanity is wider than the world and though its simplest facts are its greatest there is both interest and edification in eccentricities in eighteen ninety five he was made a baronet and is president of the society of authors of whom he has been a gallant champion against the publishers old-time london from sir walter besant's london harper and brothers the london house either in saxon or norman time presented no kind of resemblance to the roman villa it had no cloisters no hypocaust no suite or sequence of rooms this unlikeliness is another proof if any were wanting that the continuity of tenure had been wholly broken if the saxons went into london as has been suggested peaceably and left the people to carry on their old life and their trade in their own way the roman and british architecture no new thing but a style grown up in a course of years and found fitted to the climate would certainly have remained that however was not the case the englishman developed his house from the patriarchal idea first there was the common hall in this the household lived fed transacted business and made their cheer in the evenings it was built of timber and to keep out the cold draughts it was afterwards lined with tapestry at first they used simple cloths which in great houses were embroidered and painted perches of various kinds were affixed to the walls whereon the weapons the musical instruments the cloaks etc were hung up the lord and lady sat on a high seat not i am inclined to think on a dais at the end of the hall which would have been cold for them 
but on a great chair near the fire, which was burning in the middle of the hall. This fashion long continued. I have myself seen a college hall warmed by a fire in a brazier burning under the lantern of the hall. The furniture consisted of benches. The table was laid on trestles, spread with a white cloth, and removed after dinner. The hall was open to all who came, on condition that the guest should leave his weapons at the door. The floor was covered with reeds, which made a clean, soft, and warm carpet, on which the company could, if they pleased, lie round the fire. They had carpets or rugs also, but reeds were commonly used. The traveller who chances to find himself at the ancient and most interesting town of Kingston on Hull, which very few English people, and still fewer Americans, have the curiosity to explore, should visit the Trinity House. There, among many interesting things, he will find a hall where reeds are still spread, but no longer so thickly as to form a complete carpet. I believe this to be the last survival of the reed carpet. The times of meals were the breakfast at about nine, the noon meat, or dinner, at twelve, and the even meat, or supper, probably at a movable time, depending on the length of the day. When lighting was costly and candles were scarce, the hours of sleep would be naturally longer in winter than in the summer. In their manner of living, the Saxons were fond of vegetables, especially of the leek, onion, and garlic. Beans they also had. These were introduced probably at the time when they commenced intercourse with the outer world. Peas, radishes, turnips, parsley, mint, sage, cress, rue, and other herbs. They had nearly all our modern fruits, though many show by their names, which are Latin or Norman, a later introduction. They made use of butter, honey, and cheese. They drank ale and mead. The latter is still made, but in small quantities, in Somerset and Hereford shires. The Normans brought over the custom of drinking wine. In the earliest times, the whole family slept in the common hall. The first improvement was the erection of the solar, or upper chamber. This was above the hall, or a portion of it, or over the kitchen and buttery attached to the hall. The arrangement may be still observed in many of the old colleges of Oxford or Cambridge. The solar was first the sleeping room of the lord and lady, though afterward it served not only this purpose, but also for an antechamber to the dormitory of the daughters and the maidservants. The men of the household still slept in the hall below. Later on, bed recesses were contrived in the wall, as one may find in Northumberland at the present day. The bed was commonly, but not for the ladies of the house, merely a big bag stuffed with straw. A sheet wrapped round the body formed the only nightdress. But there were also pillows, blankets, and coverlets. The early English bed was quite as luxurious as any that followed after, until the invention of the spring mattress gave a new and hitherto unhoped-for joy to the hours of night. The second step in advance was the ladies' bower, a room or suite of rooms set apart for the ladies of the house and their women. For the first time, as soon as this room was added, the women could follow their own vocations of embroidery, spinning, and needlework of all kinds, apart from the rough and noisy talk of the men. The main features, therefore, of every great house, whether in town or country, from the 7th to the 12th century, were the hall, the solar built over the kitchen and buttery, and the ladies' bower. There was also the garden. In all times the English have been fond of gardens. Bacon thought it not beneath his dignity to order the arrangement of a garden. Long before Bacon, a writer of the twelfth century describes a garden as it should be. Quote, it should be adorned on this side with roses, lilies, and the marigold, on that side with parsley, cost, fennel, southernwood, coriander, sage, savory, hyssop, mint, vine, detony, pellitory, lettuce, cresses, and the peony. 
let there be beds enriched with onions leeks garlic melons and scallions the garden is also enriched by the cucumber the soporiferous poppy and the daffodil and the acanthus nor let potherbs be wanting as beetroot sorrel and mallow it is useful also to the gardener to have anise mustard and wormwood a noble garden will give you medlars winces the pear main peaches pears of st rio pomegranates citrons oranges almonds dates and figs the latter fruits were perhaps attempted but one doubts their arriving at ripeness perhaps the writer sets down what he hoped would be some day achieved the indoor amusements of the time were very much like our own we have a little music in the evening so did our forefathers we sometimes have a little dancing so did they but the dancing was done for them we go to the theatres to see the mime in their day the mime made his theatre in the great man's hall he played the fiddle and the harp he sang songs he brought his daughter who walked on her hands and executed astonishing capers the gleeman minstrel or jongleur was already as disreputable as when we find him later on with his ribaudry again we play chess so did our ancestors we gamble with dice so did they we feast and drink together so did they we pass the time in talk so did they in a word as alphonse carr put it the more we change the more we remain the same out of doors as fitzstephen shows the young men skated wrestled played ball practised archery held water tournaments baited bull and bear fought cocks and rode races they were also mustered sometimes for service in the field and went forth cheerfully being especially upheld by the reassuring consciousness that london was always on the winning side the growth of the city government belongs to the history of london suffice it here to say that the people in all times enjoyed a freedom far above that possessed by any other city of europe the history of municipal london is a history of continual struggle to maintain this freedom against all attacks and to extend it and to make it impregnable already the people are proud turbulent and confident in their own strength they refuse to own any other lord but the king himself there is no earl of london they freely hold their free and open meetings their folk motes in the open space outside the northwest corner of st paul's churchyard that they lived roughly enduring cold sleeping in small houses and narrow courts that they suffered much from the long darkness of winter that they were always in danger of fevers agues putrid throats plagues fires by night and civil wars that they were ignorant of letters three schools only for the whole of london all this may very well be understood but these things do not make men and women wretched they were not always suffering from preventable disease they were not always hauling their goods out of the flames they were not always fighting the first and most simple elements of human happiness are three to wit that a man should be in bodily health that he should be free that he should enjoy the produce of his own labor all these things the londoner possessed under the norman kings nearly as much as in these days they can be possessed his city has always been one of the healthiest in the world whatever freedom could be attained he enjoyed and in that rich trading town all men who worked lived in plenty the households the way of living the occupations of the women can be clearly made out in every detail from the anglo-saxon literature the women in the country made the garments carded the wool sheared the sheep washed the things beat the flax ground the corn sat at the spinning wheel and prepared the food in the towns they had no shearing to do but all the rest of their duty fell to their province the english women excelled in embroidery english work meant the best kind of work they worked church vestments with gold and pearls and precious stones orphrey 
or embroidery in gold, was a special art. Of this they are accursed by the ecclesiastics of an overweening desire to wear finery. They certainly curled their hair, and one is sorry to read, they painted, and therefore spoiled their pretty cheeks. If the man was Hlafward, lord, the owner or winner of the loaf, the wife was the Hlafdig, lady, its distributor. The servants and the retainers were Hlafwetas, or eaters of it. When nunneries began to be founded, the Saxon ladies in great numbers forsook the world for the cloister, and here they began to learn Latin and became able at least to carry on correspondence, specimens of which still exist in that language. Every nunnery possessed a school for girls. They were taught to read and to write their own language, and Latin, perhaps also rhetoric and embroidery. As the pious sisters were fond of putting on violet chemises, tunics, and vests of delicate tissue, embroidered with silver and gold, and scarlet shoes, there was probably not much mortification of the flesh in the nunneries of the later Saxon times. This for the better class. We cannot suppose that the daughters of the craftsmen became scholars of the nunnery. Theirs were the lower walks, to spin the linen and to make the bread and carry on the housework. End of section 43section 44 of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by map Rard. library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 4 section 44 the synagogue by walter besson from the Rebel Queen, Harper and Brothers. D'un jour intérieur, je me sens éclair, et j'entends une voix qui me dit d'espérer. La Martin. Are you ready, Francesca? Nellie ran lightly down the narrow stairs, dressed for Sabbath and synagogue. She was dainty and pretty at all times in the matter of dress but especially on a summer day, which affords opportunity for bright color and bright drapery, and an ethereal appearance. This morning she was full of color and light. When, however, she found herself confronted with Francesca's simple gray dress, so closely fitting, so faultless, and her black lace hat with its single rose for color, Nellie's artistic sense caused her heart to sink like lead. It is not for nothing that one learns and teaches the banjo. One art leads to another. She who knows music can feel for dress. Oh, she cried, clasping her hands, that's what we can never do. What? That fit. Look at me. Yet they call me clever. Clara gives me the new fashions and I copy them, and the girls in our street copy me. Poor things and the dressmaker comes to talk things over and to learn from me. I make everything for myself, and they call me clever, but I can't get near it, and if I can't, nobody can. A large, detached structure of red brick stood east and west, with a flat façade and round windows that bore out the truth of the date, 1700, carved upon the front. A word or two in that square character, that tongue, which presents so few attractions to most of us compared with other tongues, probably corroborated the internal evidence of the façade and the windows. This is the synagogue, said Nellie. She entered, and turning to the right, led the way upstairs to a gallery running along the whole side of the building. On the other side was another gallery. In front of both was a tolerably wide grill, through which the congregation below could be seen perfectly. This is the women's gallery, whispered Nell. There were not many women present. We'll sit in the front. Presently they will sing. They sing beautifully. Now they're reading prayers and the law. They've got to read the whole law through once a week, you know. Francesca looked curiously through the grill. 
when one is in a perfectly strange place, the first observations made are of small and unimportant things. She observed that there was a circular enclosure at the east end, as if for an altar, but there was no altar. Two doors indicated a cupboard in the wall. There were six tall wax lights burning round the enclosure, although the morning was fine and bright. At the west end, a high screen kept the congregation from the disturbance of those who entered or went out. Within the screen was a company of men and boys, all with their hats and caps on their heads. They looked like the choir. In front of the choir was a platform railed round. Three chairs were placed at the back of the platform. There was a table covered with red velvet, on which lay the Book of the Law, a ponderous roll of parchment provided with silver staves or handles. Before this desk or table stood the reader. He was a tall and handsome man, with black hair and full black beard, about forty years of age. He wore a gown and large Geneva bands, like a Presbyterian minister. On his head he had a kind of beretta. Four tall wax candles were placed round the front of the platform. The chairs were occupied by two or three elders. A younger man stood at the desk beside the reader. The service was already begun. It was, in fact, half over. Francesca observed next that all the men wore a kind of broad scarf, made of some white stuff, about eight feet long and four feet broad. Bands of black or blue were worked in the ends, which were also provided with fringes. It is the talent, Nellie whispered. Even the boys wore this white robe, the effect of which would have been very good but for the modern hat, tall or pot, which spoiled all. Such a robe wants a turban above it, not an English hat. The seats were ranged along the synagogue east and west. The place was not full, but there were a good many worshippers. The service was chanted by the reader. It was a kind of chant quite new and strange to Francesca. Like many young persons brought up with no other religion than they can pick up for themselves, she was curious and somewhat learned in the matter of ecclesiastical music and ritual, which she approached, owing to her education, with unbiased mind. She knew masses and anthems and hymns and chants of all kinds. Never had she heard anything of this kind before. It was not congregational or Gregorian, nor was it repeated by the choir from side to side, nor was it a monotone with a drop at the end. Nor was it a florid, tuneful chant, such as one may hear in some Anglican services. This reader, with a rich, strong voice, a baritone of great power, took nearly the whole of the service. It must have been extremely fatiguing, upon himself, chanting it from beginning to end. No doubt, as he rendered the reading and the prayers, so they had been given by his ancestors in Spain and Portugal, generation after generation, back into the times when they came over in Phoenician ships to the Carthaginian colonies, even before the dispersion of the ten tribes. It was a traditional chant of antiquity beyond record, not a monotonous chant. Francesca knew nothing of the words. She grew tired of trying to make out whereabouts on the page the reader might be in the book lent her which had Hebrew on one side and English on the other. Besides, the man attracted her, by his voice, by his energy, by his appearance. She closed her book and surrendered herself to the influence of the voice and the emotions which it expressed. There was no music to help him. From time to time, the men in the congregation lifted up their voices, not seemingly in response, but as if moved to sudden passion and crying out with one accord. This helped him a little, Otherwise, he was without any assistance. A great voice. The man sometimes leaned over the roll of the law. Sometimes he stood upright. Always his great voice went up and down and rolled along the roof and echoed along the benches of the women's gallery. Now the voice sounded a note of rejoicing. Now, but less often, a note of sadness. Now it was a sharp and sudden cry of triumph. Then the people shouted with him. It was as if they clashed sword on shield and yelled for victory. Now it was a note of defiance, as when men go forth to fight an enemy. Now it sank 
to a murmur, as of one who consoles and soothes and promises things to come. Now it was a note of rapture, as if the promised land was already recovered. Was all that in the voice? Did the congregation, all sitting wrapped in their white robes, feel these emotions as the voice thundered and rolled? I know not. Such was the effect produced upon one who heard this voice for the first time. At first it seemed loud, even barbaric. There was lacking something which, which the listener and stranger had learned to associate with worship. What was it? Reverence? But she presently found reverence in plenty, only of a kind that differed from that of Christian worship. Then the listener made another discovery. In this ancient service she missed the note of humiliation. There was no litany at a false door. There was no kneeling in abasement. There was no appearance of penitence, sorrow, or the confession of sins. The voice was as the voice of a captain exhorting his soldiers to fight. The service was warlike, the service of a people whose trust in their God is so great that they do not need to call perpetually upon him for the help and forgiveness of which they are assured. Yes, yes, she thought, this is the service of a race of warriors. They are fighting men. The Lord is their God. He is leading them to battle. As for little sins and backslidings and penitences, they belong to the Day of Atonement, which comes once a year. For all the other days in the year, battle and victory occupy all the mind. The service of a great fighting people, a service full of joy, full of faith, full of assurance, full of hope and confidence, such assurance as few Christians can understand, and of faith to which few Christians can attain. Perhaps Francesca was wrong, but these were her first impressions, and these are mostly true. In the body of the synagogue, men came late. Under one gallery was a school of boys in the charge of a greybeard, who, book in hand, followed the service with one eye, while he admonished perpetually the boys to keep still and to listen. The boys grew restless. It was tedious to them. The voice, which expressed so much to the stranger who knew no Hebrew at all, was tedious to the children. They were allowed to get up and run into the court outside and then to come back again. Nobody heeded their going in and out. One little boy of three, wrapped, like the rest, in a white tallet, ran up and down the side aisle without being heeded. Even by the splendid beetle with the gold-laced hat, which looked so truly wonderful above the oriental tallet. The boys in the choir got up and went in and out, just as they pleased. Nobody minded. The congregation, mostly well-to-do men with silk hats, sat in their places, book in hand, and paid no attention. Under the opposite gallery sat two or three rows of worshippers, who reminded Francesca of Browning's poem of St. John's Day at Rome, for they nudged and jostled each other. They whispered things. They even laughed over the things they whispered. But they were clad like those in the open part in the tallow, and they sat book in hand, and from time to time they raised their voices with the congregation. They showed no reverence, except that they did not talk or laugh loudly. They were like the children, their neighbors, just as restless, just as uninterested, just as perfunctory. Well, they were clearly the poorer and the more ignorant part of the community. They came here and sat through the service because they were ordered so to do, because, like Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles and the Fast of Atonement, it was the law of their people. The women in the gallery sat or stood. They neither knelt nor sang aloud. They only sat when it was proper to sit or stood when it was proper to stand. They were like the women, the village women, in a Spanish or Italian church, for whom everything is done. Francesca, for the moment, felt humiliated that she should be compelled to sit apart from the congregation, railed off in the women's gallery, to have her religion done for her, without a voice of her own in it at all. So, I have heard, indignation sometimes fills the bosom of certain ladies when they reflect upon the fact that they are excluded from the choir and forbidden even to play the organ in their own parish church. The chanting ceased. The reader sat down. 
then the choir began they sang a hymn a hebrew hymn the rhythm and meter were not english the music was like nothing that can be heard in a christian church it is the music said nelly to which the israelites crossed the red sea a bold statement but why not if the music is not a western origin and character who can disprove such an assertion after the hymn the prayers and reading went on again there came at last it is a long service such as we poor weak-kneed anglicans could not endure the end there was a great bustle and ceremony on the platform they rolled up the roll of the law they wrapped it in a purple velvet cloth they hung over it a silver breastplate set with twelve jewels for the twelve tribes in memory of the urim and thummim francesca saw that the upper ends of the staves were adorned with silver pomegranates and with silver bells and they placed it in the arms of one of those who had been reading the law then a procession was formed and they walked while the choir sang one of the psalms of david but not in the least like the same psalm sung in an english cathedral bearing the roll of the law to the ark that is to say to the cupboard behind the railing and enclosure at the east end the reader came back then with another chanted prayer it sounded like a prolonged shout of continued triumph he ended his part of the service and then the choir sang the last hymn a lovely hymn not in the least like a christian or at least an english hymn a psalm that breathed a tranquil hope and a perfect faith one needed no words to understand the full meaning and beauty and depth of that hymn the service was finished the men took off their white scarves and folded them up they stood and talked in groups for a few minutes gradually melting away as for the men under the gallery who had been whispering and laughing they trooped out of the synagogue altogether evidently to them the service was only a form what is it in any religion but a form to the baser sort the beetle put out the lights nelly led the way down the stairs thinking of what the service had suggested to herself all those wonderful things above enumerated francesco wondered what it meant to a girl who heard it every sabbath morning but she refrained from asking custom too often takes the symbolism out of the symbols and the poetry out of the verse then the people begin to worship the symbols and make a fetish of the words we have seen this elsewhere in other forms of faith outside they found emmanuel they had not seen him in the congregation probably because it is difficult to recognize a man merely by the top of his hat come he said let us look around the place afterwards perhaps we will talk of our service this synagogue is built on the site of the one erected by manasseh and his friends when oliver cromwell permitted them to return to london after four hundred years of exile they were forced to wear yellow hats at first but that ordinance soon fell into disuse like many other abominable laws when you read about medieval laws francesca remember that when they were cruel or stupid they were seldom carried into effect because the arm of the executive was weak who was there to oblige the jews to wear the yellow hat the police there were no police the people what did the people care about the yellow hat when the fire burned down london sparing not even the great cathedral to say nothing of the synagogue this second temple arose equal in splendor to the first at that time all the jews in london were suffragan of spain and portugal and italy even now there are many of the people here who speak nothing among themselves but spanish just as there are askenazim who speak nothing among themselves but yiddish come with me i will show you something that will please you he led the way into another flagged court larger than the first there were stone staircases mysterious doorways paved passages a suggestion of a cloister an open space or square and buildings on all sides with windows opening upon the court it doesn't look english at all said francesca i have seen something like it in a spanish convent 
with balconies and a few bright hangings and a black-haired woman at the open windows, and perhaps a coat of arms carved upon the wall. It would do for part of a Spanish street. It is a strange place to find in the heart of London. You see the memory of the peninsula. What were we saying yesterday? Spain places her own seal upon everything that belongs to her. People, buildings, all. What you see here is the central institute of our people, the Sephardim, the Spanish part of our people. Here is our synagogue. Here are schools, almshouses, residence of the rabbi, and all sorts of things. You can come here sometimes and think of Spain, where your ancestors lived. Many generations in Spain have made you, as they have made me, a Spaniard. They went back to the first court. On their way out, as they passed the synagogue, there came running across the court a girl of fifteen or so. She was bareheaded. A mass of thick black hair was curled round her shapely head. Her figure was that of an English girl of twenty. Her eyes showed black and large and bright as she glanced at the group standing in the court. Her skin was dark. She was oddly and picturesquely dressed in a grayish-blue skirt with a bright crimson open jacket. The color seemed literally to strike the eye. The girl disappeared under a doorway, leaving a picture of herself in Francesca's mind, a picture to be remembered. A Spanish Jewess, said Emmanuel an oriental she chooses by instinct the colors that her great-grandmother might have worn to grace the triumph of david the king end of section forty four section forty five of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4 Section 45 Bestiaries and Lapidaries by L. Oscar Kuhns one of the marked features of literary investigation during the present century is the interest which it has manifested in the Middle Ages. Not only have specialists devoted themselves to the detailed study of the sagas of the North and the great cycles of romance in France and England, but the stories of the Edda, of the Nibelungen, and of Charlemagne and King Arthur have become popularized, so that Today they are familiar to the general reader. There is one class of literature, however, which was widespread and popular during the Middle Ages, but which is today known only to the student, that is, the so-called bestiaries and lapidaries, or collections of stories and superstitions concerning the marvelous attributes of animals and of precious stones. The basis of all bestiaries is the Greek physiologus, the origin of which can be traced back to the second century before Christ. It was undoubtedly largely influenced by the zoology of the Bible, and in the references to the ibex, the phoenix, and the tree paradixion, traces of Oriental and Old Greek superstitions can be seen. It was from the Latin versions of the Greek original that translations were made into nearly all European languages. There are extant today, whole or in fragments, bestiaries in German, Old English, Old French, Provencal, Icelandic, Italian, Bohemian, and even Armenian, Ethiopic, and Syriac. These various versions differ more or less in the arrangement and number of the animals described, but all point back to the same ultimate source. The main object of the bestiaries was not so much to impart scientific knowledge, as by means of symbols and allegories to teach the doctrines and mysteries of the church. At first this symbolical application was short and concise, 
but later became more and more expanded until it often occupied more space than the description of the animal which served as a text some of these animals are entirely fabulous such as the siren the phoenix the unicorn others are well known but possess certain fabulous attributes the descriptions of them are not the result of personal observation but are derived from stories told by travellers or read in books or are merely due to the imagination of the author these stories passing down from hand to hand gradually became accepted facts these books were enormously popular during the middle ages a fact which is proved by the large number of manuscripts still extant their influence on literature was likewise very great to say nothing of the encyclopedic works such as le tresors of brunetto latini the image du monde the roman de la rose which contain extracts from the bestiaries there are many references to them in the great writers even down to the present day there are certain passages in dante chaucer and shakespeare that would be unintelligible without some knowledge of these medieval books of zoology hence besides the interest inherent in these quaint and childish stories besides their value in revealing the scientific spirit and attainments of the times some knowledge of the bestiaries is of undoubted value and interest to the student of literature closely allied to the bestiaries and indeed often contained in the same manuscript are the lapidaries in which are discussed the various kinds of precious stones with their physical characteristics shape size color their use in medicine and their marvellous talismanic properties in spite of the fact that they contain the most absurd fables and superstitions they were actually used as textbooks in the schools and published in medical treatises the most famous of them was written in latin by marbode bishop of rennes died in eleven twenty three and translated many times into old french and other languages the following extracts from the bestiaries are translated from le bestiaire of guillaume leclerc composed in the year twelve ten edited by dr robert reinsch leipzig eighteen ninety while endeavouring to retain somewhat of the quaintness and naivete of the original i have omitted those repetitions and tautological expressions which are so characteristic of medieval literature the religious application of the various animals is usually very long and often is the mere repetition of the same idea the symbolical meaning of the lion here given may be taken as a type of all the rest the lion it is proper that we should speak first of the nature of the lion which is a fierce and proud beast and very bold it has three especially peculiar characteristics in the first place it always dwells upon a high mountain from afar off it can scent the hunter who is pursuing it and in order that the latter may not follow it to its lair it covers over its tracks by means of its tail another wonderful peculiarity of the lion is that when it sleeps its eyes are wide open and clear and bright the third characteristic is likewise very strange for when the lioness brings forth her young it falls to the ground and gives no sign of life until the third day when the lion breathes upon it and in this way brings it back to life again the meaning of all this is very clear when god our sovereign father who is the spiritual lion came for our salvation here upon earth so skilfully did he cover his tracks that never did the hunter know that this was our saviour 
and nature marvelled how he came among us by the hunter you must understand him who made man to go astray and seeks after him to devour him this is the devil who desires only evil when this lion was laid upon the cross by the jews his enemies who judged him wrongfully his human nature suffered death when he gave up the spirit from his body he fell asleep upon the holy cross then his divine nature awoke this must you believe if you wish to live again when god was placed in the tomb he was there only three days and on the third day the father breathed upon him and brought him to life again just as the lion did to its young the pelican the pelican is a wonderful bird which dwells in the region about the river nile the written history tells us that there are two kinds those which dwell in the river and eat nothing but fish and those which dwell in the desert and eat only insects and worms there is a wonderful thing about the pelican for never did mother sheep love her lamb as the pelican loves its young when the young are born the parent bird devotes all his care and thought to nourishing them but the young birds are ungrateful and when they have grown strong and self-reliant they peck at their father's face and he enraged at their wickedness kills them all on the third day the father comes to them deeply moved with pity and sorrow with his beak he pierces his own side until the blood flows forth with the blood he brings back life into the body of his young the eagle the eagle is the king of birds when it is old it becomes young again in a very strange manner when its eyes are darkened and its wings are heavy with age it seeks out a fountain clear and pure where the water bubbles up and shines in the clear sunlight above this fountain it rises high up into the air and fixes its eyes upon the light of the sun and gazes upon it until the heat thereof sets on fire its eyes and wings then it descends down into the fountain where the water is clearest and brightest and plunges and bathes three times until it is fresh and renewed and healed of its old age the eagle has such keen vision that if it is high up among the clouds soaring through the air it sees the fish swimming beneath it in river or sea then down it shoots upon the fish and seizes and drags it to the shore again if unknown to the eagle its eggs should be changed and others put into its nest when the young are grown before they fly away it carries them up into the air when the sun is shining its brightest those which can look at the rays of the sun without blinking it loves and holds dear those which cannot stand to look at the light it abandons as base-born nor troubles itself henceforth concerning them the phoenix there is a bird named the phoenix which dwells in india and is never found elsewhere this bird is always alone and without companion for its like cannot be found and there is no other bird which resembles it in habits or appearance at the end of five hundred years it feels that it has grown old and loads itself with many rare and precious spices and flies from the desert away to the city of leopolis there by some sign or other the coming of the bird is announced to a priest of that city who causes faggots to be gathered and placed upon a beautiful altar erected for the bird and so as i have said the bird laden with spices comes to the altar and smiting upon the hard stone with its beak it causes the flame to leap forth and set fire to the wood 
and the spices. When the fire is burning brightly, the phoenix lays itself upon the altar and is burned to dust and ashes. Then comes the priest and finds the ashes piled up and, separating them softly, he finds within a little worm, which gives forth an odour sweeter than that of roses or of any other flower. The next day and the next the priest comes again, and on the third day he finds that the worm has become a full-grown and full-fledged bird, which bows low before him and flies away, glad and joyous, nor returns again before five hundred years. THE ANT There is another kind of ant up in Ethiopia, which is of the shape and size of dogs. They have strange habits, for they scratch into the ground and extract therefrom great quantities of fine gold. If any one wishes to take this gold from them, he soon repents of his undertaking, for the ants run upon him, and if they catch him, they devour him instantly. The people who live near them know that they are fierce and savage, and that they possess a great quantity of gold, and so they have invented a cunning trick. They take mares which have unweaned foals, and give them no food for three days. On the fourth the mares are saddled, and to the saddles are fastened boxes that shine like gold. Between these people and the ants flows a very swift river. The famished mares are driven across this river, while the foals are kept on the hither side. On the other side of the river the grass is rich and thick. Here the mares graze, and the ants, seeing the shining boxes, think they have found a good place to hide their gold, and so all day long they fill and load the boxes with their precious gold, till night comes on and the mares have eaten their fill. When they hear the neighing of their foals, they hasten to return to the other side of the river. There their masters take the gold from the boxes and become rich and powerful, but the ants grieve over their loss. THE SIREN The siren is a monster of strange fashion, for from the waist up it is the most beautiful thing in the world, formed in the shape of a woman. The rest of the body is like a fish or a bird. So sweetly and beautifully does she sing that they who go sailing over the sea, as soon as they hear the song, cannot keep from going towards her. Entranced by the music, they fall asleep in their boat and are killed by the siren before they can utter a cry. THE WHALE In the sea, which is mighty and vast, are many kinds of fish, such as the turbot, the sturgeon, and the porpoise. But there is one monster, very treacherous and dangerous. In Latin its name is Cetus. It is a bad neighbor for sailors. The upper part of its back looks like sand, and when it rises from the sea the mariners think it is an island. Deceived by its size they sail toward it for refuge when the storm comes upon them. They cast anchor, disembark upon the back of the whale, cook their food, build a fire, and in order to fasten their boat they drive great stakes into what seems to them to be sand. When the monster feels the heat of the fire which burns upon its back, it plunges down into the depths of the sea and drags the ship and all the people after it. When the fish is hungry, it opens its mouth very wide and breathes forth an exceedingly sweet odor. Then all the little fish stream thither and, allured by the sweet smell, crowd into its throat. Then the whale closes its jaws and swallows them into its stomach, which is as wide as a valley. The Crocodile 
the crocodile is a fierce beast that lives always beside the river nile in shape it is somewhat like an ox it is full twenty ells long and as big around as the trunk of a tree it has four feet large claws and very sharp teeth by means of these it is well armed so hard and tough is its skin that it minds not in the least hard blows made by sharp stones never was seen another such beast for it lives on land and in water at night it is submerged in water and during the day it reposes upon the land if it meets and overcomes a man it swallows him entire so that nothing remains but ever after it laments him as long as it lives the upper jaw of this beast is immovable when it eats and the lower one alone moves no other living creature has this peculiarity the other beast of which i have told you the water serpent which always lives in the water hates the crocodile with a mortal hatred when it sees the crocodile sleeping on the ground with its mouth wide open it rolls itself in the slime and mud in order to become more slippery then it leaps into the throat of the crocodile and is swallowed down into its stomach here it bites and tears its way out again but the crocodile dies on account of its wounds the turtle dove now i must tell you of another bird which is courteous and beautiful and which loves much and is much loved this is the turtle dove the male and the female are always together in mountain or in desert and if perchance the female loses her companion never more will she cease to mourn for him never more will she sit upon green branch or leaf nothing in the world can induce her to take another mate but she ever remains loyal to her husband when i consider the faithfulness of this bird i wonder at the fickleness of man and woman many husbands and wives there are who do not love as the turtle dove but if the man bury his wife before he has eaten two meals he desires to have another woman in his arms the turtle dove does not so but remains patient and faithful to her companion waiting if haply he might return the mandragora the mandragora is a wild plant the like of which does not exist many kinds of medicine can be made of its root this root if you look at it closely will be seen to have the form of a man the bark is very useful when well boiled in water it helps many diseases the skilful physicians gather this plant when it is old and they say that when it is plucked it weeps and cries and if any one hears the cry he will die but those who gather it do this so carefully that they receive no evil from it if a man has a pain in his head or in his body or in his hand or foot it can be cured by this herb if you take this plant and beat it and let the man drink of it he will fall asleep very softly and no more will he feel pain there are two kinds of this plant male and female the leaves of both are beautiful the leaf of the female is thick like that of the wild lettuce the following two extracts are translated from les lapidaires francais du moyen âge by leopold panier paris eighteen eighty two sapphire the sapphire is beautiful and worthy to shine on the fingers of a king in color it resembles the sky when it is pure and free from clouds no precious stone has greater virtue or beauty one kind of sapphire is found among the pebbles in the country of libya 
but that which comes from the land of the Turk is more precious. It is called the gem of gems, and is of great value to men and women. It gives comfort to the heart, and renders the limbs strong and sound. It takes away envy and perfidy, and can set the prisoner at liberty. He who carries it about him will never have fear. It pacifies those who are angry, and by means of it one can see into the unknown. It is very valuable in medicine. It cools those who are feverish, and who on account of pain are covered with perspiration. When powdered and dissolved in milk, it is good for ulcers. It cures headache and diseases of the eyes and tongue. He who wears it must live chastely and honorably, so shall he never feel the distress of poverty. Coral Coral grows like a tree in the sea, and at first its color is green. When it reaches the air it becomes hard and red. It is half a foot in length. He who carries it will never be afraid of lightning or tempest. The field in which it is placed will be very fertile and rendered safe from hail or any other kind of storm. It drives away evil spirits and gives a good beginning to all undertakings and brings them to a good end. End of section 45 Section 46 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. Section 46. Essay on Marie-Henri Belle, Stendhal. 1783 to 1842 by frederick tabor cooper marie henri bel french novelist and man of letters who is better known under his bizarre pseudonym of stendhal is a somewhat unusual figure among french writers he was curiously misappreciated by his own generation whose literary movements he in turn confessedly ignored he is recognized today as an important link in the development of modern fiction and is even discussed concurrently with balzac in the same way that we speak of dickens and thackeray emerson and lowell there is nothing dramatic in stendhal's life which viewed impartially is a simple and somewhat pathetic record of failure and disillusion he was six years older than balzac having been born january twenty third seventeen eighty three in the small town of grenoble in dauphine which with its narrow prejudices and petty formalism seemed to him in after years the souvenir of an abominable indigestion he early developed an abnormal sensibility which would have met with ready response had his mother lived but which a keen dread of ridicule taught him to hide from an unsympathetic father and a still more unkind aunt later his stepmother seraphie gagnon he seemed predestined to be misunderstood even his school companions finding him odd and often amusing themselves at his expense thus he grew up with a sense of isolation in his own home and when in eighteen hundred he had the opportunity of going to some distant relatives in paris the daru family he seized it eagerly the following year he accompanied the younger darus to italy and was present at the battle of marengo this was the turning point of stendhal's career he was dazzled by napoleon's successes and fascinated with the beauty and gaiety of milan where he found himself for the first time in a congenial atmosphere and among companions animated by a common cause his consequent sense of freedom and exaltation knew no bounds henceforth napoleon was to be his hero and italy the land of his election 
two lifelong passions which furnish the clue to much that is enigmatic in his character during the ensuing years while he followed the fortunes of napoleon throughout the prussian campaign and until after the retreat from moscow italy was always present in his thoughts and when waterloo ended his political and military aspirations he hastened back to milan declaring that he had ceased to be a frenchman and settled down to a life of tranquil bohemianism too absorbed in the paintings of correggio and in the operas of rossini to be provident of the future the following years the happiest of his life were also the period of stendhal's chief intellectual growth due quite as much to the influence exerted on him by italian art and music as by his contact with men like manzoni monti and silvio pellico unfortunately his relations with certain italian patriots aroused the suspicions of the austrian police and he was abruptly banished he returned to paris where to his surprise life proved more than tolerable and where he made many valuable acquaintances such as benjamin constant destut de tracy and prosper Mérimé. the revolution of july brought him a change of fortune for he was in sympathy with louis philippe and did not scruple to accept the consulship offered him at civita vecchia he soon found however that a small mediterranean seaport was a poor substitute for his beloved milan while its trying climate undoubtedly shortened his life in eighteen forty one failing health forced him to abandon his duties and return to paris where he died of apoplexy on march twenty third eighteen forty two so much at least of stendhal's life must be known in order to understand his writings all of which not excepting the novels belong to what ferdinand brunetier stigmatizes as personal literature indeed the chief interest of many of his books lies in the sidelights they throw upon his curious personality he was a man of violent contrasts a puzzle to his best friends one day making the retreat from moscow with undaunted zeal the next settling down contentedly in milan to the very vie de cafe he affected to despise he was a strange combination of restless energy and philosophic contemplation hampered by a morbid sensibility which tended to increase but which he flattered himself that he had learned to hide under an irony imperceptible to the vulgar yet continually giving offence to others by his caustic tongue he seemed to need the tonic of strong emotions and was happiest when devoting himself heart and soul to some person or cause whether a napoleon a mistress or a question of philosophy his great preoccupation was the analysis of the human mind an employment which in later years became a positive detriment he was often led to attribute ulterior motives to his friends a course which only served to render him morbid and unjust while his equally pitiless dissection of his own sensations often robbed them of half their charm even love and war his favorite emotions left him disillusioned asking is that all it amounts to he always had a profound respect for force of character regarding even lawlessness as preferable to apathy but he was implacable towards baseness or vulgarity herein lies perhaps the chief reason for stendhal's ill success in life he would never stoop to obsequiousness or flattery and in avoiding even the semblance of self-interest allowed his fairest chances to pass him by i have little regret for my lost opportunities he wrote in eighteen thirty five in place of ten thousand i might be getting twenty in place of chevalier i might be officer of the legion of honor but i should have had to think three or four hours a day of those platitudes of ambition which are dignified by the name of politics i should have had to commit many base acts a brief but admirable epitome of stendhal's whole life and character aside from his works of fiction stendhal's works may be conveniently grouped under biographies vie de haydn de mozart et de metastase vie de napoleon vie de rossini 
literary and artistic criticism histoire de la peinture en italie racine et shakespeare mélange d'art et de littérature travels rome naples et florence promenade dans rome mémoire d'un touriste and one volume of sentimental psychology his essay sur l'amour to which bourget owes the suggestion of his physiologie de l'amour moderne many of these works merit greater popularity being written in an easy fluent style and relieved by his inexhaustible fund of anecdote and personal reminiscence his books of travel especially are charming causeries full of a sympathetic spontaneity which more than atones for their lack of method his walks in rome is more readable than two-thirds of the books since written on that subject stendhal's present vogue however is due primarily to his novels to which he owes the almost literal fulfilment of his prophecy that he would not be appreciated until eighteen eighty before that date they had been comparatively neglected in spite of balzac's spontaneous and enthusiastic tribute to the chartreuse de parme and the appreciative criticisms of ten and prosper mary may the truth is that stendhal was in some ways a generation behind his time and often has an odd old-fashioned flavor suggestive of marivaux and crebillon fils on the other hand his psychologic tendency is distinctly modern and not at all to the taste of an age which found chateaubriand or madame de stal eminently satisfactory but he appeals strongly to the speculating self-questioning spirit of the present day and zola and bourget in turn have been glad to claim kinship with him stendhal however cannot be summarily labelled and dismissed as a realist or psychologue in the modern acceptation of the term although he was a pioneer in both fields he had a sovereign contempt for literary style or method and little dreamed that he would one day be regarded as the founder of a school it must be remembered that he was a soldier before he was a man of letters and his love of adventure occasionally got the better of his love of logic making his novels a curious mixture of convincing truth and wild romanticism his heroes are singularly like himself a mixture of morbid introspection and restless energy he seems to have taken special pleasure in making them succeed where he had failed in life and when the spirit of the storyteller gets the better of the psychologist he sends them on a career of adventure which puts to shame dumas pere or walter scott and yet stendhal was a born analyst a self-styled observer of the human heart and the real merit of his novels lies in the marvellous fidelity with which he interprets the emotions showing the inner workings of his hero's mind from day to day and multiplying petty details with convincing logic but in his preoccupation for mental conditions he is apt to lose sight of the material side of life and the symmetry of his novels is marred by a meagreness of physical detail and a lack of atmosphere zola has laid his finger upon stendhal's real weakness when he points out that the landscape the climate the time of day the weather nature herself in other words never seems to intervene and exert an influence on his characters and he cites a passage which in point of fact admirably illustrates his meaning the scene from the rouge et noir where julien endeavors to take the hand of madame de renal which he characterizes as a little mute drama of great power adding in conclusion give that episode to an author for whom the milieu exists and he will make the night with its odors its voices its soft voluptuousness play a part in the defeat of the woman and that author will be in the right his picture will be more complete it is this tendency to leave nature out of consideration which gives stendhal's characters a flavor of abstraction and caused sainte beuve to declare in disgust that they were not human beings but ingeniously constructed automatons yet it is unfair to conclude with zola that stendhal was a man for whom the outside world did not exist he was not insensible to the beauties of nature only he looked upon them as a secondary consideration 
after a sympathetic description of the rhone valley he had to add but the interest of a landscape is insufficient in the long run some moral or historical interest is indispensable yet he recognized explicitly the influence of climate and environment upon character and seems to have been sensible of his own shortcomings as an author i abhor material descriptions he confesses in souvenir d'egotisme the ennui of making them deters me from writing novels nevertheless aside from his short chronique and nouvelle and the posthumous la miel which he probably intended to destroy stendhal has left four stories which deserve detailed consideration armance le rouge et le noir la chartreuse de parme and the fragmentary novel lucien lewin as has been justly pointed out by stendhal's sympathetic biographer edouard Rowe, the heroes of the four books are essentially of one type and all more or less faithful copies of himself having in common a need of activity a thirst for love a keen sensibility and an unbounded admiration for napoleon and differing only by reason of the several milieu in which he has placed them the first of these armance appeared in eighteen twenty seven the hero octave is an aristocrat son of the marquis de Malivert, who was very rich before the revolution and when he returned to paris in eighteen fourteen thought himself beggared on an income of twenty or thirty thousand octave is the most exaggerated of all stendhal's heroes a mysterious sombre being a misanthrope before his time coupling with his pride of birth a consciousness of its vanity had heaven made me the son of a manufacturer of cloth i should have worked at my desk from the age of sixteen while now my sole occupation has been luxury i should have had less pride and more happiness ah how i despise myself yet it is part of octave's pretensions to regard himself as superior to love when he discovers his passion for his cousin armance he is overwhelmed with despair i am in love he said in a choked voice i in love great god the object of this reluctant passion armance de sohilaf is a poor orphan dependent upon a rich relative like octave she struggles against her affection but for better reasons the world will look upon me as a lady's maid who has entrapped the son of the family the history of their long and secret struggle against this growing passion complicated by outside incidents and intrigues forms the bulk of the volume at last octave is wounded in a duel and moved by the belief that he is dying they mutually confess their affection octave unexpectedly recovers and as armance about this time receives an inheritance from a distant relative the story promises to end happily but at the last moment he is induced to credit a calumny against her and commits suicide when armance retires to a convent the book is distinctly inferior to his later efforts and m rouault is the first to find hidden beauties in it very different was his next book le rouge et le noir the army and the priesthood which appeared in eighteen thirty and is now recognized as stendhal's masterpiece as its singular name is intended to imply it deals with the changed social conditions which confronted the young men of france after the downfall of napoleon the reaction against war and military glory in favor of the church a topic which greatly occupied stendhal and which is well summed up in the words of his hero julien when bonaparte made himself talked about france was afraid of invasion military merit was necessary and fashionable to-day one sees priests of forty with appointments of a hundred thousand francs three times that of napoleon's famous generals and he concludes the thing to do is to be a priest this julien sorel is the son of a shrewd but ignorant peasant owner of a prosperous sawmill in the small town of verrieres in franche comte he was a small young man of feeble appearance with irregular but delicate features and an aquiline nose who could have divined that that girlish face so pale and gentle 
hid an indomitable resolution to expose himself to a thousand deaths sooner than not make his fortune his only schooling is gained from a cousin an old army surgeon who taught him latin and inflamed his fancy with stories of napoleon and from the aged abbe chelan who grounds him in theology for julien had proclaimed his intention of studying for the priesthood by unexpected good luck his latin earned him an appointment as tutor to the children of monsieur de renal the pompous and purse-proud mayor of verrieres julien is haunted by his peculiar notions of duties which he owes it to himself to perform as steps towards his worldly advancement for circumstances have made him a consummate hypocrite one of these duties is to make love to madame de renal why should he not be loved as bonaparte while still poor had been loved by the brilliant madame de beauharnais his pursuit of the mayor's gentle and inexperienced wife proves only too successful but at last reaches the ears of the abbe chelan whose influence compels julien to leave verrieres and go to the seminary at besancon to finish his theological studies his stay at the seminary was full of disappointment for it was in vain that he made himself small and insignificant he could not please he was too different at last he has a chance to go to paris as secretary to the influential marquis de la mole who interests himself in julien and endeavors to advance him socially the marquis has a daughter mathilde a female counterpart of stendhal's heroes with exalted ideas of duty and a profound reverence for marguerite of navarre who dared to ask the executioner for the head of her lover boniface de la mole executed april thirtieth fifteen seventy four mathilde always assumed mourning on april thirtieth i know of nothing she declared except condemnation to death which distinguishes a man it is the only thing which cannot be bought julien soon conceives it his duty to win mathilde's affections and the love passages which ensue between these two esprits superiors are singular in the extreme they arrive at love only through a complicated intellectual process in which the question of duty either to themselves or to each other is always paramount at last it becomes necessary to confess their affection to the marquis who is naturally furious for the first time in his life this nobleman forgot his manners he overwhelmed him with atrocious insults worthy of a cab-driver perhaps the novelty of these oaths was a distraction what hurts him most is that mathilde will be plain madame sorel and not a duchess but at this juncture the father receives a letter from madame de renal telling of her relations with julien and accusing him of having deliberately won mathilde in order to possess her wealth such baseness the marquis cannot pardon and at any cost he forbids the marriage julien returns immediately to verrieres and finding madame de renal in church deliberately shoots her she ultimately recovers from her wound but julien is nevertheless condemned and guillotined madame de renal dies of remorse while mathilde emulating marguerite de navarre buries julien's head with her own hands the chartreuse de parme although written the same year as the rouge et noir was not published until eighteen thirty nine two years before his death and was judged his best effort he has written the modern prince declared balzac the book which machiavelli would have written if he had been living exiled from italy in the nineteenth century the action takes place at parma and as a picture of court life in a small italian principality with all its jealousies and intrigues the book is certainly a masterpiece but it is marred by the extravagance of its plot the hero fabrice is the younger son of a proud and bigoted milanese nobleman the marquis del dongo who joined a sordid avarice to a host of other fine qualities and in his devotion to the house of austria was implacable towards napoleon fabrice however was a young man susceptible of enthusiasm and on learning of napoleon's return from elba hastened secretly to join him and participated in the battle of waterloo 
this escapade is denounced by his father to the austrian police and on his return fabrice is forced to take refuge in swiss territory about this time his aunt gina the beautiful countess pietronera goes to live at parma and to conceal a love affair with the prime minister mosca marries the old duke of san severina taxis who obligingly leaves on his wedding day for a distant embassy gina has always felt a strong interest for fabrice which later ripens into a passion it is agreed that fabrice shall study for the priesthood and that count mosca will use his influence to have him made archbishop of parma an office frequently held in the past by del dongos unfortunately fabrice is drawn into a quarrel with a certain giletti a low comedy actor whom he kills in self-defence ordinarily the killing of a fellow of giletti's stamp by a del dongo would have been considered a trifling matter but this offence assumes importance through the efforts of a certain political faction to discredit the minister through his protege the situation is further complicated by the prince ernest the fourth who has come under the spell of gina's beauty and furious at finding her obdurate is glad of an opportunity to humiliate her fabrice is condemned to ten years imprisonment in the farnese tower the prince treacherously disregarding his promise of pardon from this point the plot becomes fantastic from his window in the tower fabrice overlooks that of clelia daughter of general fabio conti governor of the prison it is a case of mutual love at first sight and for months the two hold communication by signs above the heads of the passing sentries after his fabulous escape effected by the help of his aunt fabrice is inconsolable and at length returns voluntarily to the tower in order to be near clelia it is not until after the death of the prince that the duchess obtains fabrice's pardon from his son and successor at last clelia dies and fabrice enters the neighboring monastery the chartreuse of parma fabrice's experiences on the battlefield of waterloo where as a raw youth he first smelled powder are recounted with a good deal of realistic detail they suggest a comparison with a book of more recent date devoted to a similar subject stephen crane's red badge of courage though of course the latter does not approach stendhal in artistic self-restraint and mastery over form the remaining novel lucien lewin was left in an unfinished state and thus published after the author's death under the title of le chasseur vert recently they have been republished under the name of lucien lewin with additional material which the editor m jean de mitty claims to have deciphered from almost illegible manuscripts found in the library at grenoble but even without these additions there is enough to show that lucien lewin would have been one of his best efforts second only perhaps to the rouge et noir the hero lucien is the son of a rich financier who was never out of temper and never took a serious tone with his son but cheerfully paid his debts saying a son is a creditor provided by nature out of mere ennui from lack of serious employment lucien enters as sub-lieutenant a regiment of lancers in garrison at nancy he has no illusions about military life in times of peace i shall wage war only upon cigars i shall become the pillager of a military cafe in the gloomy garrison of an ill-paved little town what glory my soul will be well caught when i present myself to napoleon in the next world no doubt he will say you were dying of hunger when you took up this life no general i shall reply i thought i was imitating you his early experiences at nancy his subsequent meeting with and love for madame de chastelet are admirable equally for their moderation and their fidelity since stendhalism has become a cult so much has been written on the subject that a complete bibliography of stendhaliana would occupy several pages aside from the well-known criticisms of balzac taine and saint beuve the most important contributions to the subject are the article by zola in romancier naturaliste that by bourget in essai de psychologie contemporaine and the biography by edouard Lowe in the grand écrivain français 
great french writers series thanks to the zeal of m casimir stryensky a considerable amount of autobiographical material has lately been brought to light journal de stendhal vie de henri brulard and souvenir d'egotisme which together with his correspondence are indispensable for a true knowledge of the man End of section 46. Section 47 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4, Section 47, The Princess Sanseverina's Interview, by Henri Bayle Stendhal. From La Chartreuse de Parme. While Fabrice was gone hunting after love adventures in a small village close by Parma, the fiscal general, Rossi, unaware that he was so near, continued to treat his case as though he had been a liberal. The witnesses for the defense he pretended that he could not find, or rather that he had frightened them off. And finally, after nearly a year of such sharp practice, and about two months after Fabrice's last return to Bologna, on a certain Friday, the Marquise Raversi, intoxicated with joy, stated publicly in her salon that on the following day the sentence which had just been passed upon that little del Dongo would be presented to the prince for signature, and would be approved by him. Shortly afterwards the Duchess learned these remarks of her enemy. The Count must be very poorly served by his agents she said to herself. Only this morning he was sure that sentence could not be passed inside of a week. Perhaps he would not be sorry to have any young grand vicar removed from Parma some day. But, she added, we shall see him come back, and he shall be our archbishop. The duchess rang. Summon all the servants to the waiting room, she said to her valet de chambre. Even the cooks, go and obtain from the officer in command the requisite permit for four post-horses, and see that in less than half an hour these horses are attached to my landau. All her women were soon busied in packing the trunks. The duchess hastily donned a travelling dress, without once sending word to the count. The idea of amusing herself at his expense filled her with joy. "'My friend,' she said to the assembled servants, "'is about to suffer condemnation by default for having had the audacity to defend his life against a madman. It was Giletti who meant to kill him. You have all been able to see how gentle and inoffensive Fabrice's character is.' Justly incensed at this atrocious injury, I am starting for Florence. I shall leave ten years' wages for each of you. If you are unhappy, write to me, and so long as I have a sequin there shall be something for you." The Duchess felt exactly as she spoke, and at her last words the servants burst into tears. She herself had moist eyes. She added in a voice of emotion, Pray to God for me and for Monsieur Fabrice del Dongo, first grand vicar of this diocese, who will be condemned tomorrow morning to the galleys, or what would be less stupid, to the penalty of death. The tears of the servants redoubled, and little by little changed into cries which were very nearly seditious. The Duchess entered her carriage and drove directly to the palace of the Prince. In spite of the untimely hour, she solicited an audience through General Fontana, acting aide de camp. 
she was nowise in full court toilet, a fact which threw that aide-de-camp into a profound stupor. The prince, for his part, was by no means surprised, still less annoyed, at this request for an audience. "'We are going to see tears shed by lovely eyes,' said he, rubbing his hands. "'She is coming to ask for grace. At last that proud beauty has to humble herself. Really, she has been too insupportable with her little independent airs. Those eloquent eyes always seem to be saying to me, at the least thing which annoyed her, Naples or Milan would be an abode offering very different attractions from those of your small town of Parma. True enough, I do not reign over Naples or Milan, but all the same. This fine lady has come to ask me something which depends exclusively upon me, and which she is burning to obtain. I always thought the coming of that nephew would give me some hold about her. While the prince was smiling over his thoughts, and giving himself up to all these agreeable anticipations, he was striding up and down his cabinet, at the door of which General Fontana still remained standing, erect and stiff as a soldier at carry arms. Seeing the prince's flashing eye, and recalling the duchess's travelling dress, he prepared for a dissolution of the monarchy. His confusion knew no bounds when he heard the prince's order, "'Beg, madam, the duchess, to wait a small quarter of an hour.' The general aide-de-camp executed a right-about face, like a soldier on parade. The prince still smiled. "'Fontana is not accustomed,' he said to himself, "'to see our proud duchess kept waiting. The astonished face with which he has gone to tell her to wait that small quarter of an hour will pave the way for those touching tears which this cabinet is about to witness. This small quarter of an hour was delicious to the prince. He paced the floor with a firm and measured step. He reigned. The important thing now is to say nothing which is not perfectly in keeping. It will not do to forget that she is one of the highest ladies of my court. How would Louis Catours have spoken to the princesses, his daughters, when he had occasion to be displeased with them? And his eyes sought the portrait of the great king. The amusing part of the matter was that the prince did not even think of asking himself whether he would show clemency to Fabrice, and how far such clemency would go. Finally, at the end of twenty minutes, the faithful Fontana presented himself anew at the door, but without uttering a word. "'The Duchess San Severina may enter,' cried the prince, with a theatrical air. "'The tears are about to commence,' he told himself, and as if to be prepared for such a spectacle, he drew out his handkerchief. Never had the Duchess appeared so gay and charming. She did not look twenty-five. The poor aide-de-camp, seeing that her light and rapid footstep barely seemed to skim the carpet, was on the point of losing his reason once for all. "'I must crave many pardons of your most serene highness,' said the Duchess in her soft tones of careless gaiety. "'I've taken the liberty of presenting myself in a toilet which is not altogether appropriate.' But your highness has so accustomed me to his favours that I have ventured to hope that he would accord me this additional grace. The duchess spoke quite slowly, as is to give herself time to enjoy the expression of the prince. It was delicious on account of his profound astonishment, and that remnant of grand airs which the pose of his head and arms still betrayed. The prince had remained as if struck by a thunderbolt. From time to time he exclaimed in his high-pitched voice, shrill and perturbed, as though articulating with difficulty, "'How is this? How is this?' After concluding her compliment, the duchess, as though from respect, afforded him ample time to reply. Then she added, 
I venture to hope that your most serene highness will deign to pardon the incongruity of my costume. But as she spoke, her mocking eyes flashed with so bright a gleam that the prince could not meet them. He looked at the ceiling, a sign with him of the most extreme embarrassment. How is this? How is this? he said to himself again. Then by good luck he found a phrase, Madame la Duchesse, uh, pray be seated, and he himself pushed forward a chair with fairly good grace. The Duchess was by no means insensible to this attention, and she moderated the petulance of her glance. How is this? How is this? still repeated the Prince inwardly shifting so uneasily in his chair that one would have said that he could not find a secure position. "'I'm going to take advantage of the freshness of the night to travel post,' resumed the Duchess, "'and as my absence may be of some duration, I was unwilling to leave the territory of your most serene highness without expressing my thanks for all the favours which for five years your highness has deigned to show me at these words the prince at last understood he turned pale it was as man of the world that he felt it most keenly on finding himself mistaken in his predictions then he assumed a grand air in every way worthy of the portrait of louis quatorze which was before his eyes admirable said the duchess to herself there is a man and what is the motive of this sudden departure asked the prince in a fairly firm tone i have contemplated leaving for some time replied the duchess and a slight insult which has been shown to monsieur del dongo who is to be condemned tomorrow to death or to the galleys makes me hasten my departure. And to what city are you going? To Naples, I think. As she arose, she added, It only remains for me to take leave of your most serene highness, and to thank him very humbly for all his earlier kindnesses. She, on her part, spoke with so firm an air that the prince saw clearly that in a few seconds all would be finished. He knew that if a triumphant departure was once effected, all compromise would be impossible. She was not the woman to retrace her steps. He hastened after her. "'But you know very well, Madame la Duchesse,' he said, taking her hand, "'that I have always regarded you with a friendship to which it needed only a word from you to give another name.' but a murder has been committed. There is no way of denying that. I have entrusted the conduct of the case to my best judges." At these words the Duchess drew herself up to her full height. All semblance of respect, or even of urbanity, disappeared in a flash. The outraged woman was clearly revealed, the outraged woman addressing herself to one whom she knows to be of bad faith. It was with an expression of keenest anger and even of contempt that she said to the prince, dwelling upon every word, I am leaving forever the states of your most serene highness, in order that I shall never again hear mentioned the fiscal Rossi or the other infamous assassins who have condemned my nephew and so many others to death. If your most serene highness does not wish to mingle a tinge of bitterness with the last moments which I am to pass with a prince who is both polite and entertaining when he is not misled, I beg him very humbly not to recall the thought of those infamous judges who sell themselves for a thousand crowns or a decoration. The admirable accent, and above all the tone of sincerity with which these words were uttered, made the prince tremble. For an instant he feared to see his dignity compromised by a still more direct accusation. On the whole, however, 
his sensations quickly culminated in one of pleasure. He admired the Duchess, and at this moment her entire person attained a sublime beauty. Heavens, how beautiful she is, the prince said to himself. One may well overlook something in so unique a woman, one whose like perhaps is not to be found in all Italy. Well, with a little diplomacy it might not be altogether impossible to make her mine. There is a wide difference between such a being and that doll of a Marquise Balbi. Besides, the latter steals at least three hundred thousand francs a year from my poor subjects. But did I understand her right? he thought all of a sudden. She said, condemned my nephew and so many others. His anger came to the surface, and it was with a haughtiness worthy of supreme rank that the prince said, "'And what must be done to keep Madame from leaving?' "'Something of which you are not capable,' replied the Duchess, with an accent of the bitterest irony and the most thinly disguised contempt. The prince was beside himself, but thanks to his long practice of the profession of absolute sovereign, he found the strength to resist his first impulse. "'That woman must be mine,' he said to himself. "'I owe myself at least that. Then I must let her perish under my contempt. If she leaves this room, I shall never see her again.' But intoxicated as he was at this moment with wrath and hatred, how was he to find words which would at once satisfy what was due to himself, and induce the Duchess not to desert his court on the instant. A gesture, he thought, is something which can neither be repeated nor turned into ridicule. And he went and placed himself between the Duchess and the door of his cabinet. Just then he heard a slight tapping at this door. Who is this jackanapes? he cried at the top of his lungs. Who is this jackanapes who comes here thrusting his idiotic peasants upon me? Poor General Fontana showed his face, pale and in evident discomfiture, and with the air of a man at his last gasp indistinctly pronounced these words. His Excellency Count Mosca solicits the honor of being admitted. Let him enter, said the prince in a loud voice and as Mosca made his salutation, greeted him with, "'Well, sir, here is Madame the Duchess San Severina, who declares that she is on the point of leaving Parma to go and settle at Naples, and has made me saucy speeches into the bargain.' "'How is this?' said Mosca, turning pale. "'What? Then you knew nothing of this project of departure?' not the first word. At six o'clock I left Madame joyous and contented." This speech produced an incredible effect upon the prince. First he glanced at Mosca, whose growing pallor proved that he spoke the truth, and was in no way the accomplice of the Duchess's sudden freak. "'In that case,' he said to himself, "'I am losing her forever. Pleasure and vengeance, everything is escaping me at once. At Naples she will make epigrams with her nephew Fabrice about the great wrath of the little Prince of Parma. He looked at the Duchess. Anger and the most violent contempt were struggling in her heart. Her eyes were fixed at that moment upon Count Mosca, and the fine lines of that lovely mouth expressed the most bitter disdain. The entire expression of her face seemed to say, Vile courtier! So, thought the prince, after having examined her, I've lost even this means of calling her back to our country. If she leaves the room at this moment she is lost to me, and the Lord only knows what she will say in Naples of my judges, and with that wit and divine power of persuasion with which heaven has endowed her, she will make the whole world believe her. I shall owe her the reputation of being a ridiculous tyrant who gets up in the middle of the night to look under his bed." Then, by an adroit movement, and as if striving to work off his agitation by striding up and down, the prince placed himself anew before the door of his cabinet. The count was on his right, pale, 
unnerved and trembling, so that he had to lean for support upon the back of the chair which the Duchess had occupied at the beginning of the audience, and which the Prince, in a moment of wrath, had hurled to a distance. The Count was really in love. "'If the Duchess goes away, I shall follow her,' he told himself. "'But will she tolerate my company? That is the question.' On the left of the prince stood the duchess, her arms crossed and pressed against her breast, looking at him with superb intolerance. A complete and profound pallor had succeeded the glowing colors which just before had animated those exquisite features. The prince, in contrast with both the others, had a high color and an uneasy air. His left hand played in a nervous fashion with the cross attached to the grand cordon of his order, which he wore beneath his coat. With his right hand he caressed his chin. "'What is to be done?' he said to the Count, not altogether realizing what he was doing himself, but yielding to his habit of consulting the latter about everything. "'Indeed, Most Serene Highness, I know nothing about it.' answered the Count, with the air of a man who was rendering up his final sigh. He could hardly utter the words of his response. His tone of voice gave the Prince the final consolation which his wounded pride had found during the interview, and this slight satisfaction helped him to a phrase which was comforting to his self-esteem. "'Well,' said he, "'I am the most reasonable of all three. I am quite ready to leave my position in the world entirely out of consideration. I am going to speak as a friend, and he added with a charming smile of condescension, a fine imitation of the happy times of Louis Quatorze, as a friend speaking to friends. Madame la Duchesse, he continued, what are we to do to make you forget your untimely resolution? Really, I am at a loss to say replied the Duchess, with a deep sigh. Really, I am at a loss to say. I have such a horror of Parma. There was no attempt at epigram in this speech. One could see that she spoke in all sincerity. The Count turned sharply away from her. His courtier's soul was scandalized. Then he cast a supplicating glance at the Prince. With much dignity and self-possession, the latter allowed a moment to pass, then addressing himself to the Count. "'I see,' said he, "'that your charming friend is altogether beside herself. It is perfectly simple. She adores her nephew.' And turning towards the Duchess, he added with the most gallant glance, and at the same time with the air which one assumes in borrowing a phrase from a comedy. What must we do to find favor in these lovely eyes? The Duchess had time to reflect. She answered in a firm, slow tone, as if she were dictating her ultimatum. His Highness might write me a gracious letter, such as he knows so well how to write. He might say to me that, being by no means convinced of the guilt of Fabrice del Dongo, first grand vicar of the archbishop, he will refuse to sign the sentence when they come to present it to him, and that this unjust procedure shall have no consequence in the future. "'How is that unjust?' cried the prince, colouring to the whites of his eyes, and with renewed anger. "'That is not all,' replied the duchess, with truly Roman pride this very evening and she interposed glancing at the clock it is already a quarter past eleven this very evening his most serene highness will send word to the marquise raversi that he advises her to go into the country to recuperate from the fatigues which she must have suffered from a certain trial which she was discussing in her salon early in the evening the prince strode up and down his cabinet like a madman. "'Did one ever see such a woman?' he exclaimed. "'She is lacking in respect for me.' The Duchess replied with perfect grace, "'I have never in my life dreamed of lacking respect for His Most Serene Highness. 
His Highness has had the extreme condescension to say that he was speaking as a friend to friends. What is more, I have not the smallest desire to remain in Parma, she added, glancing at the Count with the last degree of contempt. This glance decided the Prince, who up to that moment had been quite uncertain, notwithstanding that his words had seemed to imply a promise. He had a fine contempt for words. There were still a few more words exchanged, but at the last Count Mosca received the order to write the gracious note solicited by the Duchess. He omitted the phrase, This unjust procedure shall have no consequence in the future. It is sufficient, said he, said the Count to himself, if the Prince promises not to sign the sentence which is to be presented to him. The Prince thanked him by a glance as he signed. The Count made a great mistake. The Prince was wearied and would have signed the whole. He thought that he was getting out of the scene well, and the whole affair was dominated in his eyes by the thought, If the Duchess leaves, I shall find my court a bore inside of a week. The Count observed that his master corrected the date and substituted that of the next day. He looked at the clock. It indicated almost midnight. The minister saw in this altered date nothing more than a pedantic desire to afford proof of exactitude and good government. As to the exile of the Marquis Raversi, the prince did not even frown. The prince had a special weakness for exiling people. "'General Fontana!' he cried, half opening the door. The general appeared with such an astonished and curious a face that a glance of amusement passed between the Duchess and the Count, and this glance established peace. "'General Fontana,' said the Prince, "'you are to take my carriage, which is waiting under the colonnade. You will go to the house of Madame Raversi and have yourself announced. If she is in bed, you will add that you are my representative, and when admitted to her chamber you will say precisely these words and no others madame the marquise raversi his most serene highness requires that you shall depart before eight o'clock to-morrow morning for your chateau of valleja his highness will notify you when you may return to parma the prince's eyes sought those of the duchess but the latter omitting the thanks which he had expected made him an extremely respectful reverence, and rapidly left the room. "'What a woman!' said the prince, turning towards Count Mosca. End of section 47 Reading by Malone Section 48 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James McAndrew, Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4, Section 48. Clelia Aids Fabrice to Escape by Marie Henri Bayle. From La Chartreuse de Palme. One day Fabrice had been a captive nearly three months, had had absolutely no communication with the outside world, and yet was not unhappy. Grillo had remained hanging about the cell until a late hour of the morning. Fabrice could think of no way of getting rid of him, and was on pins and needles. Half past twelve had struck when at last he was enabled to open the little trap in the hateful shutter. Clelia was standing at the window of the aviary in an expectant attitude, an expression of profound despair on her contracted features. As soon as she saw Fabrice, she signaled to him that all was lost, then hurrying to her piano, and adapting her words to the accompaniment of a recitative from a favorite opera, in accents tremulous with her emotion and the fear of being overheard by the sentry beneath. She sang, Oh, do I see you still alive? 
praise God for his infinite mercy. Barbone the wretch whose insolence you chastised the day of your arrival here disappeared some time ago and for a few days was not seen about the citadel. He returned day before yesterday and since then I have reason to fear he has a design of poisoning you. He has been seen prowling about the kitchen of the palace where your meals are prepared I can assert nothing positively, but it is my maid's belief that his skulking there bodes you no good. I was frightened this morning. Not seeing you at the usual time, I thought you must be dead. Until you hear more from me, do not touch the food they give you. I will try to manage to convey a little chocolate to you. In any case, if you have a cord, or you can make one from your linen. Let it down from your window among the orange trees this evening at nine o'clock. I will attach a stronger cord to it, and with its aid, you can draw up the bread and chocolate I will have in readiness. Fabrice had carefully preserved the bit of charcoal he had found in the stove. Taking advantage of Clelia's more softened mood, he formed on the palm of his hand a number of letters in succession, which taken together made up these words. I love you, and life is dear to me only when I can see you. Above all else, send me paper and a pencil. As Fabrice had hoped and expected, the extreme terror visible in the young girl's face operated to prevent her from terminating the interview on receipt of this audacious message. She only testified her displeasure by her looks. Fabrice had the prudence to add, The wind blows so hard today that I couldn't catch quite all you said. And then, too, the sound of the piano drowns your voice. You were saying something about poison, weren't you? What was it? At these words, the young girl's terror returned in all its violence. She hurriedly set to work to describe with ink a number of large capital letters on the leaves she tore from one of her books, and Fabrice was delighted to see her at last adopt the method of correspondence that he had been vainly advocating for the last three months. But this system, although an improvement on the signals, was less desirable than a regular exchange of letters. So Fabrice constantly feigned to be unable to decipher the words of which she exhibited the component letters. A summons from her father obliged her to leave the aviary. She was in great alarm lest he might come to look for her there. His suspicious nature would have been likely to scent danger in the proximity of his daughter's window to the prisoners. It had occurred to Clelia a short time before, while so anxiously awaiting Fabrice's appearance, that pebbles might be made factors in their correspondence. By wrapping the paper on which the message was written round them and throwing them up, so they should fall within the upper portion of the screen. The device would have worked well unless Fabrice's keeper chanced to be in the room at the time. Our prisoner proceeded to tear one of his shirts into narrow strips, forming a sort of ribbon. Shortly after nine o'clock that evening, he heard a tapping on the boxes of the orange trees under his window. He cautiously lowered his ribbon, and on drawing it up again found attached to its free end a long cord by means of which he hauled up a supply of chocolate, and to his inexpressible satisfaction a package of note paper and a pencil. He dropped the cord again, but to no purpose. Perhaps the sentries on their rounds had approached the orange trees, but his delight was sufficient for one evening. He sat down 
and wrote a long letter to Clelia. Scarcely was it ended when he fastened it to the cord and let it down. For more than three hours he waited in vain for someone to come and take it. Two or three times he drew it up and made alterations in it. If Clelia does not get my letter tonight, he said to himself, well, those ideas of poison are troubling her brain. It is more than likely that tomorrow she will refuse to receive it. The fact was that Clelia had been obliged to drive to the city with her father. Fabrice knew how matters stood when he heard the general's carriage enter the court about half past twelve. He knew it was the general's carriage by the horse's step. What was his delight when shortly after hearing the jingle of the general's spurs as he crossed the esplanade and the rattle of muskets as the sentries presented arms, he felt a gentle tug at the cord, the end of which he had kept wrapped around his wrist. Something heavy was made fast to the cord. Two little jerks notified him to haul up. He had some difficulty in landing the object over a cornice that projected under his window. The article that he had secured at expense of so much trouble proved to be a carafe of water wrapped in a shawl. The poor young man who had been living for so long a time in such complete solitude covered the shawl with rapturous kisses. But words are inadequate to express his emotion when, after so many days of vain waiting, he discovered a scrap of paper pinned to the shawl. Drink no water but this. Satisfy your hunger with chocolate, said this precious missive. Tomorrow I will try to get some bread to you. I will mark the cross to top and bottom with little crosses made with ink. It is a frightful thing to say, but you must know it. I believe others are implicated in Barbone's design to poison you. Could you not have understood that the subject you spoke of in your letter in pencil is displeasing to me? I should not think of writing to you were it not for the great peril that is hanging over us. I have seen the Duchess. She's well, as is the Count but she is very thin. Write no more on that subject which you know of. Would you wish to make me angry? It cost Clelia an effort to write the last sentence, but one of the above note. It was in everybody's mouth in court circles that Madame Sanseverina was manifesting a great deal of friendly interest in Count Baldi, that extremely handsome man and quondam friend of the Marquis Reversi. The one thing certain was that he and the Marquis had separated, and he was alleged to have behaved most shamefully toward the lady who for six years had been to him a mother and given him his standing in society. The next morning, Long before the sun was up, Grillo entered Fabrice's cell, laid down what seemed to be a pretty heavy package, and vanished without saying a word. The package contained a good-sized loaf of bread, plentifully ornamented with little crosses made with a pen. Fabrice covered them with kisses. Why? Because he was in love. Beside the loaf lay a rouleau encased in many thicknesses of paper. It contained 6,000 francs in sequins. Finally, Fabrice discovered a handsome brand new prayer book. These words in a writing he was beginning to be acquainted with were written on the flyleaf. Poison! Beware the water, the wine, everything! Confine yourself to chocolate. Give the untasted dinner to the dog. 
It will not do to show distrust. The enemy would have recourse to other methods. For God's sakes, be cautious, no rashness. Fabrice made haste to remove the telltale writing which might have compromised Clelia and to tear out a number of leaves from the prayer book with which he had made several alphabets. Each letter was neatly formed with powdered charcoal moistened with wine. The alphabets were quite dry when at a quarter to twelve Clelia appeared at the window of the aviary. The main thing now is to persuade her to use them, said Fabrice to himself. But as it happened, fortunately, she had much to say to the young prisoner in regard to the plan to poison him. A dog belonging to one of the kitchen maids had died after eating a dish cooked for Fabrice. So that Clelia not only made no objection to the use of the alphabets, but had herself prepared one in the highest style of art with ink. Under this method, which did not work altogether smoothly at the beginning, the conversation lasted an hour and a half, which was as long as Clelia dared remain in the aviary. Two or three times, when Fabrice trespassed on forbidden ground and alluded to matters that were taboo, she made no answer and walked away to feed her birds. Fabrice requested that when she sent him his supply of water at evening, she would accompany it with one of her alphabets, which, being traced in ink, were legible at a greater distance. He did not fail to write her a good long letter, and was careful to put in it no soft nonsense, at least of a nature to offend. The next day, in their alphabetical conversation, Clelia had no reproach to make him. She informed him that there was less to be apprehended from the poisoners. Barbone had been waylaid and nearly murdered by the lovers of the governor's scullery maids. He would scarcely venture to show his face in the kitchens again. She owned up to stealing a counter-poison from her father. She sent it to him with directions how to use it, but the main thing was to reject at once all food that seemed to have an unnatural taste. Clelia had subjected Don Cesar to a rigorous examination without succeeding in discovering whence came the 6,000 francs received by Fabrice. In any case, it was a good sign. It showed that the severity of his confinement was relaxing. The poison episode had a very favorable effect on our hero's amatory enterprise. Still, he could never extort anything at all resembling a confession of love. But he had the felicity of living on terms of intimacy with Clelia. Every morning, and often at evening also, there was a long conversation with the alphabets. Every evening at nine o'clock, Clelia received a lengthy letter, and sometimes accorded it a few brief words of answer. She sent him the daily paper and an occasional new book. Finally, the rugged Grillo had been so far tamed as to keep Fabrice supplied with bread and wine, which were handed him daily by Clelia's maid. This led honest Grillo to conclude that the governor was not of the same mind as those who had engaged Barbone to poison the young Monseigneur, at which he rejoiced exceedingly, as did his comrades, for there was a saying current in the prison, You only have to look Monseigneur Del Dongo in the face. He's certain to give you money. Fabrice was very pale. Lack of exercise was injuring his health. But for all that, he had never been so happy. 
The tone of conversation between Clelia and him was familiar and often gay. The only moments of the girl's life not beset with dark forebodings and remorse were those spent in conversing with him. She was so thoughtless as to remark one day, I admire your delicacy. Because I am the governor's daughter, you have nothing to say to me of the pleasures of freedom. That's because I am not so absurd as to have aspirations in that direction, replied Fabrice. How often could I hope to see you if I were living in Parma, a free man again, and life would not be worth living if I could not tell you all my thoughts. No, not that exactly. You take precious good care. I don't tell you all my thoughts. But in spite of your cruel tyranny, to live without seeing you daily would be a far worse punishment than captivity. In all my life I was never so happy. Isn't it strange to think happiness was awaiting me in a prison? There is a good deal to be said on that point, rejoined Clelia, with an air that all at once became very serious, almost threatening. What? exclaimed Fabrice in alarm. Am I in danger of losing the small place I've won in your heart, my sole joy in this world? Yes, she replied. Although your reputation in society is that of a gentleman and gallant man, I have reason to believe you are not acting ingenuously toward me. But I don't wish to discuss this matter today. This strange exordium cast an element of embarrassment into the conversation, and tears were often in the eyes of both. End of section 48. Recording by James McAndrew, San Francisco, California. Section 49 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4, Section 49. Selected Poems by Willem Bilderdijk Willem Bilderdijk, 1756-1831 Willem Bilderdijk's personality, even more than his genius, exerted so powerful an influence over his time that it has been said that to think of a Dutchman of the late 18th and early 19th century was to think of Bilderdijk. He stands as the representative of the great literary and intellectual awakening which took place in Holland immediately after that country became part of the French Empire. The history of literature has many examples of how, under political disturbances, the agitated mind has sought refuge in literary and scientific pursuits, and it seemed at that time as if Dutch literature was entering a new golden age. The country had never known better poets, but it was the poetry of the eighteenth century, to quote Ten Brink, ceremonious and stagey. In Herinnering van Meine Kindheit, Reminiscences of My Childhood, a book which is not altogether to be relied upon, Bilderdijk gives a charming picture of his father, a physician in Amsterdam, but speaks of his mother in less flattering terms. He was born in Amsterdam in 1756. At an early age he suffered an injury to his foot, a peasant boy having carelessly stepped on it. Attempts were made to cure him by continued bleedings, and the result was that he was confined to his bed for twelve years. These years laid the foundation of a character lacking in power to love, and to call forth love, 
and developing into an almost fierce hypochondria full of complaints and fears of death in these years however he acquired the information and the wonderful power of language which appear in his sinewy verse one of his poems dated seventeen seventy has been preserved but is principally interesting as a first attempt others written in his twentieth year were prize poems and are sufficiently characterized by their titles kunst wort nur arbeit verkrechen art came through toil in lut der dichtkunst opet steits bestur influence of poetry on statesmanship when he went to leiden in 1780 to study law he was already famous his examinations passed he settled at the hague to practice and in 1785 married katharina rebecca westerfen the following year he published his romance elius in seven songs the romance ultimately became his favorite form of verse but this was not the form now called romance it was the rhymed narrative of the eighteenth century written with endless care and reflection and in his case with so superior a treatment of language that no dutch poet since huygens had approached it the year seventeen ninety five was the turning point in bilderdijk's life he had been brought up in unswerving faith in the cause of the house of orange was a fanatic monarchist and calvinist anti-revolutionary anti-barneveltian anti-levisteinish anti-liberal thus da costa a warm supporter of william v and at the entrance of the french in seventeen ninety five he refused to give his oath of allegiance to the cause of the citizens and the sovereignty of the people he was exiled left the hague and went to london and later to brunswick this was not altogether a misfortune for him nor an unrelieved sorrow he had been more successful as poet than as husband or financier and by his compulsory banishment escaped his financial difficulties and what he considered the chains of his married life in london bilderdijk met his countryman the painter schweichart and with this meeting begins a period of his life over which his admirers would fain draw a veil with schweichart were his two daughters of whom the younger katharina wilhelmina became bilderdijk's first pupil and excepting his intellectual son isaac de costa probably his only one besides her great poetic gifts she possessed beauty and charm she fell in love with her teacher and followed him to brunswick where she lived in his house under the name of frau van husten in spite of this arrangement the poet seems to have considered himself a most faithful husband and he did his best to persuade his wife to join him with their children but naturally without success in eighteen o two the marriage was legally annulled and frau van husten took his name she did her best to atone for the blot on her repute by a self-sacrificing lovableness and was in close sympathy with bilderdijk on the intellectual side like him she was familiar with all the resources of the art of poetry most famous of her poems are the long one rodrigo de Gott, and her touching graceful gedichten vor kinderen poems for children bilderdijk's verses show what she was to him in the shadow of my verdure firmly on my trunk depending grew the tender branch of cedar never longing once to leave me faithfully through rain and tempest modest at my side it rested bearing to my honour solely the first twig it might its own call fair the wreath thy flowers made me for my knotted trunk fast withering and my soul with pride was swelling at the crown of thy young blossoms straight and strong and firmly rooted tall and green thy head arises 
bright the glory of its freshness never yet by aught be dimmed lo my crown to thine now bending only thine the radiant freshness and my soul finds rest and comfort in thy sheltering foliage meanwhile he was no better off materially the duke of brunswick who had known him previously received the famous dutch exile with open arms and granted him a pension but it never sufficed many efforts were made to have his decree of exile annulled but they failed through his own peevish insolence and his boundless ingratitude king louis bonaparte of holland extended his protection to the dissatisfied old poet and all these royal gentlemen were most generous when the house of orange returned to holland william i continued the favor already shown him obtained a high pension for him and when it proved insufficient supplemented it with gifts in this way bilderdijk's income in the year eighteen sixteen amounted to twenty thousand gold pieces that this should be sufficient to keep the wolf from the door in a city like amsterdam bilderdijk thought too much to expect and consequently left in great indignation and went to leyden in eighteen seventeen but these personal troubles in no way interfered with his talent on the contrary the history of literature has seldom known so great an activity and productiveness all in all his works amounted to almost a hundred volumes what he accomplished during his stay in germany was almost incredible he gave lessons to exiled dutch in a great variety of branches he saw volume upon volume through print he wrote his famous het weiterleven country life after delille he translated fingal after ossian he wrote vaderlandsche orangesucht patriotic love for orange after his return to holland he wrote de Zichte der Gelehrten, the disease of genius eighteen seventeen leyden's camp leyden's battle eighteen o eight and the first five songs of der Untergang der erste welt destruction of the first world eighteen o nine probably his masterpiece moreover the dramas floris fifth willem van holland and kunak the volumes published between eighteen fifteen and eighteen nineteen bore the double signature willem and wilhelmina katharina bilderdijk but it was as though time had left him behind the younger holland shook its head over the old gentleman of the past century with his antagonism for the poetry of the day and his rage against shakespeare and the latter's puerile king lear for to bilderdijk even more than to voltaire shakespeare was an abomination then in eighteen thirty he received the severest blow of his life katharina wilhelmina died this happened in harlem whither he had gone in eighteen twenty seven with this calamity his strength was broken and his life at an end he followed her in eighteen thirty one he was in every way a son of the eighteenth century he began as a didactic and patriotic poet and might at first be considered a follower a jacob katz he became principally a lyric poet but his lyric knew no deep sentiment no suppressed feeling its greatness lay in its rhetorical power his ode to napoleon may therefore be one of the best to characterize his genius when he returned to his native country after eleven years exile with heart and mind full of holland it was old holland he sought and did not find he did not understand young holland in spite of this his fame and powerful personality had an attraction for the young but it was the attraction of a past time the fascination of the glorious ruin young holland wanted freedom individual independence and this bilderdijk considered a misfortune 
one should not let children women and nations know that they possess other rights than those naturally theirs this matter must be a secret between the prince and his heart and reason to the masses it ought always to be kept as hidden as possible the new age which had made its entry with the cry of liberty would not tolerate such sentiments and he stood alone a powerful demonic but incomprehensible spirit aside from his fame as a poet he deserves to be mentioned as jacob grimm's correspondent as philologist philosopher and theologian ode to beauty child of the unborn dost thou bend from him we in the day-beam see whose music with the breeze doth blend to feel thy presence is to be thou our soul's brightest effluence thou who in heaven's light to earth dost bow a spirit midst unspiritual clods beauty who bears the stamp profound of him with all perfection crowned thine image thine alone is god's how shall i catch a single ray thy glowing hand from nature wakes steal from the ether waves of day one of the notes thy world harp shakes escape that miserable joy which dust and self with darkness cloy fleeting and false and like a bird cleave the air-path and follow thee through thine own vast infinity where rolls the almighty's thunder word perfect thy brightness in heaven's sphere where thou dost vibrate in the bliss of anthems ever echoing there that that is life not this not this there in the holy holy row and not on earth so deep below thy music unrepressed may speak stay shrouded in that holy place enough that we have seen thy face and kissed the smiles upon thy cheek we stretch our eager hands to thee and for thine influence pray in vain the burden of mortality hath bent us neath its heavy chain and there are fetters forged by art and science cold hath chilled the heart and wrapped thy godlike crown in night on waxen wings they soar on high and when most distant deem thee nigh they quench thy torch and dream of light child of the unborn joy for thou shinest in every heavenly flame breathest in all the winds that blow while self-conviction speaks thy name o oh, let one glance of thine illume the longing soul that bids thee come and make me feel of heaven like thee shake from thy torch one blazing drop and to my soul all heaven shall ope and i dissolve in melody translated in westminster review from the ode to napoleon poesy nay too long art silent seize now the lute why dost thou tarry let sword the universe inherit noblest as prize of war be glory let thousand mouths sing hero actions e'en so the glory is not uttered earth gods and endless life ambrosial find they alone in song enchanting watch thou with care thy heedless fingers striking upon the lyre so godlike hold thou in check thy lightning flashes that where they chance to fall are blighting he who on eagle's wing soars skyward must at the sun's bright barrier tremble frederick though great in royal throning well may amaze the earth and heaven 
when clothed by thunder and the leaven swerves he before the hero's fanfare pause then imagination portals hiding the future ope your doorways earth the blood drenched yields palms and olives sword that hath cleft on bone and muscle spear that hath drunk the hero's life-blood furrow the soil as spade and ploughshare blast that alarm from blaring trumpets laws of fair peace anon shall herald heaven's shame at last its end attaining earth see o oh, see your sceptres bowing gone is the eagle once majestic on us a cycle new is dawning look from the skies it hath descended o oh, potent princes ye the throne-born see what almighty will hath destined quit ye your seats in low adoring set all the earth with you a-kneeling or as the free-born men should perish sink in grave with crown and kingdom glorious in lucent rays already brighter than gold a sceptre shineth no warring realm shall dim its lustre no earth-storm veil its blaze to dimness can it be true that centuries ended god's endless realm the hebrew quickens lifting its horns though not for always shines in the east the sun like noonday shall hagar's wandering sons be heartened after the moslem's haughty baiting speed toward us speed o oh, days so joyous even if blood your cost be reckoned speed as in heaven's gracious favour bringing again heaven's earthly kingdom yea though through waters deep we struggle joining in fight with seas of troubles suffer we bear we hope be silent on us shall dawn a coming daybreak with it the world of men be happy translated in the meter of the original by e Arrhenius stevenson for the world's best literature slighted love an oriental romance splendid rose the star of evening and the gray dusk was a fading o'er it with a hand of mildness now the night her veil was drawing abin said valiant soldier from medina's ancient gateway to the meadows rich with blossoms walked in darkest mood of musing where the Godolete's wild waves foaming wander through the flat lands, where within the harbor's safety loves to wait the weary seamen. Neither hero's mood nor birth pride eased his spirit of its suffering, for his youth's betrothed, Sobeida. She it was who caused him anguish. Faithless had she him forsaken, she sometime his best beloved left him though already parted by strange fate from realm and airship oh that destiny he girds not strength it gave him hero courage added to his lofty spirit touches of nobler feeling tis that she ill-starred one leaves him takes the hand so wrinkled of that old man Sevilla's conqueror into the night along the river aben said now forth rushes loudly to the rocky limits echo bears his lamentations faithless maid more faithless art thou than the sullen water harder thou than even the hardened bosom of yon rigid rock wall ah bethinkest thou sobeida still upon our solemn love oath how thy heart this hour so faithless once belonged to me me only canst thou yield thy heart thy beauty to that old man dead to love thoughts wilt thou try to love the tyrant lacking love despite his treasure dost thou deem the sands of desert higher than our virtue honour 
allah grant them that he hate thee that thou lovest yet another that thou soon thyself surrender to the scorned one's bitter feeling rest may night itself deny thee and may day to thee be terror be thy face before thy husband as a thing of nameless loathing may his eye avoid thee ever flee the splendour of thy beauty may he ne'er in gladsome gathering stretch his hand to thee for partner never gird himself with girdle which for him thy hand embroidered let his heart thy love forsaking in another love be fettered the love tokens of another may his scutcheon flame in battle while behind thy grated windows year by year away thou mournest to thy rival may he offer prisoners that his hand has taken may the trophies of his victory on his knees to her be proffered may he hate thee and thy heart's faith to him be but thing accursed these things i and more still be thy cure for all my sting and sorrow silent now goes aben said unto zeres in the midnight dazzling shone the palace lighted festal for the loathsome marriage richly robed moors were standing neath the shimmer of the tapers on the jubilant procession of the marriage part proceeded in the path stands aben said frowning as the bridegroom nears him strikes the lance into his bosom with the rage of sharpest vengeance gainst the heaven rings a loud cry those at hand their swords are bearing but he rushes through the weapons and in safety gains his own hearth translation through the german in the meter of the original by e irenaeus stevenson the village schoolmaster from country life there he sits his figure and his rigid bearing let us know most clearly what is his ideal confidence in self in his lofty standing there too add conceit in his own great value certain he can read yes and write and cipher in the almanac no star groups a stranger in the church he faithful leads the pious chorus drums the catechism into young ones noddles disputation to him's half the joy of living even though he's beaten he will not give over watch him when he talks in how learned fashion drags on every word spares no play of muscle ah what pains he takes to forget no syllable consonants and vowels rightly weighed and measured often is he too of this and that a poet every case declines with precisest conscience knows the history of church and state together every churchly light of pedant deeds the record all the village world speechless stands before him asking how can one brain be so ruled by wisdom sharply too he looks down on one's transgressions gainst his judgment stern tears and prayers avail not he appears one glance from a god that glance comes at a flash decides what the youngster's fate is at his will a crowd runs at his beck it parteth doth he smile all frolic doth he frown all cower by a tone he threatens gives rewards meets justice absent though he be every pupil dreads him for he sees hears knows everything that's doing on the urchin's forehead he can see it written he divines who laughs idles yawns or chatters who plays tricks on others or in prayer times lazy with its shoots the birch rod lying there beside him knows how all misdeeds in a trice are settled 
surely by these traits you've our dwarf dionysius footnote compare goldsmith's famous portrait in the deserted village translation through the german in the meter of the original by e Irenaeus stevenson for the world's best literature end of section forty nine recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section fifty of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. Section 50. Selected Poems by Beyond. Bion, 275 B.C. Of Bion, the second of the Sicilian Idolists, of whom Theocritus was the first, and Moschus the third and last, but little knowledge and few remains exist. He was born near Smyrna, says Suidas, and from the elegy on his death, attributed to his pupil Moschus, we infer that he lived in Sicily and died there of poison. Say that Bion the herdsman is dead, says the Threnody, appealing to the Sicilian muses, and that song has died with Bion, and the Dorian minstrelsy hath perished. Poison came, Bion, to thy mouth. What mortal so cruel as to mix poison for thee? As Theocritus is also mentioned in the Idyll, Bion is supposed to have been his contemporary, and to have flourished about 275 B.C. Compared with Theocritus, his poetry is inferior in simplicity and naivete, and declines from the type which Theocritus had established for the outdoor, open-field Idyll with bion bucolics first took on the air of the study although at first this art and affectation were rarely discernible they finally led to the mould of brass in which for centuries italian and english pastorals were cast and later to the complete devitalizing which marks english pastoral poetry in the eighteenth century with the one exception of Alan Ramsay's Gentle Shepherd. Theocritus had sung with genuine feeling of trees and wandering winds, of flowers and the swift mountain stream. His poetry has atmosphere. It is vital with sunlight, color, and the beauty which is cool and calm and true. Although Bion's poems possess elegance and sweetness and abound in pleasing imagery, they lack the naturalness of the idyls of Theocritus. Reflection has crept into them. They are, in fact, love songs, with here and there a tinge of philosophy. The most famous as well as the most powerful and original of Bion's poems remaining to us is the Threnody upon Adonis. It was, doubtless, composed in honor of the rites with which Greek women celebrated certain Eastern festivals, for the worship of Adonis still lingered among them mixed with certain Syrian customs. Tammuz came next behind, whose annual wound in Lebanon allured the Syrian damsels to lament his fate in amorous ditties all a summer's day, while smooth Adonis from his native rock ran purple to the sea, supposed with blood of Tammuz yearly wounded. Tammuz is identified with Adonis. We came to a fair large river, 
writes an old English traveller, doubtless the ancient river Adonis, which at certain seasons of the year, especially about the feast of Adonis, is of a bloody colour, which the heathens looked upon as proceeding from a kind of sympathy in the river for the death of Adonis, who was killed by a wild boar in the mountains out of which the stream issues. Something like this we saw actually come to pass, for the water was stained to a surprising redness, and, as we observed in travelling, had discoloured the sea a great way into a reddish hue, occasioned doubtless by a sort of minium or red earth washed into the river by the violence of the rain. The poem is coloured by the eastern nature of its subject, and its rapidity, vehemence, warmth, and unrestraint are greater than the strict canon of Greek art allows. It is noteworthy, aside from its varied beauties, because of its fine abandonment to grief and its appeal for recognition of the merits of the dead youth it celebrates. Beyond's threnody has undoubtedly become a criterion and given the form to some of the more famous songs of tears. The laudatory elegy of Moschus for his master, we say of Moschus, although Arens in his recension includes the lament under in Certorum Idilia at the end of Moschire Requiae, follows it faithfully. Milton, in his great ode of Lycidas, does not depart from the Greek lines, and Shelley, lamenting Keats in his Adonais, reverts still more closely to the first master, adding perhaps an element of artificiality one does not find in other threnodies. The broken and extended form of Tennyson's celebration of Arthur Hallam takes it out of a comparison with the Greek, but the monody of Thyrsus, Matthew Arnold's commemoration of Cloth, approaches nearer the Greek. Yet no other lament has the energy and rapidity of Beyond's. The refrain, the insistent repetition of the words, I wail for Adonis, alas, for Cypris, full of pathos and unspoken irrepressible woe, is used only by his pupil Moschus, though hinted at by Milton. The peculiar rhythm, the passion and delicate finish of the song have attracted a number of translators, among whose versions Mrs. Browning's The Lament for Adonis is considered the best. The subjoined version in the Spenserian stanza by Anna C. Brackett follows its model closely in its directness and fervor of expression, and has moreover in itself genuine poetic merit. The translation of a fragment of Hesperos is that of J. A. Simmons. Beyond's fluent and elegant versification invites study, and his few idyls and fragments have at various times been turned into English, by Fox, to be found in Chalmers works of English poets, Powell, Banks, Chapman, and others. Threnody. I weep for Adonais, he is dead. Dead Adonais lies, and mourning all the loves wail round his fair low-lying head. O Cypris, sleep no more, let from thee fall thy purple vestments, hearst thou not the call? Let fall thy purple vestments, lay them by. Ah, smite thy bosom, and in sable pall send shivering through the air thy bitter cry, for Adonais dead, while all the loves reply. I weep for Adonais, weep the loves. Lo, on the mountains beauteous lies he there, and languid through his lips the faint breath moves, and black the blood creeps o'er his smooth thigh where the boar's white tooth the whiter flesh must tear. 
glazed grow his eyes beneath the eyelids wide fades from his lips the rose and dies despair the clinging kiss of cypris at his side alas he knew not that she kissed him as he died i wail responsive wail the loves with me ah cruel cruel is that wound of thine but cypris heart wound aches more bitterly the oreads weep thy faithful hounds low whine but cytherea's unbound tresses fine float on the wind where thorns her white feet wound along the oaken glades drops blood divine she calls her lover he all crimsoned round his fair white breast with blood hears not the piteous sound alas for cytherea wail the loves with the beloved dies her beauty too o fair was she the goddess born of doves while adonais lived but now so true her love no time her beauty can renew deep-voiced the mountains mourn the oaks reply and springs and rivers murmur sorrow through the passes where she goes the cities high and blossoms flush with grief as she goes desolate by alas for cytherea he hath died the beauteous adonais he is dead and echo sadly back is dead replied alas for cypris stooping low her head and opening wide her arms she piteous said o oh, stay a little adonais mine of all the kisses ours since we were wed but one last kiss oh give me now and twine thine arms close till i drink the latest breath of thine so will i keep the kiss thou givest me e'en as it were thyself thou only best since thou o adonais far dost flee o stay a little leave a little rest and thou wilt leave me and wilt be the guest of proud persephone more strong than i all beautiful obeys her dread behest and i a goddess am and cannot die o thrice beloved listen mak'st thou no reply then dies to idle air my longing wild as dies a dream along the paths of night and cytherea widowed is exiled from love itself and now an idle sight the loves sit in my halls and all delight my charmed girdle moves is all undone why wouldst thou rash one seek the maddening fight why beauteous wouldst thou not the combat shun thus cytherea and the loves weep all as one alas for cytherea he is dead her hopeless sorrow breaks in tears that rain down over all the fair beloved head like summer showers or wind down beaten grain they flow as fast as flows the crimson stain from out the wound deep in the stiffening thigh and lo in roses red the blood blooms fair and where the tears divine have fallen close by spring up anemones and stir all tremblingly i weep for adonais he is dead no more o cypris weep thy wooer here behold a bed of leaves lay down his head as if he slept as still as fair as dear in softest garments let his limbs appear as when on golden couch his sweetest sleep he slept the livelong night thy heart anear o beautiful in death though sad he keep no more to wake when morning o'er the hills doth creep and over him the freshest flowers fling ah me all flowers are withered quite away and drop 
their petals wan yet perfumes bring and sprinkle round and sweetest balsams lay nay perish perfumes since thine shall not stay in purple mantle lies he and around the weeping loves his weapons disarray his sandals loose with water bathe his wound and fan him with soft wings that move without a sound the loves for cytherea raise the wail hymen from quenched torch no light can shake his shredded wreath lies withered all and pale his joyous song alas harsh discords break and saddest wail of all the graces wake the beauteous adonais he is dead and sigh the muses stay but for our sake yet would he come persephone is dead cease cypris sad the days repeat their faithful tread paraphrase of anna c brackett in journal of speculative philosophy hesper hesper thou golden light of happy love hesper thou holy pride of purple eve moon among stars but star beside the moon hail friend and since the young moon sets to-night too soon below the mountains lend thy lamp and guide me to the shepherd whom i love no theft i purpose no wayfaring man belated would i watch and make my prey love is my goal and love how fair it is when friend meets friend soul in the silent night thou knowest hesper End of section 50section 51 of the library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 4 section 51 essay on augustine barrow by charles dudley warner those to whom the discovery of a relishing new literary flavor means the permanent annexation of a new tract of enjoyment have not forgotten what happened in eighteen eighty five a slender sixteen month volume entitled obiter dicta containing seven short literary and biographic essays came out in that year anonymous and unheralded to make such way as it might among a book realm generation it had no novelty of subject to help it to a hearing the themes were largely the most written out in all seeming that could have been selected a few great orthodox names on which opinion was closed and analysis exhausted browning carroll charles lamb and john henry newman are indeed very beacons to warn off the sadded bookman a paper on benvenuto cellini one on actors and one on falstaff closed the list yet a few weeks made it the literary event of the day among epicures of good reading the word swiftly passed along that there was a new sensation of unusually satisfying charm and freshness it was a tour de force like the innocence abroad a journey full of new sights over the most tailed and beaten of tracks the triumph was all the author's own two years later came another volume as a second series of the same general character but superior to the first among the subjects of its eleven papers were milton pope johnson burke lamp again and immersion with some general essays including that on the office of literature given below in eighteen ninety two appeared rajudicate really a third volume of the same series and perhaps even richer in matter and more acute and original in thought 
Its first two articles, prepared as lectures on Samuel Richardson and Edward Gibbon, are indeed his high water, mark in both substance and style. Copper, George Borrow, Newman again, Lamb a third time, Hazlitt, Matthew Arnold, and St. Beuve are brought in, and some excellent literary miscellanea. A companion volume called Man, Woman, and Books is disappointing because composed wholly of short newspaper articles. Mr. Beryl's special quality needs space to make itself felt. He needs a little time to get up steam, a little room to unpack his wares. He is no pastel writer who can say his say in a paragraph and runs dry in two. Hence, his snippy editorials do him no justice. He is obliged to stop every time just as he is getting ready to say something worthwhile. They are his, and therefore readable and judicious, but give no idea of his best powers. He has also written a life of Charlotte Brock, but he holds his place in the front rank of recent essayists by the three arbiter dicta and rejudicate, volumes of manly, luminous, penetrating essays full of racy humor and sudden wit, of a generous appreciativeness that seeks always for the vital principle which gave the writer his hold on men, still more of a warm humanity and a sure instinct for all the higher and finer things of the spirit which never fail to strike chords in the hearts as well as the brain. No writer's work leaves a better taste in the mouth. He makes us think better of the world, of righteousness of ourselves. Yet no writer is less of a Puritan or a Philistine. None writes with less of pragmatic prose or a less obtrusive load of positive fact. He scorns such overladen pedantry and never loses a chance to lash it. He tells us what he has never been inside the reading room of the British Museum and expounds no theory save the unworthy one that literature ought to please. He says the one question about a book which is part of literature is, does it read, that no one is under any obligation to read anyone else's book, and therefore it is a writer's business to make himself welcome to readers, that he does not care whether an author was happy or not. He wants the author to make him happy. He puts his theory in practice. He makes himself welcome as a companion, at once stimulating and restful, of humane spirit and elevated ideals, of digested knowledge and original thought, of an insight which is rarely other than kindly and deep humor which never lapses into cynicism. Mr. Beryl helps to justify Walter Baghard's dictum that the only man who can write books well is one who knows practical life well. But still there are congruities in all things, and one feels a certain shock of incongruity in finding that this man of books and purveyor of light genial book talk, who can hardly write a line without giving it a quality of real literary savour, is a prominent lawyer and a member of parliament and has written a book which ranks among recognized legal authorities. This is a series of lectures delivered in 1896 and collected into a volume on the duties and liabilities of trustees. But some of the surprise vanishes on reading the book, even as Alice in Wonderland shows on every page the work of a logician trained to use words precisely and criticize their misuse. So in exactly the opposite way that this book is full of shrewd judgment, the knowledge of life, and even the delightful humor which form so much of Beryl's best equipment for a man of letters. Mr. Beryl's work is not merely good reading, but is a mental clarifier and tonic. We are much better critics of other writers through his criticisms on his selected subjects. After every reading of Arbiter Dicta, we feel ashamed of crass and petty prejudice 
and the face of his lessons in disregarding surface mannerisms for the sake of vital qualities only in one case does he lose his impartiality he so objects to treating immersion with fairness that he even goes out of his way to berate his idol matthew arnold for setting immersion aloft but what he says of george borrow is vastly more true of himself he is one of the writers we cannot afford to be angry with end of section fifty one section fifty two of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by leonard wilson library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four section fifty two selected excerpts by augustine birrell part one dr johnson criticism writes johnson in the sixtieth idler is a study by which men grow important and formidable at a very small expense the power of invention has been conferred by nature upon few and the labour of learning those sciences which may by mere labour be obtained is too great to be willingly endured but every man can exert such judgment as he has upon the works of others and he whom nature has made weak and idleness keeps ignorant may yet support his vanity by the name of a critic to proceed with our task by the method of comparison is to pursue a course open to grave objection yet it is forced upon us when we find as we lately did a writer in the times newspaper in the course of a not very discriminating review of mr frude's recent volumes casually remarking as if it admitted of no more doubt than the day's price of consoles that carlyle was a greater man than johnson it is a good thing to be positive to be positive in your opinions and selfish in your habits is the best recipe if not for happiness at all events for that far more attainable commodity comfort with which we are acquainted a noisy man sang poor cooper who could not bear anything louder than the hissing of a tea-urn a noisy man is always in the right and a positive man can seldom be proved wrong still in literature it is very desirable to preserve a moderate measure of independence and we therefore make bold to ask whether it is as plain as the old hill of howth that carlyle was a greater man than johnson is not the precise contrary the truth no abuse of carlyle need be looked for here or from me when a man of genius and of letters happens to have any striking virtues such as purity temperance honesty the novel task of dwelling on them has such attraction for us that we are content to leave the elucidation of his faults to his personal friends and to stern unbending moralists like mr edmund yates and the world newspaper to love carlyle is thanks to mr frude's superhuman ideal of friendship a task of much heroism almost meriting a pension still it is quite possible for the candid and truth-loving soul but a greater than johnson he most certainly was not there is a story in boswell of an ancient beggar-woman who whilst asking an alms of the doctor described herself to him in a lucky moment for her pocket as an old struggler johnson his biographer tells us was visibly affected the phrase stuck to his memory and was frequently applied to himself i too so he would say am an old struggler so too in all conscience was carlyle the struggles of johnson have long been historical those of carlyle have just become so we are interested in both to be indifferent would be inhuman 
both men had great endowments tempestuous natures hard lots they were not amongst dame fortune's favorites they had to fight their way what they took they took by storm but and here is a difference indeed johnson came off victorious carlyle did not boswell's book is an arch of triumph through which as we read we see his hero passing into eternal fame to take up his place with those dead but sceptred sovereigns who still rule our spirits from their urns froude's book is a tomb over which the lovers of carlyle's genius will never cease to shed tender but regretful tears we doubt whether there is in english literature a more triumphant book than boswell's what materials for tragedy are wanting johnson was a man of strong passions unbending spirit violent temper as poor as a church mouse and as proud as the proudest of church dignitaries endowed with the strength of a coal heaver the courage of a lion and the tongue of dean swift he could knock down booksellers and silence bargees he was melancholy almost to madness radically wretched indolent blinded diseased poverty was long his portion not that genteel poverty that is sometimes behindhand with its rent but that hungry poverty that does not know where to look for its dinner against all these things had this old struggler to contend over all these things did this old struggler prevail over even the fear of death the giving up of this intellectual being which had haunted his gloomy fancy for a lifetime he seems finally to have prevailed and to have met his end as a brave man should carlyle writing to his wife says and truthfully enough the more the devil worries me the more i wring him by the nose but then if the devil's was the only nose that was wrung in the transaction why need carlyle cry out so loud after buffeting one's way through the storm-tossed pages of froude's carlyle in which the universe is stretched upon the rack because food disagrees with man and cocks crow with what thankfulness and reverence do we read once again the letter in which johnson tells mrs thrale how he has been called to endure not dyspepsia or sleeplessness but paralysis itself on monday i sat for my picture and walked a considerable way with little inconvenience in the afternoon and evening i felt myself light and easy and began to plan schemes of life thus i went to bed and in a short time waked and sat up as has long been my custom when i felt a confusion in my head which lasted i suppose about half a minute i was alarmed and prayed god that however much he might afflict my body he would spate my understanding soon after i perceived that i had suffered a paralytic stroke and that my speech was taken from me i had no pain and so little dejection in this dreadful state that i wondered at my own apathy and considered that perhaps death itself when it should come would excite less horror than seems now to attend it in order to rouse the vocal organs i took two drams i then went to bed and strange as it may seem i think slept when i saw light it was time i should contrive what i should do though god stopped my speech he left me my hand i enjoyed a mercy which was not granted to my dear friend lawrence who now perhaps overlooks me as i am writing and rejoices that i have what he wanted my first note was necessarily to my servant who came in talking and could not immediately comprehend why he should read what i put into his hands how this will be perceived by you i know not i hope you will sympathize with me 
but perhaps my mistress gracious mild and good cries is he dumb tis time he should i suppose you may wish to know how my disease is treated by the physicians they put a blister upon my back and two from my ear to my throat one on a side the blister on the back has done little and those on the throat have not risen i bullied and bounced it sticks to our last sand and compelled the apothecary to make his salve according to the edinburgh dispensatory that it might adhere better i have now two on my own prescription they likewise give me salt of hartshorn which i take with no great confidence but i am satisfied that what can be done is done for me i am almost ashamed of this querulous letter but now it is written let it go this is indeed tonic and bark for the mind if irritated by a comparison that ought never to have been thrust upon us we ask why it is that the reader of boswell finds it as hard to help loving johnson as the reader of froude finds it hard to avoid disliking carlyle the answer must be that whilst the elder man of letters was full to overflowing with the milk of human kindness the younger one was full to overflowing with something not nearly so nice and that whilst johnson was preeminently a reasonable man reasonable in all his demands and expectations carlyle was the most unreasonable mortal that ever exhausted the patience of nurse mother or wife of dr johnson's affectionate nature nobody has written with nobler appreciation than carlyle himself perhaps it is this divine feeling of affection throughout manifested that principally attracts us to johnson a true brother of men is he and filial lover of the earth the day will come when it will be recognized that carlyle as a critic is to be judged by what he himself corrected for the press and not by splenetic entries in diaries or whimsical extravagances in private conversation of johnson's reasonableness nothing need be said except that it is patent everywhere his wife's judgment was a sound one he is the most sensible man i ever met as for his brutality of which at one time we used to hear a great deal we cannot say of it what hookham frere said of lander's immorality that it was mere imaginary classicality wholly devoid of criminal reality it was nothing of the sort dialectically the great doctor was a great brute the fact is he had so accustomed himself to wordy warfare that he lost all sense of moral responsibility and cared as little for men's feelings as a napoleon did for their lives when the battle was over the doctor frequently did what no soldier ever did that i have heard tell of apologized to his victims and drank wine or lemonade with them it must also be remembered that for the most part his victims sought him out they came to be tossed and gored and after all are they so much to be pitied they have our sympathy and the doctor has our applause i am not prepared to say with the simpering fellow with weak legs whom david copperfield met at mr waterbrook's dinner-table that i would sooner be knocked down by a man with blood than picked up by a man without any but argumentatively speaking i think it would be better for a man's reputation to be knocked down by dr johnson than picked up by mr froude johnson's claim to be the best of our talkers cannot on our present materials be contested for the most part we have only talk about other talkers johnson's is matter of record carlyle no doubt was a great talker 
no man talked against talk or broke silence to praise it more eloquently than he but unfortunately none of it is in evidence all that is given us is a sort of combination service writ large we soon weary of it man does not live by curses alone an unhappier prediction of a boy's future was surely never made than that of johnson's by his cousin mr cornelius ford who said to the infant samuel you will make your way the more easily in the world as you are content to dispute no man's claim to conversation excellence and they will therefore more willingly allow your pretensions as a writer unfortunate mr ford the man never breathed whose claim to conversation excellence dr johnson did not dispute on every possible occasion whilst just because he was admittedly so good a talker his pretensions as a writer have been occasionally slighted johnson's personal character has generally been allowed to stand high it however has not been submitted to recent tests to be the first to smell a fault is the pride of the modern biographer boswell's artless pages afford useful hints not lightly to be disregarded during some portion of johnson's married life he had lodgings first at greenwich afterwards at hampstead but he did not always go home o nights sometimes preferring to roam the streets with that vulgar ruffian savage who was certainly no fit company for him he once actually quarrelled with tetty who despite her ridiculous name was a very sensible woman with a very sharp tongue and for a season like stars they dwelt apart of the real merits of this dispute we must resign ourselves to ignorance the materials for its discussion do not exist even croker could not find them neither was our great moralist as sound as one would have liked to see him in the matter of the payment of small debts when he came to die he remembered several of these outstanding accounts but what assurance have we that he remembered them all one sum of ten pounds he sent across to the honest fellow from whom he had borrowed it with an apology for its delay which since it had extended over a period of twenty years was not superfluous i wonder whether he ever repaid mr gilly the guinea he once borrowed of him to give to a very small boy who had just been apprenticed to a printer if he did not it was a great shame that he was indebted to sir joshua in a small loan is apparent from the fact that it was one of his three dying requests to that great man that he should release him from it as of course the most amiable of painters did the other two requests it will be remembered were to read his bible and not to use his brush on sundays the good sir joshua gave the desired promises with a full heart for these two great men loved one another but subsequently discovered the sabbatical restriction not a little irksome and after a while resumed his former practice arguing with himself that the doctor really had no business to extract any such promise the point is a nice one and perhaps ere this the two friends have met and discussed it in the elysian fields if so i hope the doctor grown angelical kept his temper with the mild shade of reynolds better than on the historical occasion when he discussed with him the question of strong drinks against garrick johnson undoubtedly cherished a smouldering grudge which however he never allowed any one but himself to fan into flame his pique was natural derrick had been his pupil at ediel near lichfield they had come up to town together with an easy united fortune of fourpence current coin of the realm garrick soon had the world at his feet and garnered golden grain johnson became famous too but remained poor and dingy 
Derrick surrounded himself with what only money can buy, good pictures and rare books. Johnson cared nothing for pictures. How should he? He could not see them. But he did care a great deal about books, and the pernickety little player was chary about lending his splendidly bound rarities to his quondam preceptor. Our sympathies in this matter are entirely with Garrick. Johnson was one of the best men that ever lived, but not to lend books to. Like Lady Slattern, he had a most observant thumb. But Garrick had no real cause for complaint. Johnson may have soiled his folios and sneered at his trade. But in life Johnson loved Garrick, and in death embalmed his memory in a sentence which can only die with the English language. I am disappointed by that stroke of death which has eclipsed the gaiety of nations and impoverished the public stock of harmless pleasure. Will it be believed that puny critics have been found to quarrel with this colossal compliment on the poor pretext of its falsehood? Garrick's death urged these dullards could not possibly have eclipsed the gaiety of nations, since he had retired from the stage months previous to his demise. When will mankind learn that literature is one thing and sworn testimony another? Johnson the author is not always fairly treated. Phrases are convenient things to hand about, and it is as little the custom to inquire into their truth as it is to read the letterpress on banknotes. We are content to count banknotes and to repeat phrases. One of these phrases is that whilst everybody reads Boswell, nobody reads Johnson. The facts are otherwise. Everybody does not read Boswell, and a great many people do read Johnson. If it be asked, what do the general public know of Johnson's nine volumes octavo? I reply, beshrew the general public. What in the name of the Bodleian has the general public got to do with literature? The general public subscribes to Moody, and has its intellectual like its lacteal sustenance, sent round to it in carts. On Saturdays these carts, laden with recent works in circulation, traverse the Uxbridge Road. On Wednesdays they toil up Highgate Hill, and if we may believe the reports of travellers, are occasionally seen rushing through the wilds of Camberwell and bumping over Blackheath. It is not a question of the general public, but of the lover of letters. Do Mr. Browning, Mr. Arnold, Mr. Lowell, Mr. Trevelyan, Mr. Stephen, Mr. Morley know their Johnson? To doubt would be disloyalty. And what these big men know in their big way, hundreds of little men know in their little way. We have no writer with a more genuine literary flavor about him than the great cam of literature. No man of letters loved letters better than he. He knew literature in all its branches. He had read books, he had written books, he had sold books, he had bought books, and he had borrowed them. Sluggish and inert in all other directions, he pranced through libraries. He loved a catalogue, he delighted in an index. He was, to employ a happy phrase of Dr. Holmes, at home amongst books, as a stable-boy is among horses. He cared intensely about the future of literature and the fate of literary men. "'I respect Miller,' he once exclaimed. "'He has raised the price of literature.' Now Miller was a Scotchman. Even Horn Took was not to stand in the pillory. "'No, no, the dog has too much literature for that.' The only time the author of Rasselas met the author of The Wealth of Nations witnessed a painful scene. The English moralist gave the Scotch one the lie direct, and the Scotch moralist applied to the English one a phrase which would have done discredit to the lips of a costermonger. But this notwithstanding, 
when boswell reported that adam smith preferred rhyme to blank verse johnson hailed the news as enthusiastically as did cedric the saxon the english origin of the bravest knights in the retinue of the norman king did adam say that he shouted i love him for it i could hug him johnson no doubt honestly believed he held george the third in reverence but really he did not care a pin's fee for all the crowned heads of europe all his reverence was reserved for poor scholars when a small boy in a wherry on whom had devolved the arduous task of rowing johnson and his biographer across the thames said he would give all he had to know about the argonauts the doctor was much pleased and gave him or got boswell to give him a double fare he was ever an advocate of the spread of knowledge amongst all classes and both sexes his devotion to letters has received its fitting reward the love and respect of all lettered hearts the office of literature dr john brown's pleasant story has become well known of the countryman who being asked to account for the gravity of his dog replied oh sir life is full of seriousness to him he can just never get a new affection something of the spirit of this saddened dog seems lately to have entered into the very people who ought to be freest from it our men of letters they are all very serious and very quarrelsome to some of them it is dangerous even to elude many are wedded to a theory or period and are the most luxurious of husbands ever ready to resent an affront to their lady this devotion makes them very grave and possibly very happy after a pedantic fashion one remembers what hazlitt who was neither happy nor pedantic has said about pedantry the power of attaching an interest to the most trifling or painful pursuits is one of the greatest happinesses of our nature the common soldier mounts the breach with joy the miser deliberately starves himself to death the mathematician sets about extracting the cube root with a feeling of enthusiasm and the lawyer sheds tears of delight over cook upon littleton he who is not in some measure a pedant though he may be a wise cannot be a very happy man possibly not but then we are surely not content that our authors should be pedants in order that they may be happy and devoted as one of the great class for whose sole use and behalf literature exists the class of readers i protest that it is to me a matter of indifference whether an author is happy or not i want him to make me happy that is his office let him discharge it i recognize in this connection the corresponding truth of what sidney smith makes his peter plimley say about the private virtues of mr percival the prime minister you spend a great deal of ink about the character of the present prime minister grant all that you write i say i fear that he will ruin ireland and pursue a line of policy destructive to the true interests of his country and then you tell me that he is faithful to mrs percival and kind to the master percivals i should prefer that he whipped his boys and saved his country we should never confuse functions or apply wrong tests what can books do for us dr johnson the least pedantic of men put the whole matter into a nutshell a coconut shell if you will heaven forbid that i should seek to compress the great doctor within any narrower limits than high metaphor requires when he wrote that a book should teach us either to enjoy life or endure it give us enjoyment teach us endurance hearken to the ceaseless demand and the perpetual prayer of an ever unsatisfied and always suffering humanity how is a book to answer the ceaseless demand self-forgetfulness is the essence of enjoyment 
and the author who would confer pleasure must possess the art or know the trick of destroying for the time the reader's own personality undoubtedly the easiest way of doing this is by the creation of a host of rival personalities hence the number and the popularity of novels whenever a novelist fails his book is said to flag that is the reader suddenly as in skating comes bump down upon his own personality and curses the unskilful author no lack of characters and continual motion is the easiest recipe for a novel which like a beggar should always be kept moving on nobody knew this better than fielding whose novels like most good ones are full of ends when those who are addicted to what is called improving reading inquire of you petulantly why you cannot find change of company and scene in books of travel you should answer cautiously that when books of travel are full of inns atmosphere and motion they are as good as any novel nor is there any reason in the nature of things why they should not always be so though experience proves the contrary the truth or falsehood of a book is immaterial george borrow's bible in spain is i suppose true though now that i come to think of it in what is to be a new light one remembers that it contains some odd things but was not borrow the accredited agent of the british and foreign bible society did he not travel and he had a free hand at their charges was he not befriended by our minister at madrid mr villiers subsequently earl of clarendon in the peerage of england it must be true and yet at this moment i would as lief read a chapter of the bible in spain as i would gil blas nay i positively would give the preference to signor giorgio nobody can sit down to read borrow's books without as completely forgetting himself as if he were a boy in the forest with girth and wamba borrow is provoking and has his full share of faults and though the owner of a style is capable of excruciating offences his habitual use of the odious word individual as a noun substantive seven times in three pages of the romany rye elicits the frequent groan and he is certainly once guilty of calling fish the finny tribe he believed himself to be animated by an intense hatred of the church of rome and disfigures many of his pages by lawrence boythorne like tirades against that institution but no catholic of sense need on this account deny himself the pleasure of reading borrow whose one dominating passion was camaraderie and who hobnobbed in the friendliest spirit with priest and gypsy in a fashion as far beyond praise as it is beyond description by any pen other than his own hail to thee george borrow cervantes himself gil blas do not more effectually carry their readers into the land of the cid than does this miraculous agent of the bible society by favour of whose pleasantness we can any hour of the week enter villafranca by night or ride into galicia on an andalusian stallion which proved to be a foolish thing to do without costing anybody a peseta and at no risk whatever to our necks be they long or short cooks warriors and authors must be judged by the effects they produce toothsome dishes glorious victories pleasant books these are our demands we have nothing to do with ingredients tactics or methods we have no desire to be admitted into the kitchen the council or the study the cook may clean her saucepans how she pleases the warrior place his men as he likes the author handle his material or weave his plot as best he can when the dish is served we only ask is it good when the battle has been fought who won when the book comes out does it read 
authors ought not to be above being reminded that it is their first duty to write agreeably some very disagreeable ones have succeeded in doing so and there is therefore no need for any one to despair every author be he grave or gay should try to make his book as ingratiating as possible reading is not a duty and has consequently no business to be made disagreeable nobody is under any obligation to read any other man's book literature exists to please to lighten the burden of men's lives to make them for a short while forget their sorrows and their sins their silenced hearths their disappointed hopes their grim futures and those men of letters are the best loved who have best performed literature's truest office their name is happily legion and i will conclude these disjointed remarks by quoting from one of them as honest a parson as ever took tithe or voted for the tory candidate the rev george crabbe hear him in the frank courtship i must be loved said sibyl i must see the man in terrors who aspires to be at my forbidding frown his heart must ache his tongue must falter and his frame must shake and if i grant him at my feet to kneel what trembling fearful pleasure must he feel nay such the rapture that my smiles inspire that reason's self must for a time retire alas for good josiah said the dame these wicked thoughts would fill his soul with shame he kneel and tremble at a thing of dust he cannot child the child replied he must were an office to be open for the insurance of literary reputations no critic at all likely to be in the society's service would refuse the life of a poet who could write like crabbe cardinal newman mr leslie stephen mr swinburne are not always of the same way of thinking but all three hold the one true faith about crabbe but even were crabbe now left unread which is very far from being the case his would be an enviable fame for was he not one of the favoured poets of walter scott and whenever the closing scene of the great magician's life is read in the pages of lockhart must not crabbe's name be brought upon the reader's quivering lip to soothe the sorrow of the soothers of sorrow to bring tears to the eyes and smiles to the cheeks of the lords of human smiles and tears is no mean ministry and it is crabbe's End of section 52. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 53 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4, Section 53, Selected Excerpts, by Augustine Birrell, Part 2 Truth Hunting is truth hunting one of those active mental habits which as bishop butler tells us intensify their effects by constant use and are weak convictions paralyzed intellects and laxity of opinions amongst the effects of truth hunting on the majority of minds these are not unimportant questions let us consider briefly the probable effects of speculative habits on conduct the discussion of a question of conduct has the great charm of justifying if indeed not requiring personal illustration and this particular question is well illustrated 
by instituting a comparison between the life and character of charles lamb and those of some of his distinguished friends personal illustration especially when it proceeds by way of comparison is always dangerous and the dangers are doubled when the subjects illustrated and compared are favorite authors it behooves us to proceed warily in this matter a dispute as to the respective merits of gray and collins has been known to result in a visit to an attorney and the revocation of a will an avowed inability to see anything in miss austen's novels is reported to have proved destructive of an otherwise good chance of an indian judgeship i believe however i run no great risk in asserting that of all english authors charles lamb is the one loved most warmly and emotionally by his admirers amongst whom i reckon only those who are as familiar with the four volumes of his life and letters as with Ilia. but how does he illustrate the particular question now engaging our attention speaking of his sister mary who as every one knows throughout Ilia is called his cousin bridget he says it has been the lot of my cousin oftener perhaps than i could have wished to have had for her associates and mine free thinkers leaders and disciples of novel philosophies and systems but she neither wrangles with nor accepts their opinions nor did her brother he lived his life cracking his little jokes and reading his great folios neither wrangling with nor accepting the opinions of the friends he loved to see around him to a contemporary stranger it might well have appeared as if his life were a frivolous and useless one as compared with those of these philosophers and thinkers they discussed their great schemes and affected to prove deep mysteries and were constantly asking what is truth he sipped his glass shuffled his cards and was content with the humbler inquiry what are trumps but to us looking back upon that little group and knowing what we now do about each member of it no such mistake is possible to us it is plain beyond all question that judged by whatever standard of excellence it is possible for any reasonable human being to take lamb stands head and shoulders a better man than any of them no need to stop to compare him with godwin or hazlitt or lloyd let us boldly put him in the scales with one whose fame is in all the churches with samuel taylor coleridge logician metaphysician bard there are some men whom to abuse is pleasant coleridge is not one of them how gladly would we love the author of christabel if we could but the thing is flatly impossible his was an unlovely character the sentence passed upon him by mr matthew arnold parenthetically in one of the essays in criticism coleridge had no morals is no less just than pitiless as we gather information about him from numerous quarters we find it impossible to resist the conclusion that he was a man neglectful of restraint irresponsive to the claims of those who had every claim upon him willing to receive slow to give in early manhood coleridge planned a pentasocracy where all the virtues were to thrive lamb did something far more difficult he played cribbage every night with his imbecile father whose constant stream of querulous talk and fault-finding might well have goaded a far stronger man into practicing and justifying neglect that lamb with all his admiration for coleridge was well aware of dangerous tendencies in his character is made apparent by many letters notably by one written in seventeen ninety six in which he says o oh, my friend cultivate the filial feelings and let no man think himself released from the kind charities of relationship these shall give him peace at the last these are the best foundation for every species of benevolence 
I rejoice to hear that you are reconciled with all your relations. This surely is as valuable an aid to reflection as any supplied by the Highgate seer. Lamb gave but little thought to the wonderful difference between the reason and the understanding. He preferred old plays, an odd diet, some may think, on which to feed the virtues, but however that may be, the noble fact remains that he, poor frail boy, for he was no more when trouble first assailed him, stooped down and without sigh or sign took upon his own shoulders the whole burden of a lifelong sorrow. Coleridge married. Lamb, at the bidding of duty, remained single wedding himself to the sad fortunes of his father and sister. Shall we pity him? No. He had his reward, the surpassing reward that is only within the power of literature to bestow. It was Lamb, and not Coleridge, who wrote Dream Children, a reverie. Then I told how for seven long years, in hope sometimes, sometimes in despair, yet persisting ever i courted the fair alice w and as much as children could understand i explained to them what coyness and difficulty and denial meant in maidens when suddenly turning to alice the soul of the first alice looked out at her eyes with such a reality of representment that i became in doubt which of them stood before me or whose that bright hair was and while i stood gazing both the children gradually grew fainter to my view receding and still receding till nothing at last but two mournful features were seen in the uttermost distance which without speech strangely impressed upon me the effects of speech we are not of alice nor of thee nor are we children at all the children of alice call bartram father we are nothing less than nothing and dreams we are only what might have been godwin hazlitt coleridge where now are their novel philosophies and systems bottled moonshine which does not improve by keeping only the actions of the just smell sweet and blossom in the dust were we disposed to admit that lamb would in all probability have been as good a man as every one agrees he was as kind to his father as full of self-sacrifice for the sake of his sister as loving and ready a friend even though he had paid more heed to current speculations it is yet not without use in a time like this, when so much stress is laid upon anxious inquiry into the mysteries of soul and body, to point out how this man attained to a moral excellence denied to his speculative contemporaries, performed duties from which they, good men as they were, would one and all have shrunk. How, in short, he contrived to achieve what no one of his friends, not even the immaculate Wordsworth or the precise Southey, achieved, the living of a life the records of which are inspiriting to read, and are indeed the presence of a good diffused, and managed to do it all without either wrangling with or accepting the opinions that hurtled in the air about him. Benvenuto Cellini, from Obiter Dicta. What a liar was Benvenuto Cellini! Who can believe a word he says? To hang a dog on his oath would be a judicial murder. Yet when we lay down his memoirs, and let our thoughts travel back to those far-off days he tells us of, there we see him standing in bold relief against the black sky of the past the very man he was not more surely did he with that rare skill of his 
stamp the image of clement the seventh on the papal currency than he did the impress of his own singular personality upon every word he spoke and every sentence he wrote we ought of course to hate him but do we a murderer he has written himself down a liar he stands self-convicted of being were any one in the netherworld bold enough to call him thief it may be doubted whether radamanthus would award him the damages for which we may be certain he would loudly clamour why do we not hate him listen to him upon my uttering these words there was a general outcry the noblemen affirming that i promised too much but one of them who was a great philosopher said in my favour from the admirable symmetry of shape and happy physiognomy of this young man i venture to engage that he will perform all he promises and more the pope replied i am of the same opinion then calling trajano his gentleman of the bedchamber he ordered him to fetch me five hundred ducats and so it always ended suspicions aroused most reasonably allayed most unreasonably and then ducats he deserved hanging but he died in his bed he wrote his own memoirs after a fashion that ought to have brought posthumous justice upon him and made them a literary gibbet on which he should swing a creaking horror for all time but nothing of the sort has happened the rascal is so symmetrical and his physiognomy as it gleams upon us through the centuries so happy that we cannot withhold our ducats though we may accompany the gift with a shower of abuse this only proves the profundity of an observation made by mr badgett a man who carried away into the next world more originality of thought than is now to be found in the three estates of the realm whilst remarking upon the extraordinary reputation of the late francis horner and the trifling cost he was put to in supporting it mr badgett said that it proved the advantage of keeping an atmosphere the common air of heaven sharpens men's judgments poor horner but for that kept atmosphere of his always surrounding him would have been bluntly asked what he had done since he was breached and in reply he could only have muttered something about the currency as for our special rogue cellini the question would probably have assumed this shape rascal name the crime you have not committed and account for the omission but these awkward questions are not put to the lucky people who keep their own atmospheres the critics before they can get at them have to step out of the everyday air where only achievements count and the decalogue still goes for something into the kept atmosphere which they have no sooner breathed than they begin to see things differently and to measure the object thus surrounded with a tape of its own manufacture horner poor ugly a man neither of words nor deeds becomes one of our great men a nation mourns his loss and erects his statue in the abbey mr badgett gives several instances of the same kind but he does not mention cellini who is however in his own way an admirable example you open his book a pharisee of the pharisees lying indeed why you hate prevarication as for murder your friends know you too well to mention the subject in your hearing except in immediate connection with capital punishment you are of course willing to make some allowance for cellini's time and place the first half of the sixteenth century and italy uh, yes you remark uh, cellini shall have strict justice at my hands so you say as you settle yourself in your chair and begin to read we seem to hear the rascal laughing in his grave his spirit breathes upon you from his book peeps at you roguishly as you turn the pages his atmosphere surrounds you you smile when you ought to frown 
chuckle when you should groan and oh final triumph laugh aloud when if you had a rag of principle left you would fling the book into the fire your poor moral sense turns away with a sigh and patiently awaits the conclusion of the second volume how cautiously does he begin how gently does he win your ear by his seductive piety i quote from mr roscoe's translation it is a duty incumbent on upright and credible men of all ranks who have performed anything noble or praiseworthy to record in their own writing the events of their lives yet they should not commence this honourable task before they have passed their fortieth year such at least is my opinion now that i have completed my fifty-eighth year and am settled in florence where considering the numerous ills that constantly attend human life i perceive that i have never before been so free from vexations and calamities or possessed of so great a share of content and health as at this period looking back on some delightful and happy events of my life and on many misfortunes so truly overwhelming that the appalling retrospect makes me wonder how i have reached this age in vigour and prosperity through god's goodness i have resolved to publish an account of my life and i must in commencing my narrative satisfy the public on some few points to which its curiosity is usually directed the first of which is to ascertain whether a man is descended from a virtuous and ancient family i shall therefore now proceed to inform the reader how it pleased god that i should come into the world so you read on page roman numeral one what you read on page one hundred ninety one is this just after sunset about eight o'clock as this musketeer stood at his door with his sword in his hand when he had done supper i with great address came close up to him with a long dagger and gave him a violent backhanded stroke which i aimed at his neck he instantly turned round and the blow falling directly upon his left shoulder broke the whole bone of it upon which he dropped his sword quite overcome by the pain and took to his heels i pursued and in four steps came up with him when raising the dagger over his head which he lowered down i hit him exactly upon the nape of the neck the weapon penetrated so deep that though i made a great effort to recover it again i found it impossible so much for murder now for manslaughter or rather cellini's notion of manslaughter pompeo entered an apothecary shop at the corner of the chiavica about some business and stayed there for some time i was told he had boasted of having bullied me but it turned out a fatal adventure to him just as i arrived at that quarter he was coming out of the shop and his bravos having made an opening formed a circle round him i thereupon clapped my hand to a sharp dagger and having forced my way through the file of ruffians laid hold of him by the throat so quickly and with such presence of mind that there was not one of his friends could defend him i pulled him towards me to give him a blow in front but he turned his face about through excess of terror so that i wounded him exactly under the ear and upon repeating my blow he fell down dead it had never been my intention to kill him but blows are not always under command we must all feel that it would never have done to have begun with these passages but long before the one hundred ninety first page has been reached cellini has retreated into his own atmosphere and the scales of justice have been hopelessly tampered with that such a man as this encountered suffering in the course of his life should be matter for satisfaction to every well-regulated mind but somehow or other you find yourself pitying the fellow as he narrates the hardships he endured in the castle of st angelo 
he is so symmetrical a rascal just hear him listen to what he says well on in the second volume after the little incidents already quoted having at length recovered my strength and vigour after i had composed myself and resumed my cheerfulness of mind i continued to read my bible and so accustomed my eyes to that darkness that though i was at first able to read only an hour and a half i could at length read three hours i then reflected on the wonderful power of the almighty upon the hearts of simple men who had carried their enthusiasm so far as to believe firmly that god would indulge them in all they wished for and i promised myself the assistance of the most high as well through his mercy as on account of my innocence thus turning constantly to the supreme being sometimes in prayer sometimes in silent meditation on the divine goodness i was totally engrossed by these heavenly reflections and came to take such delight in pious meditations that i no longer thought of past misfortunes on the contrary i was all day long singing psalms and many other compositions of mine in which i celebrated and praised the deity thus torn from their context these passages may seem to supply the best possible falsification of the previous statement that cellini told the truth about himself judged by these passages alone he may appear a hypocrite of an unusually odious description but it is only necessary to read his book to dispel that notion he tells lies about other people he repeats long conversations sounding his own praises during which as his own narrative shows he was not present he exaggerates his own exploits his sufferings even it may be his crimes but when we lay down his book we feel we are saying good-bye to a man whom we know he has introduced himself to us and though doubtless we prefer saints to sinners we may be forgiven for liking the company of a live rogue better than that of the lay figures and empty clock cases labelled with distinguished names who are to be found doing duty for men in the works of our standard historians what would we not give to know julius caesar one half as well as we know this outrageous rascal the saints of the earth too how shadowy they are which of them do we really know excepting one or two ancient and modern quietists there is hardly one amongst the whole number who being dead yet speaketh their memoirs far too often only reveal to us a hazy something certainly not recognizable as a man this is generally the fault of their editors who though men themselves confine their editorial duties to going up and down the diaries and papers of the departed saint and obliterating all human touches this they do for the better prevention of scandals and one cannot deny that they attain their end though they pay dearly for it i shall never forget the start i gave when on reading some old book about india i came across an after-dinner jest of henry martin's the thought of henry martin laughing over the walnuts and the wine was almost as robert browning's unknown painter says too wildly dear and to this day i cannot help thinking that there must be a mistake somewhere to return to cellini and to conclude on laying down his memoirs let us be careful to recall our banished moral sense and make peace with her by passing a final judgment on this desperate sinner which perhaps after all we cannot do better than by employing language of his own concerning a monk a fellow-prisoner of his who never so far as appears murdered anybody but of whom cellini none the less felt himself entitled to say i admired his shining qualities 
but his odious vices i freely censured and held in abhorrence end of section fifty three recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section fifty four of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by leonard wilson library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four section fifty four selected excerpts by augustine birrell part three on the alleged obscurity of mr browning's poetry from obiter dicta in considering whether a poet is intelligible and lucid we ought not to grope and grub about his work in search of obscurities and oddities but should in the first instance at all events attempt to regard his whole scope and range to form some estimate if we can of his general purport and effect asking ourselves for this purpose such questions as these how are we the better for him has he quickened any passion lightened any burden purified any taste does he play any real part in our lives when we are in love do we whisper him in our lady's ear when we sorrow does he ease our pain can he calm the strife of mental conflict has he had anything to say which wasn't twaddle on those subjects which elude analysis as they may and defy demonstration as they do are yet alone of perennial interest on man on nature and on human life on the pathos of our situation looking back on to the irrevocable and forward to the unknown if a poet has said or done or been any of these things to an appreciable extent to charge him with obscurity is both folly and ingratitude but the subject may be pursued further and one may be called upon to investigate this charge with reference to particular books or poems in browning's case this fairly may be done and then another crop of questions arises such as what is the book about that is with what subject does it deal and what method of dealing does it employ is it didactical analytical or purely narrative is it content to describe or does it aspire to explain in common fairness these questions must be asked and answered before we heave our critical half-bricks at strange poets one task is of necessity more difficult than another students of geometry who have pushed their researches into that fascinating science so far as the fifth proposition of the first book commonly called the pons asinorum though now that so many ladies read euclid it ought in common justice to them to be at least sometimes called the pons asinarum will agree that though it may be more difficult to prove that the angles at the base of an isosceles triangle are equal and that if the equal sides be produced the angles on the other side of the base shall be equal than it was to describe an equilateral triangle on a given finite straight line yet no one but an ass would say that the fifth proposition was one whit less intelligible than the first when we consider mr browning and his later writings it will be useful to bear this distinction in mind looking then at the first period we find in its front eight plays one strafford written in eighteen thirty six when its author was twenty-four years old and put upon the boards of covent garden theatre on the first of may eighteen thirty seven mcready playing strafford and miss helen fawcett lady carlyle it was received with much enthusiasm but the company was rebellious and the manager bankrupt and after running five nights the man who played pym threw up his part and the theatre was closed two pippa passes three king victor and king charles four the return of the druses five a blot in the scutcheon 
now this beautiful and pathetic play was put on the stage of drury lane on the eleventh of february eighteen forty three with phelps as lord tresham miss helen fawcett as mildred tresham and mrs sterling still known to us all as gwendolen it was a brilliant success mr browning was in the stage box and if it is any satisfaction for a poet to hear a crowded house cry author author that satisfaction has belonged to mr browning the play ran several nights and was only stopped because one of mr mcready's bankruptcies happened just then to intervene it was afterwards revived by mr phelps during his memorable management of sadler's wells six columbus birthday miss helen fawcett put this upon the stage in eighteen fifty two when it was reckoned a success seven luria eight a soul's tragedy to call any of these plays unintelligible is ridiculous and nobody who has ever read them ever did and why people who have not read them should abuse them is hard to see were society put upon its oath we should be surprised to find how many people in high places have not read all's well that ends well or timon of athens but they don't go about saying these plays are unintelligible like wise folk they pretend to have read them and say nothing in browning's case they are spared the hypocrisy no one need pretend to have read a soul's tragedy and it seems therefore inexcusable for any one to assert that one of the plainest most pointed and piquant bits of writing in the language is unintelligible but surely something more may be truthfully said of these plays than that they are comprehensible first of all they are plays and not works like the dropsical dramas of sir henry taylor and mr swinburne some of them have stood the ordeal of actual representation and though it would be absurd to pretend that they met with that overwhelming measure of success our critical age has reserved for such dramatists as the late lord lytton the author of money the late tom taylor the author of the overland route the late mr robertson the author of caste mr h byron the author of our boys mr wills the author of charles i mr bernand the author of the colonel and mr gilbert the author of so much that is great and glorious in our national drama at all events they proved themselves able to arrest and retain the attention of very ordinary audiences but who can deny dignity and even grandeur to luria or withhold the meed of a melodious tear from mildred tresham what action of what play is more happily conceived or better rendered than that of pippa passes where innocence and its reverse tender love and violent passion are presented with emphasis and yet blended into a dramatic unity and a poetic perfection entitling the author to the very first place amongst those dramatists of the century who have labored under the enormous disadvantage of being poets to start with passing from the plays we are next attracted by a number of splendid poems on whose base the structure of mr browning's fame perhaps rests most surely his dramatic pieces poems which give utterance to the thoughts and feelings of persons other than himself or as he puts it when dedicating a number of them to his wife love you saw me gather men and women live or dead or fashioned by my fancy enter each and all and use their service speak from every mouth the speech a poem or again in sordello by making speak myself kept out of view the very man as he was wont to do at a rough calculation there must be at least sixty of these pieces let me run over the names of a very few of them saul a poem beloved by all true women caliban which the men not unnaturally perhaps often prefer the two bishops the sixteenth century one ordering his tomb of jasper and basalt in st praxed's church and his nineteenth century successor rolling out his postprandial apologia my last duchess 
the soliloquy in a spanish cloister andrea del sarto fra lippo lippi rabbi ben ezra cleon a death in the desert the italian in england and the englishman in italy it is plain truth to say that no other english poet living or dead shakespeare excepted has so heaped up human interest for his readers as has robert browning against these dramatic pieces the charge of unintelligibility fails as completely as it does against the plays they are all perfectly intelligible but and here is the rub they are not easy reading like the estimable writings of the late mrs hemans they require the same honest attention as it is the fashion to give to a lecture of professor huxley's or a sermon of canon liddon's and this is just what too many persons will not give to poetry they love to hear a soft pulsation in their easy ear to turn the page and let their senses drink a lay that shall not trouble them to think next to these dramatic pieces come what we may be content to call simply poems some lyrical some narrative the latter are straightforward enough and as a rule full of spirit and humour but this is more than can always be said of the lyrical pieces now for the first time in dealing with this first period excluding sordello we strike difficulty the chinese puzzle comes in we wonder whether it all turns on the punctuation and the awkward thing for mr browning's reputation is this that these bewildering poems are for the most part very short we say awkward for it is not more certain that sarah gamp liked her beer drawn mild than it is that your englishman likes his poetry cut short and so accordingly it often happens that some estimable paterfamilias takes up an odd volume of browning his volatile son or moonstruck daughter has left lying about pishes and shaws and then with an air of much condescension and amazing candour remarks that he will give the fellow another chance and not condemn him unread so saying he opens the book and carefully selects the very shortest poem he can find and in a moment without sign or signal note or warning the unhappy man is floundering up to his neck in lines like these which are the third and final stanza of a poem called another way of love and after for pastime if june be refulgent with flowers in completeness all petals no prickles delicious as trickles of wine poured at mass time and choose one indulgent to redness and sweetness or if with experience of man and of spider she used my june lightning the strong insect ridder to stop the fresh spinning why june will consider he comes up gasping and more than ever persuaded that browning's poetry is a mass of inconglomerate nonsense which nobody understands least of all the members of the browning society we need be at no pains to find a meaning for everything mr browning has written but when all is said and done when these few freaks of a crowded brain are thrown overboard to the sharks of verbal criticism who feed on such things mr browning and his great poetical achievements remain behind to be dealt with and accounted for we do not get rid of the laureate by quoting o darling room my heart's delight dear room the apple of my sight with thy two couches soft and white there is no room so exquisite no little room so warm and bright wherein to read wherein to write or of wordsworth by quoting at this my boy hung down his head he blushed with shame nor made reply and five times to the child i said why edward tell me why or of keats by remembering that he once addressed a young lady as follows o oh, come georgiana the rose is full blown the riches of flora are lavishly strown the air is all softness and crystal the streams the west is resplendently clothed in beams the strength of a rope may be but the strength of its weakest part but poets are to be judged in their happiest hours and in their greatest works the second period of mr browning's poetry demands a different line of argument 
for it is in my judgment folly to deny that he has of late years written a great deal which makes very difficult reading indeed no doubt you may meet people who tell you that they read the ring and the book for the first time without much mental effort but you will do well not to believe them these poems are difficult they cannot help being so what is the ring and the book a huge novel in twenty thousand lines told after the method not of scott but of balzac it tears the hearts out of a dozen characters it tells the same story from ten different points of view it is loaded with detail of every kind and description you are let off nothing as with a schoolboy's life at a large school if he is to enjoy it at all he must fling himself into it and care intensely about everything so the reader of the ring and the book must be interested in everybody and everything down to the fact that the eldest daughter of the counsel for the prosecution of guido is eight years old on the very day he is writing his speech and that he is going to have fried liver and parsley for his supper if you are prepared for this you will have your reward for the style though rugged and involved is throughout with the exception of the speeches of counsel eloquent and at times superb and as for the matter if your interest in human nature is keen curious almost professional if nothing man woman or child has been done or suffered or conceivably can be do or suffer is without interest for you if you are fond of analysis and do not shrink from dissection you will prize the ring and the book as the surgeon prizes the last great contribution to comparative anatomy or pathology but this sort of work tells upon style browning has i think fared better than some writers to me at all events the step from a blot in the scutcheon to the ring and the book is not so marked as is the mauvais pas that lies between amos barton and daniel deronda but difficulty is not obscurity one task is more difficult than another the angles at the base of the isosceles triangles are apt to get mixed and to confuse us all man and woman alike prince hohenstiel something or another is a very difficult poem not only to pronounce but to read but if a poet chooses as his subject napoleon the third in whom the cad the coward the idealist and the sensualist were inextricably mixed and purports to make him unbosom himself over a bottle of gladstone claret in a tavern at leicester square you cannot expect that the product should belong to the same class of poetry as mr coventry patmore's admirable angel in the house it is the method that is difficult take the husband in the ring and the book mr browning remorselessly hunts him down tracks him to the last recesses of his mind and there bids him stand and deliver he describes love not only broken but breaking hate in its germ doubt at its birth these are difficult things to do either in poetry or prose and people with easy flowing addisonian or tennysonian styles cannot do them i seem to overhear a still small voice asking but are they worth doing or at all events is it the province of art to do them the question ought not to be asked it is heretical being contrary to the whole direction of the latter half of this century the chains binding us to the rocks of realism are faster riveted every day and the perseus who is destined to cut them is i expect some mischievous little boy at a board school but as the question has been asked i will own that sometimes even when deepest in works of this the now orthodox school i have been harassed by distressing doubts whether after all this enormous labor is not in vain and wearied by the effort overloaded by the detail bewildered by the argument and sickened by the pitiless dissection of character and motive have been tempted to cry aloud quoting or rather in the agony of the moment misquoting coleridge simplicity thou better dame than all the family of fame 
but this ebullition of feeling is childish and even sinful we must take our poets as we do our meals as they are served up to us indeed you may if full of courage give a cook notice but not the time spirit who makes our poets we may be sure to appropriate an idea of the late sir james stephen that if robert browning had lived in the sixteenth century he would not have written a poem like the ring in the book and if edmund spencer had lived in the nineteenth century he would not have written a poem like the fairy queen it is therefore idle to arraign mr browning's later method and style for possessing difficulties and intricacies which are inherent to it the method at all events has an interest of its own a strength of its own a grandeur of its own if you do not like it you must leave it alone you are fond you say of romantic poetry well then take down your spencer and qualify yourself to join the small transfigured band of those who are able to take their bible oaths they have read their fairy queen all through the company though small is delightful and you will have plenty to talk about without abusing browning who probably knows his spencer better than you do realism will not for ever dominate the world of letters and art the fashion of all things passeth away but it has already earned a great place it has written books composed poems painted pictures all stamped with that greatness which despite fluctuations nay even reversals of taste and opinion means immortality but against mr browning's later poems it is sometimes alleged that their meaning is obscure because their grammar is bad a cynic was once heard to observe with reference to that noble poem the grammarian's funeral that it was a pity the talented author had ever since allowed himself to remain under the delusion that he had not only buried the grammarian but his grammar also it is doubtless true that mr browning has some provoking ways and is something too much of a verbal acrobat also as his witty parodist the pet poet of six generations of cambridge undergraduates reminds us he loves to dock the smaller parts of speech as we curtail the already curtailed cur it is perhaps permissible to weary a little of his eyes and o's but we believe we cannot be corrected when we say that browning is a poet whose grammar will bear scholastic investigation better than that of most of apollo's children a word about sordello one half of sordello and that with mr browning's usual ill luck the first half is undoubtedly obscure it is as difficult to read as endymion or the revolt of islam and for the same reason the author's lack of experience in the art of composition we have all heard of the young architect who forgot to put a staircase in his house which contained fine rooms but no way of getting into them sordello is a poem without a staircase the author still in his twenties essayed a high thing for his subject he singled out sordello compassed murkily about with ravage of six long sad hundred years he partially failed and the british public with its accustomed generosity and in order i suppose to encourage the others has never ceased girding at him because forty-two years ago he published at his own charges a little book of two hundred and fifty pages which even such of them as were then able to read could not understand end of section fifty four recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio also end of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume four